Here we are, Wizard Magazine, number 13, September 1992. Flash, 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 flash. Wizard, winner of 1991, best new publisher of no, the year. No, 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 no. No? We've got something much better planned this week. The swerve is pulled, people. The the issue we've been waiting to get to for, for quite a while, a number of weeks. It's been a long time coming, but man, this is the perfect way to look at Wizard one year in. Wizard is one year old. The speculation market is ramping up at a fever pitch. So why not get a look at another voice at another point of view uh, surrounding this speculation? Yeah, thing. a radically different point of view. So the Comics Journal is completely different for me at this time. And it has such a reputation. You know, <laughs> Gary Groth in the Comics Journal, when I finally became aware of it, had this scary reputation. And this is the peak probably, of those powers. <laughs> you know, he's mellowed out, I think, over time. He has mellowed out over time. Like, like uh, part of the reason, and I guess full disclosure, uh, Comics Journal is published by Fantagraphics with the subtitle, uh, Publisher of the World's Greatest Cartoonists, and they are absolutely correct because they are my publisher for, <laughs> <laughs> for Hip Hop Family Tree and some other little stuff here and there. So this is uh, number 152, Comics Journal, and this is a portrait of my dear publisher gary groth <laughs> with his it, severed head with his head severed <laughs> with a damn image uh, stamp upon his face drawn by todd mcfarlane some really good todd mcfarlane lettering over here man quite like uh dave dave sim he could have if he, if he was able to rule a, a ames lettering guide i think he he would have a future as a letterer he lettered an issue of spider-man did he whenever he was drawing that ad adjectiveless spider-man he lettered one, and I think he colored an issue, too. He definitely point. colored it. He colored a Morbius issue. Yeah, the lettering one has is, is always stood out to me, too, as being sort of an odd one, because it is this style where it's not perfect lettering, but it's also pretty good. Like, it's really good. You know, it's professional. It's just a little bit different, especially compared to, like, a Tom Orzakowski that's super tight. More this... in the Rick Parker direction of lettering. It makes me excited just to think of showing lettering comparisons in an episode. <laughs> So Comics Journal is 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 packed with content. Uh, there's no way we're going to be able to cover this all at one clip. So we'll agree to make this a two-part episode. We'll take it to this the center spread. Uh, we'll finish up the cage match interview between Gary Groth and Toddy Mac. And then next week, we'll we'll continue the magazine. There's There will be an Alan Moore interview, Dave Mazzucchelli, Evan Dorkin. Uh, what else can we say? Like, okay, how about a little bit about the origin of Comics Journal? Since we did the same thing when we were talking about Wizard Number One, Comics Journal in the in the '70s and before, like post fanzine, there was a there was a thing called an ad zine, and that would be like the comic book buyer's guide or the guide to buying comics or whatever that Alan Light guy's product was called. But anyhow, there was a thing called an ad zine, and basically it would be you know a, a sixty page. Uh, classified section, basically. People would pay money to have their ad placed in these ad zines. The thing is, though, to get, like, bulk shipping rates, there was some sort of legal, some sort of mandate that there had to be some editorial content in, right. in those products. They didn't want, necessarily, to have an interview with Carl Barks or anything like that, but it was an absolute must to get cheaper shipping rates. Gary Groth, as a kid is making fanzines with edit with pure editorial content and he envisioned an actual magazine that talked that talked about issues and and was more content than the ad placements he uh he buys an ad zine called the new nostalgia journal and what that means is that there will be no more new nostalgia journals and you just bought a mailing list a, a big robust mailing list of tens of thousands of subscribers and Comics Journal's born. The first issue of Comics Journal is fantastic because uh, with great power comes great responsibility. And what you were talking about, being fearful of the Comics Journal, the first, when, when Gary gets this bigger mailing list, the entire issue is just a roast of the guy who, uh, <laughs> Alan Light, who... Um, who put put out those those ad zines With of the, the day? Competition, <laughs> totally. It just just relentless, page after page. Um, photographs like photo stats of canceled checks where they gave the guy money. The guy cast a check, but like their ads didn't appear in the magazines and junk like that. Just page after page. Uh, Mike Catron, who who was a 
Fantagraphics founder, going to conventions, and uh, you know, Alan Light is up there on the panels, and and Mike is asking the tough questions, and and Alan can't respond properly, and that's transcribed in in the magazine. So, so off the bat, they had blood in their mouths, yes. man. And when I, when I hooked up with Fantagraphics, like I I wanted this Gary, like Gary, I wanted this Gary with with uh with venom and 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 anger and uh something to prove the only difference is in 2012 2013 when i hooked up with him he proved his point he's totally successful and pretty happy you know what i mean so i i, I always joke that i'm like uh that little red-headed robin from dark knight returns man and i'm trying to like <laughs> inject myself into his life and try to like bring that energy back man get 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 that uh piss and vinegar running through his veins again man it's it's so true you know we had him on a podcast that we did years ago and that would always be my question is all these guys that fought for the legitimacy of comics it's better now than it was ever than anyone ever hoped for you know including these advocates like gary groth and i think that may have contributed to some of that (laughs) mellowing out his vision for comics is far divorced from todd mcfarlane's vision of comics and what is success and what is good and what is uh worth reading the climax of this episode will be steel cage, steel cage match between uh, Gary and Todd. You know what I'm saying? Two alpha males, two top dogs, two guys who passionately believe they are right. Yes. And we'll see how that and, plays and, out. And, and don't follow orders well. <laughs> don't get along with others. <laughs> My kind of guys. Should we unpack this thing Let's a little do bit? It. One of the points that we're going to keep in mind when we go through this damn magazine is whenever we have the opportunity to talk about shit that will not be in Wizard Magazine probably ever, we're just going to indulge and we're, and we're going down that rabbit hole, man. And I say that because we might be spending 20 minutes <laughs> on this inside front cover for the Bud Plant comic art mail order business. Did you ever buy from Bud Plant? I was trying to think of that whenever I saw this ad. And it's hard to tell because I did mail order stuff and I don't remember all of them, but I certainly came across ads and I would send away for things like the catalogs that these companies would have. And I have had Bud Plant catalogs. Yeah, me too. Me too. Still around. Specializes in like very, um, in art books mostly, like like obtuse stuff that you would not find really in a, in a previews, man. And, and he, like the brand identity of Bud Plant to me is like, it is rooted in old school fandom. So it's like Jeffrey Jones art books and like Mike Kaluta art books and, you know, how foster minutia, stuff like that, man. Now, throughout our wizard episodes, we've been mentioning diamond, 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 distributor, 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 the the death of distributors, diamond as a monopoly, blah, 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 blah. So why not take this opportunity to talk direct market, birth of the direct market? How did diamond get to be a fucking monopoly? And we could explain it very clearly with this as a point of reference, man. So the name Phil Suling will not come up in Wizard Magazine, I would bet. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? We can pretty much give Phil the credit for creating this new idea of the direct market. Phil was a Phil was a Brooklyn school teacher, comic book fan, went to like the first what it would have thought to be the first comic book convention in um in 1964, in New York. He was not the organizer of that con, but that inspired him to become a con organizer, which he did go on to do. 1968, I believe, might have might have been his first. In fact, basically the template for what we think of as Comic-Cons today is something that he established. The idea of having a publisher presence, the idea of bringing in professionals, the idea of flying professionals in from California, because Kirby might have been out there by then, 1968. Yeah. There's a photo from a 1968, uh, 1969 comic art convention at the Statler Hilton Hotel. 1960. So this would be a Phil Suling convention. And this, this lovable young guy right here is my dear publisher whose he- severed head we, we saw on the front <laughs> cover of Comics Journal, uh, Gary Groth right here. And uh, just looking through this photograph, like I see there's Gray Morrow right there. I believe that's John Buscema back there. Um, I think Bill Griffith as a little boy is, is in here somewhere. Um, not a hundred percent sure, but I think I remember him showing this. Maybe, maybe that's him right there. That little guy, um, mix of pros. I, I don't see Suling though. 
So, so as Phil Suling is running these conventions, he's developing relationships with the publishers. Mm -hmm. There were comic shops back in the late 60s. In fact, Bud Plant and seven of his, well, actually six of his friends had a comic, a, a proper comic shop called Seven Sons Comic Shop or something like that in California. Bud Plant's a West Coast guy. Now, they had no ability to get new comics. It was, in effect, a used comic book store. Um, comic books were distributed through the newsstands, and the newsstand distributors, all that they would receive every week is a bundle of stuff. Here's a bunch of Newsweeks, here's a bunch of this, here's a bunch, bunch of that. The comics were nothing but flotsam and jetsam. Using the old newspaper model, these old magazines, they were, they were topical, timely. There was no reason to buy last week's issue of Newsweek magazine. But it just didn't work that way for comics. Like, people wanted to know what Spider-Man did last month so that they could catch up this month, so on and so forth. But you did not have that opportunity. Right. You'll hear a lot of uh, old-time store guys, like um, Shelton Drum has told the story about buying multiple issues off the newsstand. You know, falling in love with comics early and then using those as fodder to trade for books he didn't have that his buddies might have. But also looking forward to trade at the flea market or to sell them. So they were thinking in terms of how a store works. They just didn't have the access yet to get their direct product from the publishers. The, the other thing about the way the newsstand market worked was this philosophy of in order to sell, in order to sell 30,000 of a newspaper, you had to print 100,000. And the reason for that is, of course, 100,000 are not going to sell every day. But what if there's a shooting at Kent State? you know, this next day, you're going to, you're going to sell a hundred thousand papers that way. Since that was the model that was established and was long, long accepted, that is what the comic publishers had to do. They had to print hundreds of thousands of comics, knowing that they were only selling maybe a small fraction, 20%, 30% of what they published. So they had to pulp a lot of stuff, a lot of extraneous money was being spent. Um, they, they didn't have a, a truly good sense of what the heck their top sellers were, you know, unless it was a major blip, like a big outlier, like a Fantastic Four or a Spider-Man, you just didn't know. So Bud Plant, he has pretty much the first comic book shop. Before that, you would get comics from, from uh, like, used bookstores, antique shops, but they would just... buy special specialty stores. If there was even that in the damn 50s and 60s. Phil Soling d d establishes these relationships with these publishers because of his comic book conventions. He spearheads the idea, why not take a meeting with Carmine Infantino and propose this idea of, you sell the books to me, like I will bring you money every, every month, I will bring you money, you sell books directly to me, and, uh, and if we don't make a thousand bucks a month a piece... Uh, then it's just not worth doing. Through his conversation with the guys at DC, they accept his terms. He walks across the street, goes to Marty Goodman's office, and Roy Thomas, Phil Suling is, is from fandom, and Roy Thomas is from fandom. And Roy Thomas says, oh, DC Comics is going to be uh, doing this new endeavor with you? So we will sign up as well. Once you get the two biggest fish... In, in, in the game to sign up for your thing, all the other publishers are going to come along. So Archie signed up, Harvey signed up, Dell signed up. We're off and running. The direct market begins. In 1973, there were maybe 100 to 200 comic shops, like, a Bud, like Bud Plant's shop that he established in like the late 60s. There's this great Will Eisner documentary that John Cook did from a comic book artist magazine. The documentary is great. And it's a Blu-ray. Uh, so the cool thing is you could pack data onto these discs, right? And Will Eisner Quarterly, he had this section in the back of the magazine called Shop Talk, where he would give a big, big, conduct a big interview with some of the people that he largely respected. And, and Phil, Phil Silling is one of those people. Because a lot of the historians of that time and the people who were there in the trenches, they felt that comics could have gone away, gone away if... If, if, if it continued to only have newsstand distribution because of those weird margins with how much they had to print and how much they had to pulp and how much money they had to eat. Yeah, we'll get into numbers at, at later on in this issue that point to what happens whenever you're able to do pre-sales. 
and you're not counting on selling 20% of your print run, but rather you know exactly how many cells you have, and then you could print an extra you know, 10% or something to cover back orders. It, it totally changes the content. It also leads to things like the black and white boom. There's the whole apex, and really that early 90s is sort of that apex of the direct market and what is being built here in the 70s right. that, that is saving comics and then suddenly causing booms in comics. And it actually doesn't interfere with the newsstand people. Like, the newsstand people don't care about this new market because comics are such flotsam and jetsam to their bottom line. Also, they're the king. The people on the top rarely are looking that closely at this guy, this very insignificant numbers of books. Right. At that stage. It's it's true. And so they they both, the newsstand and the direct market, basically never interfered with one another. And in fact they sort of supported each other in a way because kids would discover comics by way of the newsstand, but they would want older issues, and, and that's where the comic shops came in. Yeah, that's my story, probably your story, for probably sure. everybody watching this story. <laughs> yeah, I saw the demographic data for our YouTube <laughs> channel, man. It definitely is people uh, 35 years and older for the most part. So so Suling's distribution company, Seagate. Mm -hmm. He's Seagate, and uh, named after the neighborhood with which he established the company he was doing the mail order stuff i mean not mail order but he was distributing comics to these shops across the country from his house he he was the first monopoly in terms of distribution for comics he invented the thing so he obviously he he was the outlier he reaped a lot of the rewards and eventually he gets sued for that by smaller distributors who start to pop up in the late 70s one of the reasons they they're, they're able to sue him is because he with these long established relationships that he developed with the publishers, he was able to institute a policy that if your shop buys say 20 copies of an issue of something, it will be shipped to your store directly from the printer. So he didn't have to pay overhead of like boxing things. And he also was able to get the books to the shops way faster than the other distribution channels that were, that were in place at the time. So the smaller distributors, they, they ended up suing the guy and they won. So he had to start in-house uh, packaging and shipping his books. And it was ultimately discovered, uh, I think the guy from Mile High Comics got in touch with uh, Suling and, and just told him like, you know what, man, you're, sh you're sending us these books. We're not paying much on shipping. Like, you're kind of eating that cost. And he's like, oh, whatever. Eventually crunches the numbers and realizes that he is shipping these books for free. So at the end of whatever year that was, early 80s, probably like 83, 84, he sends all of the stores a bill for the whole entire year's worth of shipping. And they said, oh, no, OK, we'll, we'll cancel our account with you. And he lost so much business that way. The, the shops went to the other distribution channels. Um, this one called like New Media IJAX or something like that, um, probably Diamond was was a part of the game. Capital City, probably. Sure, sure. Pacific, and so Seagate in the early eighties, like it, it goes it goes away. But like eighty eighty four, it's it's pretty much toast. But Bud Plant was running his own distribution channels at that point, hooked up with Suling, and he was handling a lot of West Coast stuff until he didn't. Until he decided to scale back the business, and Bud Plant sold his. Uh, his warehouse space and a lot of his infrastructure to Steve Geppi from Diamond, thus cr being able to create this coast to coast right. uh, network that that Diamond was able to uh, prosper from f for these past many years. Now that we have that history lesson, you know, you know that kind of shit is my is my heart and soul, man. I love the fan, all of that stuff. I eat it up. That could be the show. Yeah. Bud Plant recently made news for whenever he stopped exhibiting at San Diego after like 30 years of being, you know, one of one of the original exhibitors. There. I think from day one. Yeah. I, I think this is so this is going to be if, if it wasn't 2018, it's 2019. It's going to be the first San Diego Comic Con without Bud Plant's presence, which is which is a loss. And man, I tell you, I liked walking through his setup. It like you said, always had art books, things that I never saw anywhere, often never heard of, featuring artists I loved, artists, you know, that caught my eye, new people. And uh, that's kind of what I thought of as his stand whenever I would see it at San Diego. 
And this list of books is sort of indicative of that. I was reading through this and looking at some of their best quote unquote bargain books. And it's things like Monster Society of Evil. Yeah, that thing is amazing, man. It, it'll it never be reprinted by DC Comics, probably, because there is a lot of, like, um, racist Asian and, and uh, African-American black imagery. They're not going to go there. You know, we were at your publisher, Chris Pitzer's place, and we got to stay at his house, and when I raided his library, that was the book that I checked out for the most part because I it was always kind of legendary. Like, even right here, it was probably out of print. You know, it probably sold out really fast. Um, in fact, in fact, it's uh, published at $135, exclusive sale for 70 bucks. That is... $5 million, 1992 money to, 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 to young Jim Rugg. No doubt. No doubt. But um, ironically, I, I ordered three artist editions this week. <laughs> hey, man, it's Christmas. Yes. <laughs> Even though uh, the kayfabers out there are going to be witnessing this, uh, this episode uh, far later than Christmas. So Captain Marvel and the Monster so Society of Evil collects Captain Marvel Adventures 22, 26 to 46. Could this be perhaps like one of the the earliest serializations in in com comics history. Yeah, for a complete story like that, it really is the same model that we would see in trade paperbacks of the early 2000s where it was a multi-part story serialized in monthly issues and then collected in one volume. Some other books on there, uh, Polly and Her Pals, Eclipse graphic novel sets of uh, Sherlock Holmes and Zorro, Fighting Americans, Simon and Kirby, the the uh, hardcover that Marvel put out in those early 90s. That was, I have that. Yeah, that's, that's a, really that awesome. That was a book that I cherished. I don't know how I got hold of it, because they are pricey, these, these hardcovers, but you had to have that if you had a chance. Greatest Joker stories ever told is this uh, Brian Ballin cover image right there. But can we... Uh, Quit bearing the lead and just show off some of some of the the fun stuff that we would never talk about in uh, in Wizard Magazine. Squeak the Mouse and Super West is mentioned in the Bud Plant catalog. Cartoonist Mattioli, huge for me. These books so big. Of course, Squeak the Mouse is you know totally itchy and scratchy before itchy and scratchy. In this issue, in this first part that we are doing today. There will be two major points of reference that Matt Groening and The Simpsons pulled for, for, their, for their program. This is almost a mild... We talked about EC Comics the last couple of episodes. This is that same sort of format, and I realize putting the title on top with a color background isn't, you know, that original, but... Very similar ratio style. I love how the inside cover, it, like, lulls you into this, like, <laughs> thing. Now, see, they... You, you you know what you're signing up for with the cover, but it's still, you know, this could be like Al Columbia or something. Yeah, totally. The beauty of this first volume is that Squeak the Mouse bites the dust really, really fast, and then he <laughs> becomes a slasher. Like, see, Squeak the Mouse dies on page 14. Violently. <laughs> <laughs> so then it's just uh, the cat is like living his best life, He's having sex with chicks, doing drugs, fucking all day. And then uh, lots of people in his life begin meeting untimely demises. <laughs> and uh, let's, just, let's just skip ahead. The chainsaw is always <laughs> <a> nice. <laughs> let's just skip ahead and see how uh, Squeak turned out. Oh, there he is right there, man. <laughs> <laughs> Looks like a deep fried. Like this is probably uh, what, can, what is the um, main matter in the uh, McDonald's hamburger. <laughs> <laughs> It was so damn good that there were two volumes of it. Same deal. And in fact, I think this one might even have, uh, yeah, appearances by Leatherface from Texas Chainsaw Massacre Part 2. Yeah, he's a very inventive cartoonist, bringing in photo references, sometimes combining the two media. Sticks to that, like, 12-panel grid, which is really cool because it creates this amazing rhythm that, that really is syncopated with the rhythm of like a Tom and Jerry where it's just beat, 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 beat. I think Ivan Brunetti talks about, you know, running the same size. It's very, it, it creates almost a natural animation of your characters, which works perfect. Look at this. Just, <laughs> <laughs> just dark. Yeah. So it tells me that Mattioli is not going to be the uh, wizard uh, top 10 fan favorite <laughs> artist, man. Yeah. I'd encourage everybody to check out 
that and, and Super West. Super West, a little bit more formally inventive. You see him playing with the four color process. Uh, again, there are collages, but this has had a profound impact on me. That's almost Larry Martyr Bean World, the, these little characters. Right. Yeah, and it's like the Snoids from Sheboygan, from Crumb. And... I wonder what kind of uh, influence Matt Hewley still has with uh, in, in the Fumetti Ita Italian comic book market. This is an interesting story because it reads as like three separate stories as you go through the whole thing. Of course, they tie together, but... You know, I, I got hold of this relatively early. They must have printed a ton of these, or they must have been undersold probably, because if you look at it, this is a big influence format-wise when I was putting together my Street Angel books at Image. This is one of the books I pulled off the shelf to like think about size, weight, and all of that. And it is that European album size, I don't know, 48 pages or something in color, hardcover. So it, it may not have sold, because I got Super West hardcover very cheap somewhere. And I know places, you know, like I'll see it sometimes. I think it's just so weird... You know, you know where just this didn't quite find that big audience. Like Squeak the Mouse makes sense. Cat and mouse, mouse violence. You know, it's been around forever. We grew up on that stuff. Super West is just strange. <laughs> the Squeak the Mouse comics, they were um, sold in the old uh, Tower Records from back in the day, man. So they were readily accessible, and there must have been plenty of copies of those things floating around. I wonder what else they sold there, because that's Catalan. Um, I wonder if, like, a lot of Catalan books came through there. Catalan's one of those first European importers and, and has a very big library. I mean, they must have published 80, 80 books or so. Before we even get to page one, <laughs> <laughs> I, would like to, uh, I would like to just give a plug to uh, the, the, the comics fandom works of Bill Shelley, who, uh, you know, all that stuff that we talked about with distribution, Phil Suling, Bud Plant, uh, this guy... Um, this guy, Bill Shelley, he, he's currently writing uh, biographies for of his favorite cartoonists and, and uh, fandom people for Fantagraphics. But in his own uh, imp imprint called Hamster Press, he uh, wrote several books. So this is about the uh, golden age of comic fandom, the earliest days. You know, you, a lot of questions are answered here. Who, who made Bob Overstreet God? And how does he get to choose what the price is for comics. How does that happen? Talks about the early um, fanzines and, and all of that sort of thing. And then he did this book called Fanders, Founders of Comic Fandom. That's really great. Um, it's kind of like an encyclopedia of like all the important people who were a part of creating the, uh, the fan community who, who instituted the first cons and all this stuff. Like, you know, D. Bruce Berry, big time comic fan, sci-fi fan, becomes Kirby's anchor. Incredible. And then uh, I believe Shelley worked with uh, Roy Thomas on Alter Ego magazine or fanzine, however you would want to describe it. So he did some compilations of uh, mm -hmm. the best articles from, from there. Uh, Bill Shelley has his own memoir as well. Another thing that uh, Bill Shelley published are these collected sets of uh, fa fandom's finest comics and uh, the best of star-studded comics. A lot of great cartoonists got their start in in the fan community uh let's see let's see some names um jim starlin roy thomas uh alan wise Paul, uh, jerry ordway jeffrey jones john byrne dave cockram robert crumb they have comics in here from from their uh teenage adolescent amateurish days man that looks amazing yeah that's uh pro that's probably grass green I mean, all of it. Every page I've seen you flip to in there looks great. <laughs> yeah, so there would be some, some extra matter in some of these books, too, um, just describing where some of these stories came from. And then, like, for instance, here's, here's a fanzine story that was drawn by Klaus Janssen in, like, you know, the early, the early 70s. And then, you know, here's a piece by Dave Cockrum, who goes on to create, you know, the all-new, all-different X-Men. And... You know, this is before he got his work with DC Comics. Ostensibly, he could have drawn these pages and showed them to James Warren to get his first work and then take those James Warren pages, show them off to DC, and then become the Dave Cockrum that we all know and love. And, uh, you know, one of my favorite pieces in this this book, it's Fandom's Finest Comics, uh, Volume 2, is this story done in a magazine called uh, called Appa, Appa 5. 
called Call It Karma, Chapter 9, by a young Frank Miller in 1976. You heard it here first, folks. His first comics were not Twilight Zone comics by Dale Goldkey. They were comics that were printed in maybe uh, 50, 50 copies uh, in these old fanzines. And what's cool about this is, first off, he's playing with a chiaroscuro, like noir lighting, choreographing fight scenes. We have, uh, you know, D In Inspector Nick Manalis, who becomes a character. We have... Uh, the Fixer, and his partner, Electra Stephanos. So it's like, it's all here, man. These ideas were brewing in his head for five years, at least before he put pencil to paper on introducing Electra to the Marvel uh, pantheon. He must have been like 16 or something whenever he did this, too, because he broke in so young. If you Google uh, Frank Miller's name and fanzine, you will find a lot of amazing stuff. And one of the coolest things that I found online, and if I if I remember, I will put it in the, the list in the description below the video, but there is an old mimeograph fanzine that he was a part of that he sent a letter in saying talking about how Daredevil is his favorite character. And he was like 13 or 14 years old at that point. So that's like a wow. great little piece of history. Yeah, that's kind of... I'm trying to think of like what he would have been responding to. Maybe uh, Gene Colan or something. You know, That's a great... When you think of Miller style, the lights and darks, the crime elements, it feels like Gene Colan would be the guy you pull from Daredevil. Should we take it to page one? Let's do it. All right, table of contents, man. We could run down the list because it is a stark contrast to the wizard contents that we've seen. All right, so the, it begins with an editorial by Gary Groth entitled Comics, colon, the new culture, the new culture of illiteracy. <laughs> Newswatch, uh, Top of the World, Ma, something about Image Comics usurping uh, DC Comics uh, for the number two spot for, for a month. Rob Roddy examines the contrasting gay figures in Marvel's controversial comic, Alpha Flight, as compared to Donna Barr's The Desert Peach. Mythmaker, an article about Neil Gaiman Sandman. Now All Die, Frank Young pays homage to the zany, illogical, anti-artistic world of early 40s superhero comics. His conceit is that the, uh, the goofy, oddball comics of the Golden Age are kind of coming back Yes, <laughs> with, with, with the establishment of, of image comics. It's a good piece. And then we get into the interviews. Todd McFarlane, Chris Claremont, Alan Moore, Evan Dorkin, David Mazzucchelli. You can see here. That's exceptional. <laughs> <laughs> like, that is murderer's row lineup of, of interview <laughs> subjects. But uh, we will take it to as far as the Todd McFarlane interview today because we did spend a half hour talking about the establishment of the direct market. <laughs> so the, Indi in the Indicia page, what I would call attention to is this section right here. The sheer number and volume of distribution that comics had access to back in the day 23 distributors and who, who carry the comics journal like it's possible there are more distributors out there but yeah 23 distributors where you can get the comics journal that's a good point let's get into it huh let's do it gary groth's editorial comics the new culture of illiteracy or <laughs> why the world is turning to shit part 563 <laughs> so 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 last issue first off Last issue. Wait, can I say one thing? Be my guest. So the conceit of this issue is this is the mainstream issue. So keep that in mind as Gary comes out swinging on page <laughs> one. Now, last issue, when we were going through Wizard number 12, we mentioned time and time again the adults who were cold dissing us as young kids who were picking up these image comics and uh, were trying to steer us in a different direction. I think that we could comfortably say that 100% of the contributors to this magazine would have been those adults who are smacking us in the back of the head and saying, hey, kid, read good comics. Yeah, and as much as I enjoyed Wizard and have enjoyed going back through them, reading this, this magazine does make me rethink a lot of those things. What has come across to me, and, and I don't want to get too far ahead, but this will kind of be a theme in a lot of these articles, is... Everybody talks about kids, young readers. As far as I know, this doesn't even exist now. I know that there are a lot of graphic novels aimed at young readers today. More, you know, definitely more than what was happening at this time. But there's no talk of like, this is the comic book for young readers. Or young readers, you see them buying comics. Whenever I was a kid, there were still, you know, young people who bought comics. If you were an adult buying comics at the newsstand, you were definitely a weirdo. 
now there's just no consideration of that at all. I don't know where a kid would even find a comic outside of a comic book store, which, look, you need to figure out a way to get to that comic book store. It worked for me when I turned 16 and had a driver's license. I don't know what you do if you're nine. It just isn't a consideration anymore. So reading this, that's what I took away from reading this, you know, 25 years later is there is no consideration to like the 10 year old that's reading these, these comics, you know, in a lot of ways, this is the death of comic books because there's no new generation. The people that are still alive, we, we cling to that format, but there is no new birth. We're like, uh, what's, what's the movie with Clive Owen, uh, of men, children of men. There are no new (laughs) young comic book readers reading comic books. You know, the interesting thing about that to me, I was thinking about it in relation to an earlier um, Patrick Daniel O'Neill editorial that we were talking about where he was he was faced with that conundrum himself. Wait, where is the next generation of comic book readers going to be? We were showing forth some of the changes that took place that did get younger people into comics. But then I started to sit there and I started to sit there and think about how new readers now the beauty of today is that new readers actually don't need to be kids. There are a lot of people. Jimmy Corrigan, smartest boy on earth, or whatever the subtitle for that thing is, that got a lot of people into comics who were 20 years old. There are a lot of people who've read my comics who have never even read a comic before based on subject matter, and they're proper adults. So new readership develops. It just It's like you don't have to lean on... You don't have to get them hooked early anymore. I'm not saying there aren't lots of readers what i'm saying is the comic book format we connect to it klaus calls it a fetish object i would say we're nostalgically linked to it i love it but it's that format there are no new fans of comic book the format yeah i could i could uh i i'm on board with that for sure so groth has three points basically in this editorial the world is becoming stupider and here are the three (laughs) the you know his three examples one the rise of image and irrelevance of the concept of writing to wizard magazine. (laughs) And I love this. This is my, uh, this is my like fanographic style barb where like you're jabbing both. It's a double edged sword. He says, it's so stupid. It makes the comics buyer's guide look like the New York times book review. So you get to jab both of them. He he drops a stick. He drops a bomb and the comics buyer's guide catches some some shrapnel. It reminds me of uh, the Dan Klaus ghost world movie. Whenever they're at graduation party and she says, He'll be lucky if he doesn't get AIDS when he date rapes her. (laughs) So let's insult everybody we possibly can. Um, And then three, the speculator mentality and the propaganda behind that. And really those three issues, that's what we're going to see throughout this magazine in interviews and comic book reviews, possibly even in some of the news watch items. Two advantages of producing work without content is that in a speculator market with where it's collectors, Collectors don't mind that the comics suck. They're just going to buy things anyway. Yeah, it's almost a virtue for from a corporate standpoint because you don't have to deal with the talent. You don't have to deal with the quality of the content. You're selling air. <laughs> and he credits Jim Shooter with being really good at this with things like Secret War. The second point for the advantages of producing work without content spoke directly to, to me specifically because he's describing that, you know, the poor young consumer who reads a comic like that is poorly written like this is going to be left vaguely unsatisfied. Even they're going to, they're going to be excited by the visuals, the shiny object. And I was reading, I'm like, Gary is talking about me. Oh yeah. He (laughs) described my reading experience of all these books spot on. (laughs) And of course he can't leave it at that. He has to compare it to a hard on that's never allowed to climax. Basically the American consumer. Right. Yeah. You like, like you're, you're, you're always getting teased and you're always, instructed to want and achieve more, but you're never given that satisfying moment. Yeah, I thought we could pull out some of his breakdown of Wizard, since that's what we've been focusing on so heavily. One, he describes Wizard as 10-point type, which is funny. <laughs> In other words, it's, 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 it's making big... He's calling that big type to fill up the pages because there's less than one-tenth is about the content of comics. And the interviews are interchangeable. And his example is... This is a Todd McFarlane quote from Wizard Magazine interview. I like to draw big, exciting things. This is a Simon Bisley quote from Wizard Magazine. I like to draw big, naked people with big lumps of metal in their hands. <laughs> and we say this every issue. We talk about, like, are you going to write your own books? Are you, you know, like, there's three or four questions. Will there be crossovers? 
you know, Wizard really does have almost that list of like, here are the three questions. Make sure you ask everyone. <laughs> I know, I know you wrote down the quote about the statistician's dream. Did you, did you, or did you not? No, I don't have that. Wizard Magazine is a statistician's dream, a magazine that tells its readers the price of everything and the value of nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, this thing is just loaded, loaded with quotes. Um, taking pride in bilking 12-year-olds by selling them useless garbage at artificially inflated prices. That's his description of the speculator market. And Gary talked with marketing gurus in preparation for this editorial. And the, the numbers that they crunched, they estimate that there are about 800 to a million comics readers in total across the country. Three million copies of Spider-Man sold. 5 million copies of X-Force sold, and 8 million copies of X-Men 1 sold. Who are these people? It's, it's troubling whenever you start to really think about what's going on here. I usually take the stance of who cares the market will you know sort of straighten it out. He gets into why that's not necessarily the case. And I think, you know, time has, has sort of borne out what he describes happening. You know, you have these stores that have cases of these books, and they're only selling a few of them. Well, guess what? They still have cases of those books. And whenever the people that bought them decide they're going to cash in on their investment, nobody wants those because we have cases of those in the back. Even more egregious than Wizard Magazine to Gary Groth is the catalog that Mile High Comics, the retail store, um, produces and sends out to their mailing list. Uh, what he finds most egregious about this catalog is that the, the people who review the comics within the, that catalog, they offer up numbers of copies that they plan on hoarding for themselves in almost like a, uh, a baiting way. For instance, this, this one reviewer is talking about the hardcore uh, Valiant comic, number one, where the guy gets into, you know, all this nonsense about how he believes that it's going to be worth something someday. So he is going to buy, the last sentence, I'll buy at least a thousand copies. I can remember going to like these card dealers turned comic book dealers. As soon as I got my driver's license, man, I would go to garages and attics and wherever I could find comics. And I can remember a guy pulling out long boxes and being like, you can't afford not to buy 10 of every comic Valiant publishes. And it's like, dude, I'm buying zero of these. I did eventually buy them, but it was like for a quarter, 10 years later. So, so, so here's the rub that, that corresponds with, with Gary's title of uh, the new cultural of illiteracy. Because in order for your comics to be artificially worth money, they have to be in good condition, which is to say, you can't even open the motherfuckers, man. This investment culture is rewarding people for not reading. Yeah, and he goes on to cite Dave Sim, and Dave Sim had addressed a retailer summit or something with a bunch of comics retailers, and sort of gets behind this, where the comics market is, this this move towards speculators, and this encouragement that, hey, you're the retailers, you're your own boss, you know, you can charge whatever you want. Um, you know, he seems to have no problem with this type of enterprise because I guess, you know, if you're selling books, you're selling books from the direct market point of view, right? They're not returnable. So keep ordering them guys, you know, and the conclusion is changes are afoot, but they can only be considered positive if you are harbor a pathological hatred for literacy and culture. It's a, it's a disturbing point of view at the time. And it's more so disturbing now. I had trouble watching Mad Men, the TV show, because you know how that stuff all ends. Like, you know that point of view is like, it's gone. That's Those are dinosaurs in their last days. And you read this article now, knowing what the rest of the 90s, what's going to happen to comics. And it's just, it's kind of heartbreaking if you love comics. You know, like, this really sort of is the end of the comic book. Gary has a lot of trouble with the things that Dave Sim is suggesting in the, in that speech. Dave Sim is, you know, of this old model of like, you know, he did Cerebus on his own on a monthly basis for 20 something years. And Dave Sim in the in, in the speech is kind of like lambasting these cartoonists who who have to take their time to make their comics. Oh, they they spend months on making a comic and what do they sell? 5,000 copies. That's not the way to go. And Groth suggests that it's almost like, you know, an important figure in prose fiction or something talking to Walden Books and and uh, Barnes & Noble book buyers and saying that they shouldn't carry, like, 
Gravity's Rainbow by Thomas Pinchon or something because it's like literarily significant. You should just keep buying extra copies of Stephen King and like uh, James Patterson books. Yeah, whoever can churn that stuff out at a rapid clip. He says, uh, you know, these changes should disturb anyone who loves beauty, wit, charm, originalities, which are now frowned upon as impediments to commerce. That's the part, you know, it kills you. Like you think of the books that you love. I don't know, man. I, I came away from this feeling pretty bad because this stuff is true. Like it's very, very accurate. It sets a tone. It sets a tone. <laughs> That's true, man. And it's a nice lead-in to this first Newswatch item. Malibu moves ahead of DC in comic book market. Yeah, so, I mean, literally what he's describing happening has happened, right? The, the, the artists have outsold the company that still employs writers. <laughs> it's over in a matter of a page turn. <laughs> the, the little pie chart is incredible to look at because not even mentioned in in the body of the article is the fact that in this hundreds of millions of dollars of of revenue that changed hands in this month wizard magazine owns almost three percent of that yeah and compare that to dc is 17 percent. you're looking at you know wizard press is 15 percent or so the size of dc comics 12 wow. mo- 12 month old uh publication 12 month old speculator rag (laughs) yeah you know like when we talk uh pro wrestling parlance and i mentioned that like would wizard be the dirt sheet and it in fact would not be like like this comics journal would be considered the dirt sheet because the dirt in dirt sheet is like inside scoop inside dirt so wizard would be an after mag i was gonna say after (laughs) (laughs) um the thing that stood out to me in the in the comics market you know in this story about the comics market uh, one, there was an exceptional month that put Image ahead. And, you know, they'll be ahead from time to time moving forward at this point. But the the bigger thing is when they go, they talk to different publishers about what does it mean, and they try to get Malibu on the record. And Malibu refuses to talk to the journal. They refuse to acknowledge that the journal is a viable journalistic publication. Uh, they don't believe in fanographics methods of doing business. Uh, which is kind of interesting since this is more or less a positive <laughs> mention of Malibu comics. This, this is something that has always and, and will always, as long as the comics journal exists, it's always going to, to follow comics journal. And it's the fact that Gary Groth, the publisher of Fantagraphics, who publishes libraries of comics, also publishes this magazine that criticizes comics. So why would, um, why would Gary say anything bad about the things that, that he put his, his own money down to, to publish. But I know all of the Generation 1 important Fantagraphics cartoonists, and I will say no names, all of them. They have complained. I, I have verbally heard their complaints from time to time when Gary would roast them a little bit. Well, that's the legend of the comics journal, right? I mean, at times they've hated everything. <laughs> I think there's a little bit more to Dave Ulbrich, the publisher of Malibu at the time, or president, I'm not sure if he was the publisher or Scott Rosenberg, but those were the two guys behind Malibu. In 1987, Gary Groth and Fanographics sued Scott Rosenberg, who had been working as a distributor, Sun, Sunrise distributor. Um, it'll come up again, but I think that, that Dave Ulbricht's objection to Fanographics and to the Comics Journal probably stems from that lawsuit, and I'm not sure how that was resolved, but I, I have a feeling... His animosity towards fanographics is more than just comics journals critical of everything. And most of the publishers, they they really enjoy the fact that that Malibu usurped uh, DC for for a hot minute. And when DC gets on the horn, they feel no threat. They know that next month they're going to be okay. But they suggest that the people who should really feel threatened should be Marvel Comics because uh, they because they lost like if uh, if DC lost like two percent of the market share. Uh, Marvel Comics lost like 15% or something. That's a good point because we saw those same pie charts in Wizard Magazine and Marvel was over 50% when they started showing those. Next article, two artists in dispute with uh, Eclipse Comics, Norm Brayfogle and Raphael Kayanen. I believe it was Wizard Magazine issue eight where we talked about Mike Friedrich's uh, agency. Yes. Star Reach, where he was representing... 
cartoonists and writers uh, getting comic book deals and, and, and whatnot. Friedrich represents both of these guys and, from my estimation, didn't do right by the people he represented in, in these two instances. Yeah, that's fair. Norm, Norm Breifogel's complaint is his book was not printed the way he wanted it printed. There should have been some color section. It was all printed in black and white. Uh, it, he talks about verbal agreements yes. that it was going to be that way. And like, uh, I don't know about that, man. Yeah, for sure. Don't accept and any verbal anything. Dean Mullaney, publisher of Eclipse, you know, explains the sell, pre-order sales, again, depending on the direct market, just weren't good enough to pay for the color. Um, and then Raphael Kainan, I forget what book he was doing. Um, series of uh, like grim fairy tales. Yeah, so he drew his story without a contract, and then the book was canceled after he basically finished his work on it. Some fully painted pages, like pages that probably took a week. Yeah, and uh, and the response there is there was no contract. There was no contract, and uh, you know Friedrich is is like you know we've we've done work like this before where we were butting up against a deadline, and in good faith the artists would start begin the project. And everything would work out. But we will rethink our relationship with Eclipse Comics, you know, from, from this point forward. And God damn it, if you're an agent, get the name on a dotted line. Like, Yeah, I mean, I, I feel like my entire life I've been told never work without a contract. Yeah, and, and I'm Jesus. not an agent. Like, if you're an agent, I would think you would, you know, that would be rule number one through ten. Said it before, say it again, man. We get the comics business that we deserve, man. And when douchebags... I don't even know who's the douchebag here. It's like everybody's the douchebag. Kind of. They set a precedent, and then they think that that's the way it's going to be. I worked with a publisher expressly, like, in the contract, had it denoted that the book will be printed in hardcover. And the book was printed in hardcover, but after I signed up and we were moving forward, the publisher called me up to try to get me to do a flexi cover. The co-publisher called me up another time to try to get me to do a flexi cover. And then their in-house toady <laughs> gave me a call to try to get me to do a flexi cover. And I said, fuck that, man. Like, in the contract, like, we said it was going to be hardcover. I want a hardcover book. I envisioned this as a hardcover book. So then uh, every book I've published since then has a flexi cover. <laughs> huh. uh, next article, comics publisher climbs Georgia State Capitol. When we were... Coming through this issue, you were really excited about this. Yes. I don't know about this, so drop some science. All right, so Dark Zulu Lies publisher, Nabil Hodge. This, I first learned about him through an upcoming Wizard magazine. He was part of a group of publishers, African-American publishers, who formed together to kind of get you know more press for, for what they were doing. They were self-publishers. You know, Many of them were artist-writers. Uh, Hodge is just a writer and then hires people work for hire to draw a couple of his books um so i was really excited by it because in a lot of ways it mirrored milestone but they were still self-publishing and that was the only time i ever saw them mentioned um since then i've picked up all of their books or i think all of them and they only lasted for you know not very long because then you start to see in their letters columns and editorial pages the dissolution of that of that group but his gimmick was he dressed up as one of his characters and climbed out onto this the state capitol building in Atlanta. Uh, what would happen to this poor oh, bastard if it was 2018 and he did that? Man? There'd just be YouTube clips of him <laughs> getting eviscerated. He, he wouldn't live. With like, like, there's no way. You know that that would be horrendous. This was all kind of laughed off. But it's interesting, and he'll be featured in an upcoming Comics Journal interview, uh, a pretty substantial feature interview. I, I don't know the issue of that. We could probably you know flash it on on the screen while I'm saying this. But, you know, like, he has a little bit of an imprint in comics. We will be covering it more whenever we get into that wizard announcement of those guys. But I was very excited to see him. And his the books that he published include Motorbike Puppies, Third World, which I've never seen. I have two issues of Motorbike Puppies. And Zawana, Son of Zulu, uh, which I have a couple issues of. So, you know, interesting comics, interesting self-publisher. That's my favorite stuff for these self-published books. And especially, you know, like, he was actually born in Africa... I forget what country, you know, and then like came here, Liberia. Um, I think there was a civil war there and he left Liberia. He went to school here in the States and I think he's still around. I think he's in Michigan now in real estate maybe. But, you know, it's a very different point of view. We'll, we'll get back to him again. You know, like he's mentioned in an upcoming wizard. He's mentioned in another comics journal. 
if you're interested in, in him, you can definitely find more material on him and what he published. And we'll cover more because I have a stack of his books. So we'll get to them whenever uh, we cover him in Wizard. Joe, Joe Schuster dies at age 78, man. Co-creator of uh, Superman. Sold, sold it to DC Comics in 1938 for uh, 130 bucks. Went through all sorts of litigation, won a lawsuit uh, for the Superboy character, which DC went on to create, but uh, gave gave uh, Siegel and Schuster no no credit for, thanks to people like Neil Adams and probably Gary Groth in the Comics Journal. And possibly a publicist. So they ended up with a, a little bit of a severance type package of $20,000 a year until uh, 1981, it went up to $30,000. And I think that was related to publicity around the release of the first Superman movie. Right. Again, connected to the whole creator rights mainstream theme of this issue. Animation pioneer Rudolf Ising dies at 88 years old. He did the, uh, excuse me, the Bosco cartoons. Mm -hmm. Could put some links in the uh, comments for those, man. Beautifully animated, but it is, you know, blackface kind of imagery, which is unfortunate. Yeah, goes back to the, the 20s, his career, you know, the very early animation stuff, worked with Disney. Uh, went off on his own. Not someone I'm, you know, particularly familiar with, but he got a lot more ink than Joe Shuster. The Comics Journal likes to show off sometimes. <laughs> like, like we are going to see, we are going to see rating systems based off of Faulkner quotes. <laughs> 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 Comics band lifted in South Africa. Not Fantagraphic specific, but uh, they are sort of touting that, you know, the books, the Fanta books that weren't available in South Africa at a certain point are now going to be accessible. Uh, also, some things that will be able to hit the shelves there is, uh, you know, From Hell, some Milo Manara comics and things like that. This made me actually think about whenever we go to, like, TCAF, uh, Toronto Comic Arts Festival, whenever we're not in America and we're at a comic book convention, uh, we, this librarian went up to, uh, I think it was uh, Jess Fink who was signing next to me. And she does, like, you know, erotic comics, has some some nudity or, or something in there. And a librarian was like very excited to tell her that her books are no longer banned in the library system. And I'm like, oh yeah, there's no First Amendment up here. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of interesting. It's interesting the books that were pulled, you know, From Hell, uh, Love and Rockets is one of them that they actually went to court to, to have reinstated. So don't take that for granted. I have an ad here, Double Diamond Press, man. Real comics for real people. Hepcats ad. I wonder. I wonder if uh, Tom Palmer Jr. like bought his his Hepcats from an ad in the uh, Comics Journal. Could be. And this guy here, Sam Hurt. Mm -hmm. We talked about him in the humor issue of uh, Palmer's Picks. Looks like good looking stuff. New publisher, new artist, new graphic novel. So this would be our first mention on the show of Paul Pope. Horse Press, the comic uh, that precedes THB, which I had no idea about. Sin Titulo. It went against the grain in the way that they decided to release it to the world. An 84-page comic at 10 bucks a pop, man. That This was this was not done. Like, the Marvel quote-unquote graphic novels were 64-page books. Pope has, like, European influences, so he knows that books exist like this. And he's working, you know, they mentioned that he's at Ohio State. Uh, yes. You know, Columbus, Ohio. Yeah, so he has access to the Billy Ireland Library at this time. Um, you know, for anyone who isn't familiar with that, it's now it's probably the biggest holding of original comic art in the world, I would guess. It's an incredible resource, but it started in the 80s. So, you know, if you're a student there or whatever, it's just one of the holdings in their library system. And you could go there and look at original art, look at a big selection of comics from probably all over the, the globe at that point. You know, you're talking about European graphic novels. That stuff was probably represented at that time. So, you know, he had access to this material. You know, other alumni would be like Jeff Smith going through that same system, possibly a few years, you know, ahead of Paul Pope here. But, uh, you know, kind of that same passageway and being exposed to a lot of great cartooning history. I bumped into Pope, like, after I did my residency at the Thurber House in Columbus, Ohio. And uh, that was when we were in TCAF, actually. And I, I mentioned the Billy Ireland. He's like, oh, how's Lucy doing? Like, probably lived there. Oh, man. How 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 couldn't you? You know, like... I did. I was the, only there for three <laughs> weeks, and I spent seven days there. The first time... I went to Columbus every year for ten years to a show, and then finally went to the Billy Ireland, and I think I went back six more times in the next two months. <laughs> we should plan a trip soon. Yeah. We will end up... We will be talking 
a lot more about Paul Pope uh, in future Palmer's picks, and 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 we'll take it from there. Like the idea of covering com- Comics Journal and the stuff that we're going to be talking about is bringing to light some things that uh, we will never see in Wizard. So we'll put a pin in Paul Pope, and we'll talk about him later for sure. Popeye artist fired. Bobby London was fired from uh, the Popeye comic strip for for telling a vague abortion story about olive oil gets gets hold of like some kind of ugly like baby doll or something and she keeps trying to get rid of it and she wants to give it to the sea hag and uh every nobody's letting her get rid of it and she she ultimately says something like like i refuse to let these men force me to keep this thing <laughs> now this book guy bobby lunn he's a he's a rebel rouser man because he was a part of the air pirates crew mm-hmm. Uh, in the early 70s, who, if you didn't listen to our comic book confidential um, audio commentary track, the Air Pirates co- Funnies comics, there were two issues of that, uh, spearheaded by a cartoonist named Dan O'Neill. They um, ultimately got sued by by uh, Disney and uh, had to fork over millions of dollars, basically. Yeah, and he mentions that they knew that when they hired him. You know, like, he was kind of brought on to get some attention, uh, but... This happens, you know, I feel like this happens in film, it happens on television, you know, this happens across media. Somebody goes too far, somebody offends a sponsor. Yeah, I mean, it's all it's all the bottom line. So, like, if Bobby London would have done this and would have, like, who knows how you how you um, quantify the success of a comic strip, you know, I guess, like, the amount of papers that buy it. If he would have gained a way bigger audience, it would have been fine. Like, when I was, when I was young... Uh, you know, Howard Stern was promoting his books on uh, like the Jay Leno show mm-hmm. and, and the Miss America book. He came out in in uh, in drag and he had, you know, two lesbians with him, which was very shocking in, you know, 1992 or whatever. And so he's there in a dress, you know, he's seven feet tall. And Jay Leno's like, how do they let you do this? And he just simply said that, like, oh, don't worry. The second I lose my audience, like I'll be fired in two seconds. And that totally stuck with me. It's like, OK, you get to do what you want. You just have to you just have to bring the, the, the crowd with you. Yeah, remember that for whenever we get to the McFarlane interview. Um, This reminds me a lot of Marvel would gimmick stuff. You know, this is not that different than having North Star come out as gay in Alpha Flight. You know, it's a way to sort of like spike interest, but again, it can backfire. I love that we're actually going to get to see what a piece from that Alpha Flight comic looks like. Yes. Because I can't believe I never thought to even like look in that magazine, but just seeing that one image, holy shit. We'll get there in a couple minutes, guys. Don't you worry. So this is the miscellany. It's just updates from different publishers. DC launches Vertigo line. Again, kind of a sign, you know, this is a good touch tone as to where comics are at this time. You know, they had been publishing some of those books like Sandman, of course, you know, being the most probably popular, but they had been sort of publishing the books that would comprise Vertigo. And this is just like the official, all right, make them an imprint, you know, for sales reasons, let's do it. And so that's Doom Patrol, uh, Animal Man, Swamp Thing, Shade the Changing Man. Books that I think, you know, anybody familiar with Vertigo knows. But it's all built around Sandman, I think, at this point. Certainly built around those British guys. Various art shows around uh, around the country. One in Chicago with art from uh, Mike Allred, Brian Ballin, Howard Chaikin. Uh, another art show, Cartoon Art Museum in San Francisco, featuring Walt, Walt Kelly's Pogo. It's so interesting to see these things pop up. Next article is just Harris Leaves Dark Horse. So the Harris imprint, I guess, had distribution from Dark Horse magazine in the comic book press because I was reading about Harris. Like, I remember growing up and, like, you would see Vampirella and it's like, okay, well, who the hell are these dudes? Published a Guitar World magazine and a couple other, like, really big magazines. So they they were just jumping into the comics thing for a while while it was hot. And, and of course, they're basically, when the speculation stuff went away and it wasn't a $500 million a year business anymore, they... They, uh, We're going to see a lot of that, you know, publishers that, that look at comics and see growth and throw their hat in the ring. This is fun. Eclipse and HarperCollins uh, allied. So it's like one of the super early attempts to invade the, the bookstore market. And to this day, um, the comics publishers um, sort of piggyback the distribution channels that uh, that bigger book companies have. Norton distributes books, Baker and Taylor, Ingram, mm-hmm. um, proper book store, proper book publishers um, handle bookstore distribution for Fantagraphics and uh, Drawn and Quarterly, Farrah Strauss and Giroux. Early early evidence of this. Yeah, you're seeing the seeds of 
graphic novels. Paul Pope's self-publishing one. Eclipse is trying to partner with a traditional publisher in order to distribute their graph, early graphic novel efforts. Um, NYC and Chicago Comic Groups formed. Uh, so, like, the Chicago Group, man, has, yeah. has uh, people, like, uh, for, ranging from Hilary Barta to Dan Clowes, man. Imagine that table. <laughs> I think that... Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Jim was about to be candid. <laughs> Uh, I didn't really pull much from from Hither and Yon, except that uh, Todd McFarlane receives Wizards Platinum Award for sales of over a million copies of Spawn Number no. One, and John Singleton, the director of Boys in the Hood, presented the award to McFarlane at Golden Apple Comics. Yeah, twenty three hundred copies of Spawn were sold at that you know at the store at that event. That's a pretty good signing. <laughs> yeah, but uh, since it was a speculation market, it could have been uh, you know fifty guys who bought those. <laughs> Yeah, two of those mile high guys. You gotta buy a thousand each. Um, I made a note of longtime Marvel writer Bill Mantlo was uh, hit by a car. Uh, it says while crossing a street. I believe it was actually while rollerblading. Yeah. And uh, this still, he, he's needed assisted living ever since. I think his brother's this caretaker. Uh, Floating World Comics in Portland has done fundraisers. You know, Bill Mantlo um, wrote all of ROM. I think that's a book that a lot of people love. Uh, so, you know, Floating World would do art shows that would feature, like, ROM. Um, I contributed to one of those. He also created Rocket Raccoon, everybody knows now, from Guardians of the Galaxy. So, Yeah, one of the great tragedies of, uh, of within comics of uh, my, my lifetime, pretty much. It's sad to read that and think how long, you know, like, he's never been the same. He's, he's never been able to live on his own since then. New Comics News. All the small publishers and their their newest efforts. Uh, did you pull any specifics uh, out of this gimmick? My first one is Fathom Press. My first is Fantagraphics because uh, at this point, the complete Crumb Comics number nine will will be hitting the shelves. That's this baby right here. And uh, f and for my money, once again, this will not be covered in Wizard Magazine ever. <laughs> so I just want to take a minute to just talk about Complete Crumb Comics. For those who don't know, Robert Crumb sort of was the was the outlier of the underground comics movement, movement with uh, Zap Comics and some work he did previously to that. Important figure in, uh, in independent comics uh, history. This series, I, f I found very soon after this with this uh, comics journal that we're covering, incredibly influential to me as a as a kid. Basically, the conceit of the of the uh, series is that uh, they go sort of year by year. Maybe maybe a volume will cover a year and a half period worth of of his work. So um, when I discovered this series, you know, and it begins with pre professional work comics that that he drew with his brother Charles, who is actually kind of like in some ways, a better cartoonist than he was in those those early days. Those cat comics looked amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and just seeing that they were on notebook paper mm -hmm. was super important to me, man. And as a kid, when you are when you want to grow up to become a cartoonist and you suck, you need tangible proof and tangible evidence that if you bust your ass, you, you will get better. And that is the function that these comics served for me. You know what I mean? Like, I never wanted to make stories like this. You know, these, like, little small ditties. That, and, and, you know, I've, I've never done acid. So I, I don't have, like, those, like, brain-expanding kind of uh, gimmicks, of course. There's, like, uh, you know, race, racist imagery that's that's very unfortunate that, that has really clouded, like, it's a blemish on, on his record. And sexist imagery. Yeah, for sure. I think maybe 10 or, issue 10 or 11 was out uh, when, when I discovered... These babies. You know, uh, noteworthy of the complete Crumb comics, I think, is that this is a template for one big chunk of what Fanagraphics does. You know, the publisher of the world's greatest cartoonist, and they've done several archival projects. You know, Crumb was probably one of the early uh, cartoonists that they, they started to do this type of archival reprinting. Um, since then, you know, they've done complete Peanuts. They've done tons of complete runs of either strips, books, or cartoonists. And, you know, Crumb was one of those early significant cartoonists that they hooked up with to sort of show, to, to treat differently, quite frankly. Which, again, we're going to get into with McFarlane talks about respect and how the comp publishing companies don't respect their artists. Complete Crumb Comics is an example of the publisher respecting the artist and an early example of that. So you said Fathom Press, man. Tim Tyler's Blood Rain. 
Yeah, so the first uh, first several issues of Blood Rain are out of print, and they're advertising that they're going to do a collection of the first three books. Tim Tyler, uh, a very young cartoonist at this point. I was surprised to learn how young he was. He's probably, you know, 20, 21, something like that at this time. He, I learned about him through his association with Tim Vigil from Faust and North Star. So it's black and white horror, R-rated, NC-17 type comics. Father and Press is him self-publishing. Oh, cool. So it's everything. And his stuff is interesting to me because it's that underground horror, but it's also the image stuff. You'll see cross-hatching. You see you know, a lot of attention to figures and muscles and kind of a dynamic approach to layout. So uh, interesting cartoonist, and he's still around and active. He's been doing crowdfunders for various self-published work. I think he might still publish under Father and Press. Oh, super cool. Yeah. I love the two-color approach. And Blood Rain, I think there are eight or nine issues of this. That's awesome, man. Yeah, Good for it, him. He ran for a while. But he's done a ton of stuff. Very, very prolific. I don't think we're going to see him in Wizard. <laughs> <laughs> Mirage, the turtles visit an inhabited planet full of Von Bode characters in uh, Time's Pipeline Special Edition, drawn by uh, Mark Bode. Coloring's real interesting on this baby. It's like uh, probably like Prismacolor marker. Or, or maybe it was like those like early 90s and before markers that had that like uh, acetone or like some sort of uh, carcinogenic uh, chemicals in, in it that stunk up the house. And... Man, it looks good. It's, it's nice reproduction too. You really get to see that marker, the paper, everything is there. Yep. Very interesting. I love anytime you find like the coloring that's different than, you know, that's the only example that looks like that. Right. <laughs> Pretty cool. Good looking book. Image is up and running already. We have a parody <laughs> press. Uh, old blood. <laughs> I knew you would come through. That's pretty incredible because they're only on Young Blood number two. <laughs> well, I mean, issue two probably came out six months after issue one. <laughs> That's fair. Oh, man, this is great. Look at that pose. <laughs> There's so many of these. Like, to me, this is the proof of how big the numbers of comic orders were at the time. It's a flip book, too, people. As it should be. True to form. And then the other comic that's mentioned there that I brought along is uh, Rubber Blanket. So this is David Mazzucchelli post Batman Year One, um, starting to self-publish, and it's news of the second issue of Rubber Blanket uh, coming out. So evidence that it really exists. Here it is, man. These were incredible. Somehow I got hold of one of these pretty early on, probably because I knew David Mazzucchelli's name from Batman Year One or from Daredevil. He, he's covered in Palmer's picks too, so like yeah, it could have been from that. When you go from Batman Year One to this, and you're you know 14 trying to figure out how to make comics, like this was. Uh, I looked at it a long time trying to figure out what I was seeing, <laughs> what had happened, why is he drawing this way, and then you know you start to be exposed to slice of life type stories, genres besides superheroes, and early ideas about production and self-publishing. You know, like two-color printing. I just know that, like, there is a large percentage of, like, you know, born-again fans who are like, he just can't draw anymore. Right. <laughs> Certainly uh, gauging from, like, some of the comments we've received, uh, it's like, oh, yeah, people still think that way. Yeah, meanwhile, he was... I think this was a reflection of what he was seeing. You know, besides alternative comics, I think he got into a manga vein at some point because he's done stories about Japanese comics. And I think it was probably all around this time, you know. It was probably looking at Raw. You know, what the stuff that was available was very, very graphic. That, I think, initial indie alternative comics that were coming out of, like, the 80s. You know, I can see things like Gary Panter... Some, some different influences. We'll cover this sort. way deeper in like future Palmer's picks, and there's a Magic Kelly ish uh, interview that we'll we'll do next uh, next uh, week. But here are the other covers to uh, Rubber Blanket. Seek these babies out. This one's easily accessible. Yeah, if you find them, buy them. Carrying on the theme of the adults who are telling us that we're douchebags and assholes <laughs> for reading the comics that we do. The, uh, the Funny Book Roulette feature, long staple of uh, Comics Journal by uh, R. Fiore, where he does, yes, he does, in fact, uh, create his grading system based on a uh, William Faulk Faulkner quote, The Ode to the Grecian Urn is worth a, a number of old ladies. 
<laughs> and he just describes, okay, yeah. And he just describes that, like, you know, the more old ladies that your thing is worth, the better the comic is, man. So here's the thing about TCG. And one, one old lady, it's toilet paper. <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, almost everybody who's not Gary Groth is, like, trying to write for Gary Groth, you know what I mean? It's like Gary Groth cosplay or something. And, and uh, you know, over the years, like, I've met some some of these dudes. I never met Fiori. Uh, I never met really any of the writers from, from this issue. But, uh, frankly, they're sycophants. Yeah. They're, they're sycophants and trying to kiss Gary's butt. I think there's some good stuff in this. Uh, I think that that is really what the Comics Journal becomes. Because I, yeah. I had my subscription to the Comics Journal in 2000. Yeah. And it was a very different magazine than, than this issue. But you see shades of it, like you're describing. Yeah. But uh, he offers some background on mainstream comics, right? Since this issue is mainstream, he is pulling Marvel, DC, and Image books to review here. And he talks about after Ditko and Kirby, quality suffers as the supply increase to meet demand, which I think everybody agrees with. He also says writing after the 70s, writers seem to not read, and that results in a lack of structure. And structure is something I'm sort of uh, uh, obsessive about nowadays, especially um, whenever I teach storytelling. Structure is a huge part because I guess I agree with them. I see a lack of structure uh, in today's world. Um, who knows why? And then he also mentions original art market leads to artists doing as many fight scenes as possible. <laughs> Probably something I loved back then. And my quote is, visually and verbally illiterate, a slick veneer of slaughter over a foundation of nothing. Mindless, <laughs> heartless, and with no more sense of human values than a hyena. <laughs> So that's the stuff I was reading, man. That's what I was reading when I was like, give me more comics and I want to make some of these. Right. <laughs> the people who laid the cornerstones of like uh, superhero comics, J Jack Kirby, Gil Kane, C.C. Beck, Will Eisner. Then the next generation was like Wrightson, Barry Windsor Smith, Kaluta. And these guys are slower. They're like the flashy guys. And then, you know, the future of comics artists and comics reader uh, writers were all inspired almost solely by comics, which we will see evidence of later on in this episode. Yeah, so Amazing Spider-Man 365, he gives one out of seven. Uh, fight scenes are reasonably mediocre, but real people in street clothes are hopeless, and there's a backup that he describes as pathetic. Looks like they've given up trying to maintain quality. <laughs> um, Detective Comics 698, he gives a three out of seven. Or 648, rather. Gives it two. Well, there's seven, because the old ladies can be tipped over, so there can be like two and a half. So oh, I just I factored see. out there's a seven possible ratings. I see. <laughs> yeah, even the rating system isn't very clear. Um, he describes this Detective Comics 648 as, quote, you're not getting anything you couldn't get better on television, end quote. Um, Uncanny X-Men 282 is a two out of seven. Convoluted exposition on nine out of 22 pages. It doesn't matter if it's lousy. Lousy is what the audience has learned to expect from the most popular comic book in the world. <laughs> he is, uh, he's not happy with any of these. Yeah, now, this is an era of comics where you only had so much to pull from, man. So it's like, you got to write your feature. You got to choose something. Like, nowadays, if this feature was, was around nowadays, like, I would suggest that the guy take, take some pills Get an antidepressant <laughs> and, and, and write about something good. I always think like the internet is so negative in a lot of ways. When that negativity came up, I always thought like, read something else. <laughs> but of course, in 1992, your choices were limited, especially, I guess, if you were going to do coverage of mainstream comics. Lobo's Back. So Lobo's Back, number two. This is by Simon Bisley. This was the, uh, the cock issue. Oh, there right. was some, some talk about how he had snuck a penis on the cover there. Um, this is four out of seven. So that's pretty good. That's the best we're going to get in this group of reviews. I think so. Um, the story is that Lobo Lobo was killed at the end of issue one, and now he wears out his welcome in heaven, and then he wears out his welcome in hell in an effort to basically get back to Earth. Uh, ugliness is, is how he describes this book. He said he admits to chuckling a couple of times and describes Bisley as Sienkiewicz without thought, just affectation. <laughs> Maybe. Yeah, some of the descriptions are, are kind of spot on, and the only the disagreement is they don't like it, or, and I like it, or vice versa. But in right. terms of description, you know, it's not bad. <laughs> <There you go. laughs> and then, bam, 
Youngblood number two and Spawn number two. He admits that uh, he almost hates to say it, but he kind of likes Todd McFarlane's stuff, man. It's hard to resist. He gives it a, a two out of seven and Youngblood a zero out of seven. <laughs> This is another it's, it's one less of those than toilet paper. Double edged swords. <laughs> um, the story, what there is, this is spawn number two. The story, what there is, is fairly okay Frank Miller pastiche. And Frank Miller isn't doing anything at the time, so there you go. Uh, here's your double edged sword. I love it. I, I know exactly where you're going. <laughs> I don't see why people call McFarlane illiterate when Liefeld is around. <laughs> I actually didn't pick that one up, man. The one that I was going to to say was about uh, how Fiore, if he had like a cartoonist re-education camp, he would force Todd McFarlane to work on humor comics because he thinks that he sees the germ of a humor streak in there, but uh, he's he's not leaning into it enough. It is laughable when you think about, we're going to hear McFarlane say his like job to... is to sell comics. Yeah. He is more successful at this than virtually anyone else in the history of the business. And then a critic is going to say, you know, I would put him on this book or, or I think he has potential to be an OK cartoonist. Like, right. It's a very different value scale. You know, the way he's judging this book is not McFarlane's intention in terms of what he's trying to make. And that will be the crux of the argument in the, in the future interview uh, in a couple of minutes that we will be getting into, man. This is this. The other fun note from Youngblood is that it is the first appearance of Shadowhawk. Right. A small preview. And uh, he says, Why Shadowhawk? Uh, Gestapo man taken. Yeah. <laughs> I guess he doesn't agree with Shadowhawk's vigilante ways. Right. Yeah. You know, should you have your spine broken for uh, playing three card Monty on the street <laughs> corner? I don't know, man. He mentions uh, in the piece that. Uh, you know, he calls all the he calls all the Liefeld tropes out, man. Characters have three facial expressions, you know, uh, mouth closed, a grimace, and a mouth open. We should say this is Kirby. We talked about uh, Jim Lee has a Kirby-like character, Jacob Marlowe in Wildcats, and uh, Liefeld has a Kirby character named Kirby, and this is part of a team called the Berserkers. He he mentions how the the that issue of Youngblood, like the story is like a dozen pages or something like that, but it felt like an eternity to, to read. <laughs> and it immediately made me think about, um, you know, when that when the Ed Wood movie came out and I was seeking out the Ed Wood movies, these are films that are like 60 minutes long yes. and really feel like they're five hour, <laughs> like two tape, freaking, uh, you know, Godfather two length movies, man. It's like, what? Only 40 minutes went by? <laughs> Comics Library? Rod Rowdy <laughs> is talking about uh, is talking about North Star coming out and Alpha Flight number one hundred six. Rob Rowdy, man, he he's he is a gay writer, and so he's spe speaking from that perspective. One of the things that he mentions is that uh, there was mention that there was they were sowing the seeds of the North Star character being gay from day one, and he mentions the John Byrne stuff, how North Star's features were a little bit more soft. Um, slightly perhaps more like he he his words effeminate um but then we get to issue 106 <laughs> of uh, alpha flight and he's got you know he's got a, a barge of a chest you know what i mean he's straight up on roids big muscular bulky mark pasella doing his best jim lee slash rob liefeld riff yeah and and coming out i guess in the middle of a fight scene explaining to the guy he's fighting that <laughs> that he's gay my takeaway from this article is Alpha Flight is terrible. Read Desert Peach for a much better comic that has a gay character in it. Right. And uh, <laughs> I actually have a couple of Desert Peach comics. I didn't pull them out because they're, where, you know, wherever they are. I really like the cartooning and I read little bits. So the idea is that, uh, who is it? Was it Rommel who was yes. the Desert Fox? Okay, so Rommel's the Desert Fox. And a Desert Peach is his little gay brother, Colonel Manfred Farish. Marie Rommel. <laughs> it's a nice panel. I like I like some of I like the lettering. I like all the drawing. I like the little cartoony elements like the hearts. Yeah, this would be this would be what Mazzucchelli would would call that deadline. Mm -hmm. It's about storytelling. Like this is a comic that's about storytelling. It's not about veneer. Take it to Mythmaker. Yes. Robert E. Sandiford talking about Sandman comics. First thing and I didn't have this note going in. This reminds me of Spawn number five. 
and McFarlane talks about only reading whatever he sent, and he sent fanographic stuff, and I'm sure he sent the issue that he's interviewed in. <laughs> it feels like this was the uh, a big influence. <laughs> Maybe you, you blow my mind, man. <laughs> Absolutely, why not? The ice cream man, for sure, man. There are three trades for uh, Sandman out at this point: Preludes and Nocturnes, uh, The Doll's House, and Dream Country. For all the vitriol that's been spewed forth about uh, mainstream comics uh, on all the preceding pages. This is about as good as you could get in terms of a review of a mainstream comic. Uh, the the writer does call the thing spotty mm-hmm. uh, at at times, and and I think that uh, Gaiman would probably say so as well. But even to this day, like that first trade paperback stands up way better than almost anything out on the racks today. Yeah, he goes through. So he reviews the first three volumes and pulls out several stories, individual issues or stories to uh, to talk about. And as you said, it's it's mostly positive. You know, Mythmaker's the title, um, and, and he kind of talks about how Gaiman recognizes that's something comics can do really well. Uh, you know, I would almost associate that with, like, world building, which I think is a thing comics can do really well, and it's something I respond to in fiction. So in the third, uh, in the third trade paperback, Dream Country, we were talking in an earlier episode about how Gaiman's scripts are like 15,000 words a piece and we have the the full script for the Calliope issue uh of um Sandman that that uh, Kelly Jones ended up drawing and what's cool is there's all these notes like you could tell that it's written to keep the artist enthused like that that's a that's a big that's a big motivation motivational force that that Gaiman's trying to like put forth in the piece man but I love this thing man like I I remember like doing my bet my best to like let a lot of time pass after I read this comic and then just go to the script and like start drawing it myself man and just uh it was a hopeless endeavor man I just I just couldn't pull it off I wasn't wasn't smart enough at that point who knows if I'm smart enough to pull it off now but uh I don't know if these current trade paperbacks still include this. I, I would hope so because uh, for if you want like a lesson one hundred and one on how to write a comic script, uh, you could do much worse than taking a look at this Neil Gaiman script in uh, the third trade. Now all die. <laughs> all Star Comics Archive uh, Volume One is is released. We talked about uh, All Star Comics Archives uh, in a previous episode as well. Uh, the cool thing about Frank Young is that he does associate the garbage Golden Age comics of yore with the, the, the modern kind of image comics. You know, the, the sort of gutter nature of the comics medium has, has now come full circle. But when he gets into the early uh, All-Star comics, he does make note of some, some cartoonists that, uh, that really shined f- during that time frame and... and specifically like on on that book so outsider art illogical stories uh produced as fast as possible in order to meet the the demand artless you know these are all terms that are being applied now to the the era of storytelling that we're back to in the early 90s two guys he likes from that period of uh outsider blah 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 um bob kane who probably wasn't bob Kane. it was probably like you know bob kane's lackeys and uh, Fletcher Hanks. Yeah, who's had a real resurgent, I don't know, now it's probably been 10 years since <laughs> since the Stardust stuff has been reprinted by Fanographics. Um, originally, I suppose, unearthed by the Raw magazine guys in the 80s. Um, yeah, that stuff's astounding. And I like, you know, I like both of those. I like those early 90s weird image books. And I like Fletcher Hanks. And it is for the same qualities that he's describing. You know, you, you see Awkward Anatomy, strange story choices um he describes fletcher hanks as quote unquote unforgettably strange and that's what i want you know it's different there's no other comic that's quite like fletcher hanks and these early uh all-star comics are not not quite there but they do exhibit that crudeness that like we don't know how to make comics you just make them as fast as you can churn out the next book because we're sending this to press as quickly as we can. <laughs> one of the one of the efforts that I'm that I'm striving for with this X-Men comic that I'm doing is in grand design, you strip out all of the um melodramatic um soap opera stuff and you just keep like the raw plot of like what goes down in all of those comics because I'm trying to make a 240 page Fletcher Hanks comic. 
You know what I'm saying? Because it's oddball stuff that happens in that damn in that damn uh, X Men series. And if you just cram it all at once, where there's you know this lady eats a planet on this page <laughs> and then uh, gets eviscerated the next page, and uh, you know a girl falls through a falls through walls and all this kind of th- like it's Fletcher Hanks, man. It is. It's almost <laughs> David Lynch. You know, it's just the oddness of of media viewed. It just in a slightly ex- askew angle. A couple, a couple artists that that um, showed up in the old All Star comics that uh, Young finds noteworthy: Alex Toth, Erwin Hasten, Joe Kubert. So Kubert would have done some of the um, Hawkman features, certainly. And uh, when he would establish his school, he would bring Erwin Hasten to teach. Like uh, Erwin Hasten was a teacher there when when I went to the school. He was around. I can at remember Pittsburgh him at comic book shows. Yeah. yeah, the way that I describe him is that uh, he looks like uh, you know those like little albino bunny rabbits with the big red <laughs> eyes. And so he's like super pale, super white hair, red eyes, <laughs> and the way he hit the the gait of his walk. Like if you covered up like the legs and you just saw the upper torso and you seen him walk. It would look like he's floating. There's no bounce to his walk. So he's like <laughs> levitating as he moves forward. It's really weird. Marvel Comics and the Kitty Hustle. Darcy Sullivan takes the uh, the Abrams Marvel book that was published in like 1991 by Les Daniels and sort of un- unpacks it chapter after chapter talking about the glaring omissions that you will not find in the pages of this propaganda piece or however he decides to call it yeah he talks about how when we think of like the marvel mythology is about how wild irreverent creative house of ideas right he says that's basically 61 to 70 and you know that's that's how marvel identifies itself but that is not at all what marvel is is right that brief period and uh you know he kind of cites it as for different reasons why that worked out. One reason he doesn't mention is, and that I pull out is there's nothing, they have nothing to lose. You know, like that's when Marvel bottoms out and it's kind of like in a way do whatever, you know, that's when you get your most creative freedom often is whenever it's like, I don't know, we're going out of business. You know, we're not selling anything, do whatever you want. Um, you know, and if you happen to have a Jack Kirby, that's doing whatever he wants, uh, that can be magic. Even in the, uh, that period of, of, of growth that they had in from 61 to 73 or whatever. Um, Darcy Sullivan still takes some wind out of uh, the Marvel sales because a lot of the credit that they, they get is from, from Stan Lee, like from Stan Lee's salesmanship, his presence in like the Stan soapbox, the letters columns, and even the fact that the, uh, the titles are kind of like, Hucksterish in the way that they're trying to sell themselves to you. The Amazing Spider-Man, the Fantastic Four, the Uncanny all, all, all of the boxes and, and hyperbole on the covers is like reaching directly out to the reader. Right, right. And and Darcy uh, accurately just says that, hey, this is w- one of the things that made the EC comics of the 50s successful. Uh, and then and then you unpack that even further and you think about how, you know, Stan and Jack would, would show up in comics in the same way that Gaines and Feldstein would show up. And Artists are glorified, you know, s- specific artistic styles. I think that's an amazing note because the EC stuff spawns f- fandom, or doesn't spawn fandom, but I mean, there are fanzines dedicated to EC. And I think a lot of that that dedication and fervor comes from that insight. I guess that, that idea that Gaines had of like connect to the reader as personally and closely as possible. And you see things like Squatron, the uh, EC fanzine that's amazing and, and, you know, runs from an early time period. Marvel just takes that page right out of their playbook and and to great effect. And then, and and then when the seventies come along and uh, in retrospect, there's this like, there's this idea that has been perpetuated, you know, since then that, uh, you know, Stan Lee started to do the, the college circuit and started to cultivate like an older readership, the, the hip, cool, hip college kids. And Darcy's like, listen, at a time when 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 feminism was on the rise and civil rights were, were being duked out in the streets, you had a comic called Black Goliath and a comic called Night Nurse. How fucking hip are you? Yeah, yeah, and and there are contradictions to Stanley's point of view. Whenever they talk to Jack Kirby, and he talks about making this work for the kids, and ideas behind his storytelling that line up that way, um, they compare Stanley's sales approach to Roger Corman, right? 
Uh, there's no distinction for Stanley. You know, this is this is the comics journal's take. No distinction between selling the comics and writing the comics, which I actually kind of find interesting. Again, we're going to see this exact same message come out of Todd McFarlane's mouth in the interview. It's true. Uh, this is commercial art. I mean, it is what it is. And if they're being transparent about it, it might seem kind of gross, but at least they're being transparent about it. Like everything, movies, TV, everything is virtually this model. Some try to hide that. I made a note, everything is promotion reminds me of pro wrestling. Because you hear guys talk about how you cut a promo in wrestling, you better include the dates. Right. It doesn't matter how good that promo is, if you're not selling the ticket, it's worthless. Yeah, yeah. You can say whatever you want. It doesn't even have to make sense. But you better they better hear clearly hear you say, Friday at the Omni. When uh when I was talking about that uh that Phil Suling interview from the Will Eisner bit, uh when Suling was dis- describing his relationship with Marvel in DC, how he was like a, 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 a independent contractor. Uh, guess what Will Eisner's name was for the people who work for Marvel DC corporate and the uh, pencilers, inkers, all that stuff. Jobbers. They say it. Yeah. They that's... say it. This this exact piece oh, of fan, this exact piece of fan mail is uh, is um, mentioned in mm-hmm. the piece because young Billy Frazier here is talking about how yeah you know he loves comics blah 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 maybe wants to grow up to. Uh, write them because he'll never be good enough at drawing but the scary thing to darcy sullivan is is that uh there are hints of speculation in uh in in the little piece of fan mail here this book <laughs> this book ends man like right when it really should have began yeah Look it's at that cool bed. to see some of that that was always the stuff i would eat up and and this piece right here i never understood i thought that that was like a, a dinosaur I didn't realize that that's a gun. I thought it was a tail on yeah. like a Godzilla. That's Mike Sainz, mm-hmm. who does Shatter yep. and also does Dawn of Matrix. Oh, I didn't know he did Dawn of Matrix. Mm-hmm. Real bleeding edge cartoonist. Um, other stuff I pull out of that is they talk about Marvel in the 70s and how like the best stuff, the best artists were on fringe books. So like Barry Windsor Smith on Conan, Paul Galassi on Masters of Kung Fu, Howard the Duck with a few artists. Um, you know, they say they, they hyped the uh, artists as stars, but did not treat them as such. That's for sure. And and he also, you know, to throw barbs at modern day guys, he said that if Jim Lee was working at the Marvel of the 70s, he would be drawing the living mummy. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty good. Uh, talks about how, you know, Marvel seems to no longer know how to make comics or characters that are interesting to kids. Again, we're back to that theme, you know, and he's right. It really is shifting, you know, going from, from what, six to ten year olds. Now you start to see people talking about the ten to fifteen year olds. It's it's just moving on. Like those kids aren't being reached. And I don't know if it's because they find the direct market to be more profitable and that is gonna be an older audience or what, but for whatever reason, like everybody's aware of it. One of the more frightening examples of comics that uh he fears kids are getting uh, their hands on is uh is Punisher Armory, and I hesitate to call it a comic, man. Yeah, it's a non-narrative collection of guns and the Punisher's diary-like entries about what he likes about these guns. Now, it is worth noting that that I picked these books up off the rack in, uh, you know, 1991, and uh, those two boys from Columbine are just one year older than me. Wow. (laughs) So, it's horrific to read these things now. I bought these as well off of a newsstand. I'm also, if I'm, I'm the last vestige of the newsstand reader, but I'm also the last vestige of kids who had a fucking M16 toy gun that didn't have an orange nipple on the tip of it. Yes. Yeah. My neighbor used to watch Red Dawn every single day <laughs> in the summer, and then we would play guns in the woods. <laughs> Ugh, innocent time. But he you talks know about... These are incredible. I fucking love them. <laughs> They are disturbing. The most disturbing part about Punisher Armory is there's so many of them. Are there really? Yes. That's issue five, but I think there's at least nine. And there might be more than that. (laughs) You know, like, they were popular. Oh, totally. Totally, man. I mean, like, you know, in school, the kids who didn't necessarily want to grow up to be artists professionally, but they had drawing skills, there were two factions. There were the girls who drew horses, there was the dudes who drew guns. (laughs) Lisa Hanawalt and then... <laughs> Jim Rugg. <laughs> I used to draw, uh, in study hall, I would draw guns on the board. 
and it would be like all these different kinds of barrels, Gatling guns, grenade launchers, everything. And then it would taper back to a, a pistol grip. And then I would explain, you know, it'd be like I was giving a lecture, explaining what all the different barrels that were and bayonets and stuff that would shoot out. You can't, you got my redneck study hall teacher. <laughs> You're a generation ahead of me, man. Like you would have been on a watch list. Dude. Oh, for sure. Yeah. We, yeah. I could go on, but yes. Hey man, go on. I'm not going to go any further. <laughs> the last heading here, the politics of Marvel mania, it talks about the blind loyalty that readers have, Marvel zombies yeah. have for Marvel, and he links it to patriotism. And it's a really interesting concept in today's world. I can't imagine how this plays in 92. I guess that's around Desert Storm. So, you know, there was certainly a resurgence of patriotism around Desert Storm, but he links it to this idea where, like, we blindly want to believe this mythology even if it's not true. And it, it really reads like in a way that you could pull out that last column and publish it today and it would have relevance. In a way that it, it always disturbs me whenever I read any of these articles and it's like, man, that's exactly how things are now. Right. Not just, you know, about patriotism or blind patriotism, but any of this stuff. Because every now and then you'll hit these, mo these notes that talk about content, distribution, you know, whatever the case may be. And whenever they're spot on today, it's always like, what is happening? Like, have we not evolved? Are we back in the same crossroads, ready to make the same mistakes? I wonder, like, in terms of the, like the cyclical nature of how generations work, like, uh, are we back to this sort of mentality? It feels like it. I thought they were going, when I started reading this final piece, I thought it was going to get into branding, which it doesn't. You know, I guess if this comes out in 1999, maybe or something, you know, like there's a time when branding would have been, I guess, in between wars you know, between Desert Storm and 9-11, branding is probably where you would go with this. One last thing of note, and it is it is a uh, drastic failure on uh, Marvel's part, as, as seen by uh, Darcy Sullivan, is the fact that, try as they may, Stan Lee has been in California since the 70s, but Marvel just can't crack Hollywood. And he mentions all the, the uh, successful DC stuff that's out there. Flash TV show, Batman Returns, a couple other little nonsense things here and there, man. But they just can't crack Hollywood. What do we have? We have a, a straight-to-video Punisher movie. We have we have a, a Spider-Man movie that's been in development for 30 years. We have a Spider-Woman cartoon that nobody's seen. And a Captain America movie that's so bad it can't even be uh, distributed by way of videotape. That's one way that uh, times have changed for the, the, the company. Yes, <laughs> that's not the same today. <laughs> Next feature, a half-filled glass from a tapped-out barrel. Rich Kreiner talks about the Doom Patrol, uh, Grant Morrison's run. Yeah, and he talks about it very specifically through the lens of postmodernism. Postmodernism follows, it's, it's basically a reaction to modernism. And modernism being the idea that we can achieve a utopian-like world through rational, through the rational. Uh, you know, it comes out of architecture and then basically influences art, literature, everything of, of this time period. Postmodernism is a rejection of all of that stuff. And it's part of its rejection is the rejection of sort of the elitist, of authority, of definition, which makes it very hard to say exactly what postmodernism is. Often it's described through characteristics of, of what's exhibited. And these things include everything from like, well, here's a wiki note on it, or a Google look. Postmodern, one, nature of contemporary society. Two, nature of critique of contemporary society. Mm. So one of the things that it's big on is meta, and this is a big piece of Grant Morrison. Um, other elements are skepticism, irony, critique of concepts of universal truths and objective realities. That comes from the Tate to give you some idea of what you're dealing with in the concept of this review. So, you know, we talk about how uh, the Comics Journal moves into this era of trying to be academic. And this is probably an early example of that. This article's good. It's, I think it's not great. I think the, the writer has some really good ideas, and then he grasps a little bit to graft them onto Doom Patrol and vice versa. I think it's a good reading of Doom Patrol. I think it's one that Grant Morrison would put out himself. You know, his obsession, I think, is language-based. They connect... Swamp Thing number 19 to Doom Patrol number 19. So Alan Moore's first Swamp Thing connect to Grant Morrison's first Doom Patrol. Both of these guys are interested in magic. I think Grant Morrison's specific interest in magic has to do with language. I've seen him write about how 
their ideas that our alphabet doesn't contain all of the sound representations and the idea that language is a form of magic. And I like all these ideas. They're very fun to think about. That's something that, that Moore talks about too. He describes that, that the bard can string together a certain amount of words that will not only ruin your life, but for generations to come, your family's name will be so, so ill. Yeah, and this can be just the planting of an idea. You know, it can be exposing you to something you had not thought about before, and now you cannot stop thinking about it and drive you mad. The, the big weakness is, in terms of postmodern Doom Patrol reading and postmodernism in general, is that it is reactionary. And so the, the problem with Grant Morrison's Doom Patrol, very interesting superhero comic, but because it's a superhero comic, it has the limitations that superhero genre has. So he definitely, if you're, you know, it's one of the more enjoyable superhero comics, especially of this era. He's doing things that are very different. You're not seeing in other superhero comics, but it's still a superhero comic and it ha it can't quite outrun that. I've read uh, very, very little Grant Morrison in my day. I've read Animal Man. I've read Arkham Asylum. I've read a few things here and there. I've never read Doom Patrol, but, you know, the kibitzing at the, at the comic shop is something that I hear on a weekly basis. And one of the things that almost everybody talks about, uh, is that, um, Morrison has, has good ideas, but never like follows through or never like the, the concepts that he initializes in a story, they never come to fruition in like a satisfying way. Um, do you have that experience with uh, doom patrol? Yeah, I would say that, but I think you could level that at most monthly comics. You know, there is no great resolution. There's lots of promise. The ideas are really cool. I have a newfound respect for Richard Case, who drew the bulk of this run. The reviewer cites him as being giving a certain amount of clarity to a lot of pretty radical, crazy ideas. You know, like one of the stories is about a self-replicating painting that just gets bigger and bigger and goes through. It, it's the painting that ate Paris. And so as it's growing and getting bigger, it's also going through all of the historical painting movements. That's um, cool. It's, it's brilliant. It's really cool. But imagine the visual, you know, like being the, you know, we talk about how like writers have it easy. They can describe it's this giant civil war battle scene with, you know, tens of thousands of soldiers in period accurate garb. Now to go imagine, draw that slappy. Imagine describing like, that's a great idea. The painting that ate Paris. Now you go draw that. Yeah. Go imagine what that looks like. <laughs> and, you know, Richard Case was, was, uh, that's a major contribution. You know, I, I was critical of his art when I was reading this series because it isn't, there would be fill-in issues that I would really like. You know, um, one of the examples that I brought along, this is the first issue of Flex Mentallo, or the first appearance of Flex Mentallo, and it's really cool, but it's not drawn by Richard Case. It's yeah. drawn by... Um, Mike D. Yeah, and I think it's really great. I like this art a lot, but there is some truth to what they're describing, and as I know more about making comics now, I can't imagine trying to keep up with, with Grant Morrison's scripts on these in a monthly basis, and Richard Case does that, so... Newfound respect for him. Love like the Charles Atlas kind of vibration to the to the to the page here to that spread. One of the things that um, kind of excited me to give Doom Patrol a shot is um, sort of goes along with some stuff we were talking about in an earlier episode, where the, we came across a two page spread in Wizard that talked about uh, the origin of the Flash character and all this nonsense minutia that like went into the origin of the character, and you were like. We just don't need that much pathos in like a kid's comic or whatever. And it seems like from what I'm reading here that uh, that Grant Morrison just like leans in. You know what I mean? Like he, he doesn't care about, uh, you know, trying to create a plausibility for you freaking lames out there who are like, if he shot lasers out of his eyes, blah, blah, blah. You know what I mean? Like, that's all I hear. Like, he's like cornballs talking that kind of dumb shit. So one of the characters mentioned is this girl named Crazy Jane who's inhabited by... Not 60, 64 personalities, but like 64 different people reside inside in, inside of her body. And they each have like superpowers of their own. No explanation. It just is. Right. Exactly. Fantastic. Yeah. A lot of the concepts are very fun, especially for a superhero comic. You know, the villains, they go through a list of different villains. Scissors, scissor men. They come from a fictional town. This is, again, back to the meta stuff. Red Jack, God, and Jack the Ripper. Yeah. Part God, part Jack the Ripper. Uh, the Brotherhood of, of Evil that turns into the Brotherhood of Dada. Uh, this is an educated French gorilla, uh, a brain. Mr. Nobody, who's like a, basically just collects junk. There's a character called The Quiz, 
and his powers are whatever you haven't thought of yet. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, like it's it, it's fun. It's inventive. Pay no attention to this yet. <laughs> <laughs> I brought, you know, they call out a few highlight issues, uh, I think starting, yeah, run run through those and I'll throw you the issues as you tell me what they... Issue number 43, a lengthy descent into the city below the Pentagon. Yeah, that's the fall, that's the Flex Metallo, okay. it's like a multi-issue storyline. Terrific tour de force, Marvel Comics character The Punisher, neatly skewered in number 45. And of course you would want uh, Biz to do the cover to that. He does a big run of covers on this. He doesn't do all of them, but he does a lot of them. So this is, oh man, and, he, and they made him like blonde hair, blue eye. What else? Uh, 53. Look at that cover. Shaky, Shaky Kane. Shaky Kane, wow. And Ken Stacy doing the interior art. So, you know, Morrison is super into comics. They talk about his continuity and his knowledge of continuity of DC Comics and stuff. So, you know, you get all of these kind of riffs on different things. Um, you know, in addition to some of the more inventive villains, inventive characters. Talk about comics being a visual medium, and you get panels like that. That's incredible. Fuck, I'm going to have to go get all these damn comics now. <laughs> what next, Jimmy? Issue 48? What's that one got? This is a, basically the, the one character, Danny the Street. He's a transvestite street. He's kind of their headquarters. This is him imagining a very traditional superhero team of Doom Patrollers. And traditional, I suppose, you know, should be treated loosely within the pages of Grant Morrison's Doom Patrol. <laughs> um, I also brought issue 50, which features a lot of different character, a lot of different artists doing a fictitious 150 year history of Doom Patrol. But so, the list of contributors, Jamie Hewlett, there's not a lot of DC, you know, mainstream comics art by Jamie Hewlett. Yeah, it reads like Paul Grist. Like, Ryan Hughes. Yeah, this is incredible. Shanky Kane's in this issue. And I saw Brian Bolin mentioned. He's a fan favorite. Yeah, really, this is like Deadline. <laughs> totally. This is like a really mix close between, to a Deadline issue. Mix between Deadline and, and uh, you know, the heavy hitters from, uh, from 2000 AD. It's a fun series. Like, I, I am pro this Doom Patrol run. I think the article stretches at times to make it all fit. But it's not bad. You know, like, their conclusion is superhero genre, traditional superheroes, is the modern and the postmodern is a rejection of that. It's taking it down. It's not serious. You know, it's it's chaotic. It's low culture, high culture, reality versus fantasy. It's there, There's some good parallels. Interesting article. And if you're doing a mainstream issue, this is a, a good series to include in that. And if you wanted further reading on this kind of stuff, I brought Animal Man number five. Um Again, Grant Morrison. Oh, this is a great issue. The Coyote Gospel. For me, this is one of, you know, similar concepts, right? Where the coyote that we know as Wile E. Coyote is a character in Animal Man. It's a one issue, one and done, very easy to read. Um, very interesting, reality bending, even uh, genre bending, you know, bringing in cartoons and things. So pretty fun. Yeah, this is a great issue. One last note on this issue. Guest artist Ken Stacy, guy who airbrushed the uh, first two spawn first covers. two covers. Yeah. But this is why we're all here, right? Page 45. That's the spice of life, bud. The Todd McFarlane interview. Steel cage match. Two alpha males. Two guys that won't take no for an answer. Two dudes that don't suffer fools. Two of my heroes. Two guys who are very important for comics in two very, very different ways. Where do we begin, man? You know, I, I was wondering that on the way over here. I don't know the best place to begin. <laughs> what stands out to you, Ed? Like, I, I, this is the first time I've read this interview. And it's amazing to read it having, you know, like, gotten back into this mind space of 91, 92. McFarlane's king of the comics world. Um, this was a fantastic interview and very different than what I expected. It was a great conversation. And the fact that uh, audio exists for about three quarters of this thing is incredible. I will make sure to include those links uh, below so that you could you could hear the bulk of these guys going back and forth. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm very I'm very conflicted. Um, I get the argument from both sides. Todd McFarlane mentions utopia in, in, in Gary Groth's argument. And I know what he means because Gary Groth, the flaw, the only flaws like in Gary's argument, he uses the word should too much, which, which is like, you know, that's the flaw of like all the, all the dweebos on, on Twitter and stuff who are like, so-and-so should do this. 
And so it's like all of your personal happiness, happiness and, and your value set is determined by outside influences. And Todd McFarlane's a guy who is like selfish. He's taking care of himself and he's making himself happy. Like, you know, to, to the exclusion of the wider culture of comics. So they both are completely divorced from their sets of values with one another. But the, but when Gary keeps mentioning, well, it should be this way. And, and, and Todd, the only response is, yeah, it should, it should be that way. But I'm going to keep doing this and I'm going to keep, you know, making a million dollars an issue. Groff comes into this interview and I, I think he has some very hard questions that he brings to Todd McFarlane and McFarlane is for the most part really rises up and meets them. <laughs> he's the, the, he's the, setting the mouse thing. traps, yes. little mouse traps here yeah. and there. Yeah. And, and it's, it's incredible to read. It's very fun to hear these two guys going back and forth and the parallels they have. You know, you mentioned one of the things Groth does is, is sort of says should and should, you know, in Utopia. And he, he calls him out on that. He says, you know, you're not you're not really viewing reality. Yeah. And it's so true. Like, that's my take on a lot of the misery I see in social media is this idea of like, yeah, everything should be fair, but it's not. And if, if you just deal with the reality instead of the shoulds, you could actually then work on the change. Like, let's now progress to whatever. So McFarlane meets him at most of these hard questions. And there's so many parallels, as you say, two alpha males duking it out. At one point, you know, McFarlane says they shouldn't be mortal enemies. <laughs> and, and he's right. You know, they, 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 McFarlane talks about having a fight. Everybody should have a fight in them. Something, you know, that they're trying to do to accomplish, to change. And they certainly both have some of those. Another place where McFarlane uh, is is very right, very correct, is that uh, this is not their first conversation. Um, I guess they were on uh, a panel together at some comic book co uh, convention. If it wasn't just Gary as moderator at this comic book convention, um, tons of people showed up, tons of kids showed up. And of course, they're there to see, to see Todd. And I guess Gary was uh, was was laying some barbs in the conversation that was making the kids even boo. <laughs> and, and Todd says that, listen, man, you know, we did that panel together. Now I'm not going to be so egotistical to say that they were all there to see me, but they were all there to see me. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I would bet that, that almost all of those kids never even heard of Fantagraphics, but I bet you a couple of those kids are going to grow up and they're going to read Love and Rockets comics. Uh, and then there's going to be one kid out of 10 who um who will never give you a shot for the way you treated me at that thing? We're the two kids who grew <laughs> up to read fucking Love and Rockets. We we started at that place, and then we we grew up into this other thing. It's funny. It's like we would show up to read the McFarlane interview and then leave as a Groth fan. It's Bret Hart, Steve Austin, WrestleMania thirteen, <laughs> double heel double, turns, double turns. <laughs> <laughs> so. Gary starts with uh, Image, right? Give us the background on Image. And that's the right place to start. Image is the biggest story in comics probably of this decade. Probably of the direct mark, you know, post-Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, this is a huge, huge moment in comics. And they start right off the bat with background on that. And it's what we've heard, you know, a million times before. But it gets into why McFarlane wanted to do this. Because I think all the Image guys have different motivations. I think some guys just wanted to set up their own shops, you know, some guys didn't like not getting enough money for their creations at Marvel. You know, there's lots of reasons. McFarlane says he left Marvel and Spider-Man. 90% of it was for family. His daughter was being born, you know, and he was in a place financially that he could he could take off. The other 10% was how much he hated that system. He says that, yes, Rob Liefeld did the first Image comic, uh, but Todd has been sowing the seeds for dissent in the big two for years before that, he, he says, man, you know, he lives in like, I don't know, Vancouver Island or something. And whenever cartoonists would come to Vancouver to attend the comic book co conventions up there, he would like take a look at the program book to see which guys he knew were going to be coming to town. And he would invite them to stay at his place. But if you stay at Todd's place at that time, he's going to be indoctrinating you <laughs> like, like, like Goldie in the Mac. Like he's going to sit you down. <laughs> he's going to sit you down and just start sowing those seeds of like, yeah, but don't you think you would be more happy if you did your own thing? These guys are like the Todd and Gary are like 
the greatest comedy duo since like Laurel and Hardy or something, man. Cause like Gary is a man of like logic, academic prowess. He, he considers the facts before he like jumps into things. And Todd is like the Mr. Magoo, like walking over like sewer holes, man, <laughs> man open manhole covers. And just like, if he trips, he's going to fall into like a pot of gold. You know, that's an amazing tandem. Yeah, the, these two definitely have kind of a natural rapport throughout this interview. I was very interested in all the, the critical stuff Mc, McFarlane talks about in regards to the corporate reality of Marvel Comics. He talks about promotion. That's the first thing that dis, that comes up in terms of what disturbs him. And he talks about how Marvel gets behind Spider-Man number one, you know, and it's, it sells a bunch. And then that's it. They never promote the book again. Right. It continues to sell well, but no thanks to them or their promotional efforts. And he uses examples like, you do G.I. Joe and you don't advertise it on army bases. You do a book on uh, aviation and you don't promote it at the airport. (laughs) Yeah, you do a a kiddie book, he calls it. (laughs) And you don't advertise it. Like, how's a kid know that a new comic's out? How do they stop playing Nintendo and just know to go get a new comic for them without any kind of advertising? So he's very critical of the promotional efforts of this corporation. Uh, then Gary says something about editorial, and, and he says he hates all of that. Yeah. And he asks for an example, and he, he says basically everything they've ever asked for editorially, and he goes back to the beginning. When he starts drawing Spider-Man, everybody's telling him to try to draw like John Romita or Steve Ditko. Why are the eyes big? Why is the webbing drawn that way? Why are you putting black in the costume? All these things that are the staples of his style. The status quo of the previous time is something that he rejected and then he grows into becoming the status quo. Bart, Bart Bagley has yes. to start drawing the Todd McFarlane Spider-Man after this. But his whole point is he would rather live and die on his own style than be judged as an Im- how good of an imitator of this other artist is he. Because I a, love that, yeah, man. Totally. Do your own stuff. Is, is I mean, that was the whole reason I liked his stuff. Or any of these guys. When people were critical of Rob Liefeld, it's like his stuff didn't look like anybody else's. That's part of the appeal. One of the big sort of flaws flaws in uh, McFarlane's argument that Groth keeps hammering back sort of in Todd's face is that, you know, Todd is saying, like, listen, me and the rest of the image guys, like, you know, we sold a million books. Like, Rob sold a million after reprints. Like, I sold a million. And, and we're just a couple of guys sitting above our garage in our house making these things, man. And, you know, we didn't do any marketing. We didn't have PR people. So I hate to tell all those guys over there at Marvel, but all those other jobs, useless, bud. <laughs> <laughs> and then and then what Gary says, well, you wouldn't have that amount of fame if you weren't working in that system with those people to gain the initial popularity that you got. You know, they say this argument comes up all the time across many media, like, you know, years and years ago, say, say 10 years ago, when like, when Radiohead decided to um, put an album out there and you as the fan, you get to pick the price. You could download it and give us no money. And it was very successful for them. They made millions of dollars. Joey Jerkoff can't do that. It becomes like, it gets spun in a way that it's an American dream story. But it's like, eh, there's lots of toil that went on way before that was possible. And that is an, that is an outlier movement whenever these kinds of things happen. If, if, it's a, if it's a pyramid, there is trickle down. Yeah, for sure. But there's still the, the people that actually do it. It's not a zero, you know, it's not an obvious thing. There's lots of bands that were successful on Radiohead's level that had made their their name, that had sold, you know, that had built a fandom through traditional studios. None of those bands went out and did that. Like, it's still the move. The guy who do- actually does this stuff, I think, deserves some credit. Yeah. Ma- and, and, and McFarlane answers really well, you know. He says, hey, there's a character Batman that I would have got hold of if it wasn't Spider-Man. And he also says, they're judging him on... You sold a million copies of this book. You're successful. You owe that to, you know, Marvel and their machine. And sure, that's true, but that's not what he thinks of as success. That's what Western culture puts on him as success and says his success is married to his wife who he loves for 14 years, a a daughter that he calls a miracle. I like whenever these guys double down on family. As far as I know, he's still married, (laughs) you know, like... To me, that says a lot about person because there's so much criticism of these guys. It gets so personal very early on. There is this confusing thing like in 
our culture. I know a lot of haters, like a lot, a lot of people I know who are close to me. I love them. They're haters. We'll be watching TV or something and they'll see like, say, say Christopher Lloyd. Right. And they'll be like, oh, he's a has been. He's gone. He's gone. He's garbage. Like he hasn't done anything in years. And a healthy person, if you make three million dollars, five million, you're fine. You're set for life. The sick fuck is like Tom Cruise, who has to keep putting himself out there and become a billionaire. Like, like there's something extra to that. So like in the, in the culture, when it comes to like the people who put themselves out there, there is a perception that if you're not constantly pounding the drum and in people's faces and, and doing things at a high level, that you're a failure. You only have to make one, so one hit wonder. You only have to make one song to be good in a dynastic way. Like, your kids will be fine. I think I think Todd Todd answers that that stuff about you know you you want to be who you are if not for Marvel blah blah blah. I think uh, you know he says the Batman thing, which which still goes with what Gary was saying. But what I liked uh, in Todd's response after that is he suggests yeah use Marvel use DC as a training ground. Get some popularity. Get a few pages under your belt go off and do your own thing. And that has been the model for the past 20 years for the people who slog around and they get their page rates from the big two. They establish uh, social, they, you know, they get big social media presence from the books that they do at the big two. Shout out to all the 15,000 people who've uh, followed me on Instagram since I did my first issue at X-Men. And, uh, and then they go do their image book or their, you know, their creator own stuff and then prosper that way. A, a small fraction of people come with them over to uh to, to image or wherever they go, Fantagraphics, but uh, you get far bigger rewards in terms of per unit sales for each book. You get foreign rights. You sell the thing off to Hollywood and you get, you know, most of that. And you also get the control of all that stuff. Yep, you get say in everything. More than any, yeah. Like, like more than anything, I feel like that control is a big piece of it. You know, like, he, he goes on and on about how much he hates... Working with anybody, mm -hmm. <laughs> answering to anybody. He talks about all the artists just become writers. And Groth challenges him on that in a couple of ways. Like, what if they don't know how to write? What if you don't know how to write? And his response is, you know, that... It's right here. ...never even occurs to... <laughs> you know, like, he never even thought of that. Quote, I mean, fuck. I didn't let some little thing like not being able to write stop me. <laughs> and... You know, Groth asks about the quality, like, okay, you guys all go out and start this company yourself. Are you going to produce better work? Because in, in Gary's mind, that's the value, right? The right. quality of what you're producing. And he gives another good answer to this because he talks about how he doesn't know if it'll be better, marginally better, but it's not about that. But there's other factors. He'll be much, much happier doing it. Right. You know, and Gary talks about if you brought on a writer and it's the same idea, like, what happens then? I'm unhappy, you know, working with this guy. Maybe I quit working altogether. You know, like there are the, the very real considerations here that I haven't seen other cartoonists voice anywhere mm -hmm. that stand out to me. Like, yes. What if I sell less? What if my book? He has said this in several places that we have seen him say he may not be the best. It doesn't matter. If he was never trying to be the best artist or writer. I think that's real interesting because people don't say that and they should because art's subjective. There is no best. Right. There is no perfect. These are all things that we OCD about. They're very unhealthy to think I'm going to be the best artist. No, you're not. Right. There is no best artist. What's the criteria? And he has said it several times. He says it on the videos when he talks about breaking into comics. He wasn't aiming for the best draftsman or the best cartoonist. He was aiming for those guys that weren't very good that he was better than. To just get in the door and, and then doing these books. He's not aiming for the best comic. He's aiming for a book that's good, that kids like, and that he likes making, that he's happy to make. That's huge. Like I want those are choices that I consider whenever I take jobs. You know, he sold more comics than almost everybody. So did Rob, so did Jim Lee. They have zero incentive to change what they're doing. There's no there's no reason to. And this is where their value sets are different because I was in the offices in Seattle, when Gary turned down several books that that are known, but they didn't fit his brand and, and his his um his sense of like what good comics is, and he will sacrifice. He will make that sacrifice. You know what I'm saying for for his aesthetic tastes and shit. Yes, and we think that we we think of this stuff as right or wrong. That's right. the right thing to do, or it's the wrong thing to do. We don't, but they do. By they, I mean uh, I mean Marks. 
I don't mean I yeah, don't mean these yeah. guys. Like like once again the people on the sidelines who are like, hey, why why did uh why why does Bill Murray only do these kinds of movies? Why didn't he do Ghostbusters three? He takes a lot of pride in uh in, in being uh he says he's been called everything: very talented, trailblazer, fuckface, <laughs> asshole. And same thing. Well, that he says it's better than being afraid or content. Uh, he says it's better than being a consummate professional. You know, content is like his enemy. It's like the word that is the worst word he can come up with. That answer is in response to Gary. And th- you got to listen to the audio for this one, especially the way Gary asks it. Because Todd goes on this whole rant about, like, you know, uh, what, what he's brought to comics or whatever. And then pregnant pause. And Gary Groth says something like, so you would consider yourself a maverick. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I love it, dude. I love this shit so much, man. He talks a lot about, you know, <laughs> selling comics. Like, like McFarlane identifies what he does really well, better than anybody, is sells comics. And that's his job. And all these editors that want to make changes or change this panel or why are you doing it that way, they don't get it. Before you judge whether he's good or bad as a writer or artist, keep in mind his number one job is to sell comics. He's, especially for Marvel, he is hired to sell comics and he did it better than anybody. That's pretty remarkable. You go back to Les Daniels' book with Stan Lee making no distinction between selling and writing comics. That's what commercial, this is commercial art. You're selling tickets, you're selling the books. We lose track of that. Like that's literally, you know, McFarlane has laser focus that that is it. Everything else is bells and whistles. He takes pride in his art. He's trying to get better. He talks about evolution of his style and things that he's doing. It's not like he's hacking this stuff out, but selling comics, that's number one. And then I'll work on my craft. He says, yeah, like, like, yeah, I'll try to get better. You know, he addresses all that Gary stuff. Like, yeah, I'll try to get better along the way. Uh, but who am I to educate the public? Uh, he says, like, if, if, if they will buy... 22 pages of blank paper from me and buy a million copies of those? Who am I to deny them, he says. He's like, I'll work on world peace on my own time, bud, he says. <laughs> <laughs> yes, do listen to the audio for that. The audio of this is so great. He says the F word so much, too. It's really sanitized in this in this, uh in the transcript here, man, but he's got, almost got like a Tourette's amount of fucks in his, in his dialogue, and I, I think that that's super cool, man, because because here's the thing, dude. Todd McFarlane was living in a trailer when he got his first gig. You know, I'm you know breaking kayfabe a little bit. I mean, these are in public interviews and shit like that, man, but like the, the Fantagraphics guys who are like from my economic stratum and, and, uh, and McFarlane's was like, you know, the Hernandez bros, but all those other motherfuckers, man, you know, are kind of bougie and they could, and they could pick their spots and sacrifice time. And, and, you know, Burns can do, can take a year to put out one issue of black hole and, and be okay. You know, like in the clouds interview in the journal, uh, the one where Pete bag is kind of, kind of, uh, on, on hand as well. Dan Klaus was talking about this, the privileged situation that he had with a death in the family and the money that he was receiving, like trust fund type shit, you know? And, and like in comics today, a lot of people I know, man, like not only get to live in like New York City, like money making Manhattan, but they have cars, which means they could pay to park that motherfucker in Manhattan. You know what I'm saying? They're not a part of our economic stratum. So like McFarlane was a broke motherfucker and is doing really well for himself. Make hay while the sun shines, man. And it's a privileged position to be able to to sacrifice the economic realities of today yeah, with sure. with with um art artistic merit and like that kind of thing. Yeah. And and Gary asks him about that stuff in a couple of ways. One, he cites a wizard interview where he, he you know, Todd had talked about changing his style from like invasion where he was doing very challenging layouts, but layouts that would appeal to an older audience and making a conscious effort to make it more accessible to younger readers. You know, and, and Gary brings that up. Gary, and, Gary and that br- is an effort of Todd moving towards selling books. Right. He, he consciously tried to reach wider audiences. That was his goal, and he achieved that. This is like a 50-page interview. Yes. And you talk with me for an hour, two hours. Like, I will say contradictory things, probably, as everybody will. Sure. And and Gary is like the bloodhound. Yes. So, so the, there's the parts where where um, McFarlane is is playing the role of like uh, 
of like doe-eyed, hey, I can't believe this happened. But then saying stuff like I did this and this to try to sell more books. And then Gary will hit him on every point to the extent that uh, Todd is like, oh, yeah, you got me there, bud. You're as good as my wife. Yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> she, calls all, all, she calls out all my hypocrisy, too. So these guys are just like trading. Boom, boom, boom. Like these guys, it's like get in a ring for 16 rounds, punch each other's brains out, and everybody is left like on the mat, like which way is up, which way is down. He asked him about the exploitation of the market. Groth hates Marvel and, and sort of Marvel's uh, sells policies. And so he asks him about, you know, having these different covers on Spider-Man number one, you know, to reach that, that three million. And McFarlane's thing is, hey, nobody asked me about that. Uh, probably at that time he maybe would have had some influence if he tried, but chances are, who knows if they did ask him. It was a know. new thing. Yeah. Like, but his answer is, Spawn has one cover. <laughs> so, I mean, like, the answers are there for most of these questions. I, I, I'm impressed with this interview. It, it's very different than what I expected going into it. I think, I think for the most part, McFarlane ha handles his business pretty well. You know, and I think he gets along with, I actually think he likes that back and forth. You know, the fighting with Gary. It, it keeps you sharp, man. It's iron sharpens iron. That's like a thing that we're getting from, from this conversation is like they're, they're, they're two fucking big willies like duking it out and, and they both come out. He says at one point, uh, a lot of guys think you're a fuck to, to Groth. And then he adds, you don't have to print that. It's almost taunting him, right? Like, of course he has to print that. You're, you're, you're challenging his journalistic integrity by saying you don't have to print that. <laughs> he's, he's, like, he's like, I hate to tell you, bud, but a lot of people think you're a fuck. <laughs> And it's then that's incredible. And then that's when he talks about the the, the, the comic mm -hmm. convention that they that they uh, went to and and uh, where Gary got booed and all that. And of course, Gary 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 knows what he's doing, man. Like in the editorial early on, like he was making references to the image guys going to the Carol Kalish School of uh, Comics Marketing, and you know this woman was dead for maybe two months by the time that uh, you know he read that he wrote this piece, man. And you know the piece that he wrote about her before then, like he said it was like the the most criticized piece he's ever done you know and it's like he, he being the the marvel direct market sales uh i think vice president or something i'm not sure of her exact title but she was a salesperson for marvel <laughs> for for you know for a while uh, there's a verbal jujitsu going on on and this whole thing man and, and and todd ping pongs the question back what would it be like if if there was if we lived in a world where you're loving the rockets comic uh <laughs> so so two million copies like like what uh what what are the numbers on Love and Rockets today? And uh, and Gary says it's about twenty four thousand. And then and then Todd, Todd asked that part about well, what if it, we lived in a world where it sold a million? And then Gary like takes a breath and is like, in order for me to imagine that happening, that would require a world where the general public accepts good things. <laughs> <laughs> one one of my uh, one of my favorite exchanges is. Groth asks, do you think your comics are well-written? And McFarlane responds, do you think my comics are well-written? <laughs> Gary goes, I asked you first. <laughs> I asked you first, bud. <laughs> very, very funny. And he says no. He, he says no. Like, but then he, he, he says no. And then he goes, oh, on any given day, I, I'd say yes or no. And, and frankly, I think that's how every artist feels. Yeah, and he talks about how as a whole... You know, like he's not the best at any of one of these things, but as a whole, he's delivering this very effective comic. I think that's a good way to, to uh, look at it. And some of the stuff McFarlane talks about, like where I think he goes off the rails and doesn't represent his ideas well or doesn't make a lot of sense, is he talks about he wants respect from these corporations, from Marvel, from DC. Respect is what he's going for, but he can't describe what that would look like. Right. You know, Groth asks, would that be more money? Would that be... You know, at one point, McFarlane spends a column of, of this nine-point type <laughs> describing the idea of, like, bring in your artists for, you know, 45 minutes where they just talk about whatever. It, it's, it's you know, like, he can't... I don't know what it looks like. I think as he long doesn't. as they own the, the Spider-Man, as long as they're the ones making those decisions, I'm not sure what Todd McFarlane wants can exist. You know, like, reading through this interview, this was the part that I read and thought, you know, in a weird way, cut it. Like, there was just nothing really there. Um, I didn't get an idea out of that that made sense. I don't know what anybody's getting at there or what well, you would get out of that piece. Well, it's, you know, it's it, it's Gary has a little upper hand for 10 minutes. Okay. <laughs> okay. Like, we'll, we'll, we'll give him that. And then, so he so he's giving, he's dodging, he's giving him glancing blows. And then the culture war begins, man, where 
Gary asks, so what do you read these days? And McFarlane's like, if it's not in the sports page, it doesn't get read, bud. <laughs> and, and not even Sports Illustrated. Not even Sports Illustrated because there are too many words in the articles. It, <laughs> the articles are too long. <laughs> <laughs> Just the sports page, man. Groth, Groth says, says that uh, McFarlane reminds him of Dan Pussy. <laughs> and McFarlane's like, who's that? <laughs> yeah, it's so sad. And, and Groth goes like another round about it. He can't believe he doesn't know who Dan Pussy is. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm quite sure he's playing with him. Like that, unfortunately, that's a part that we don't have audio, so we can't judge tone or anything <laughs> like that. There's this real great part where, where uh, McFarlane says something like... Um, so I guess, you know, if I don't read, it's not going to make me a better writer. And and, uh, and Gary Groth's like, I guarantee that. <laughs> and then in the uh, text and on the audio, like, you hear McFarlane go, um, uh, um, he's uncomfortable. He's uh, on the ropes. And fucking Gary puts every um and ah uh and ah uh and, and ellipsis <laughs> in the actual print. Like, like, he does that um thing a million times, but the only time it's in print... It's right after the question about how much do you read and are you a reader and all that kind of thing. <laughs> Gary knows what he's doing, man. He's the scorekeeper here. If the scorekeeper can't win, you're, you're doing it wrong. <laughs> Once again, in, in, you know, capitalist fashion, McFarlane says that, the, you know, the, the people he... The people he listens to, he's not going to listen to, you know, R. Fiori's fucking uh, bougie... bougie uh, critique on Spawn number two. He's going to listen to the to the kids who are writing in, who are, who are buying these comics, man. And if they want, you know, a big guy with big guns, they're going to be getting a big guy in big guns. And then that's when Gary tries to steer the conversation is like, well, what, what about, you know, bringing some of your own energy to, and then like getting them acquainted with something else. Like very often, in fact, the bigger hits, you know, because we're talking about a spawn comic that sold a million. What about like a Raina Talgemeier comic that's $30 and sells, a million. Very often, the public doesn't know what they want. You know what I mean? You cre you invent the thing, you put it out there, and then it blows their mind. But once again, I'll try to come up with world peace on my own time, bud. <laughs> <laughs> How about some more double-handed stuff? But not not from uh, the Fantagraphics or Gary Groth uh, camp. How about from the McFarland camp? How about how uh, he? He suggests that, that Tom DeFalco, he's like, I hate editors, but yeah, don't take that as like me disliking Tom DeFalco. Like, he is the perfect editor for Marvel at this time. It's just that he's a part of a bigoted family. If you're a part of a bigoted family and you have like a racist dad or a racist uncle, you have two choices. You could accept Pappy's wisdom and continue being a racist or you could break off and make adjustments. But a corporation isn't going to want an editor-in-chief who's going to be um, scorching earth and, and, and doing things in his own image. You know, no pun intended. So Tom DeFalco is like the perfect editor. The other, the other point where uh, Gary's a dick is um <laughs> is uh, when Todd is, is going on, on, on a, Todd has a monologue and he's talking about his like situation and his perfect world for creators and everything. And Todd talks about how he likes the conversation that he's having with Groth and he likes the back and forth. And he says that, uh, yeah, very often I could get into arguments with people and confuse them. And, and Gary <laughs> says, and Gary says, I have no doubts about that. <laughs> Should we talk Malibu? Yep. Well, you know what? One before that. Let's do it. This isn't in the interview, but I kept thinking, if McFarlane sold 5,000 copies, mm -hmm. would Groth celebrate him? If he were self-publishing, he's writing and drawing this book that doesn't look like any other books, would that be celebrated? You know, is it that he sells a million? Like, part of me thinks a lot of this interview is spent trying to decode McFarlane, what he does, his style, where he's coming from, uh, what his values are creatively. And we don't really get any of those answers, but we get several pages of trying to get those answers. Yeah. And it feels like Groth is confounded by the success of this style or, or, or this artist. And I just think, like, if it weren't for the number of sales, would Groth assess this stuff differently? Because it's idiosyncratic. It really is like, you know, McFarlane talks about trying to make cool stuff, monsters, capes. 
you know, like it is like a, an artistic vision. It's an artistic vision that appeals to say a, a junior high school, you know, he talks about the, that like 12 to 15 year olds yeah. readers. That's how old I was reading this stuff and eating it up. It is reflective of McFarlane's visual, I don't know, iconography or something, you know, it's superheroes, it's monsters, it's action. It is a personal vision in a way. And I just wonder if the sales were different, would it be viewed differently? It's by virtue of the outlandish success. I mean, what we're talking about here with the image guys, we're talking about like some of the first creative millionaires in comics ever. Outside of newspaper cartoons. Sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the comic book landscape. So there's no reason to even talk about somebody who's doing something 5,000 copies and is dashed out. Like, like there are no big exposés about Faust comics from Gary Groth. You see what I'm saying? So there would be no reason to talk about it. It's, it's culturally devoid, it's glitz and glamour that Gary Groth just can't wrap his head around. Go back and read these comics too. I can't wrap my head. It was like, it was a time, it was a place, it was an energy, it was a zeitgeist thing of, of that day. The fans that McFarlane has, I don't know how he's accumulating more. I don't see Spawn circulation numbers going up right. from a million. So it's like he started at a big position and it just has been whittling its way down. And Gary's strategy is the op like is is like slow and steady. And you know, they just put out that book. We told you so. Comics is art. Like like uh so it's they there's some sort of like cross section that they both hit and you know once again both both tremendously su successful with what they're trying to uh, accomplish be fun to see them revisit this this kind of an interview that would be incredible man once uh we get the channel a little bit more popular and we have the first uh cartoonist kayfabe uh convention <laughs> they're gonna be our our um prized uh, keynote keynote uh panel <laughs> start that petition man yeah we don't need uh garib shameless <laughs> <laughs> it would be funny to throw him on the on the dais with those two. <laughs> Why Malibu? Yeah. Gary asks. Yeah, so they get into the publisher. This is kind of the, the closing focus of this interview is bringing up the publisher of Malibu that Image is working with that they partnered with. So Malibu is Dave Ulbrich and Scott Rosenberg. These guys, uh, in 1987, Fanographics and Gary Groth sue Scott Rosenberg who was uh, running a distribution company, Sunrise Distributor, I think is the name of the company, and also running four or five publishers, like Adventure Eternity? No, yeah, Eternity. Eternity. I should have yep. that list. And then starts Malibu while they are no longer paying these, publish these books, publishers that they're distributing through Sunrise. He runs into financial difficulty they blame the collapse of the black and white boom, the glut of the market of you know late 86 and 87. And basically, they go out of business owing a bunch of publishers money, including Fanographics. Meanwhile, they, are, they start a new publishing venture. And uh, I think that that is part of why Groth... I think that's part of the negativity that surrounds Image Comics. And this is something I did not know about until I, I read this interview and then started looking up old comics journals and figuring out, oh, okay, this is the legacy, in a way, of the guys who founded Malibu. So there's a lot of ill will towards Image before any books are coming out. And I think some of that ill will stems from ill will towards Malibu. Such an old uh, shell game of, like, the distribution of, of goods, man, is like, you know, the, distrib the distributor is, like, very often, this happens a lot, like, where they are, like, a small kind of shell company within, like, a major mm -hmm. company, and... What happens is when, when that little shell company goes out of business, money from the big company does not filter into all the, in paying off all the debts that, um, that that small company owned. That thing is just kissed off. That was like a big fear that I had, like when I, like I had my first successful stuff with, with hip hop, like the possibility of like distribution drying up and not receiving the money that you're owed is like incredibly scary, man. McFarlane's response to some of these inquiries about the publishing partnership is another place where, you know, it's probably the worst he comes off in this whole in interview because he doesn't have a good answer. And he, he talks and about, you know, talking to those guys and hearing their side of the story and there's two sides to every story, but he doesn't really have an answer in terms of integrity, uh, morality, 
you know, that he wants out of the publishers that he's left, but yet he's not demanding out of the publisher he's gone to. He comes off as selfish, and I don't think that he would deny that. This piece right here, that background, is from Akira Katsuhiro Otomo. And then he just pasted the Batman over top, man. That's a, wow. That's a good swipe. That is a hell of a note. Yeah. That's amazing. I was looking at one of the previous Spider-Man backgrounds, and it looked like high-contrast photo. Oh, it, yeah, it definitely was. This piece. Yep, definitely was. Take a take a black and white photo. Back in those days, take a black and white photo, man. Make a, make several uh, Xeroxes, and it'll turn into that. And then you just paste your Spider-Man over top, and voila, you have a beautiful cityscape. I had one more, one more note for this. Oh, yeah. Go back to the Jesus Smith sidebar. You know what? I didn't read that. So, oh, you, so... Know, you don't need to. I'll tell you everything you need to know about it. <laughs> Jesus Smith. All right, so they. this is about Buddy Sanders. And I'm reading this... Buddy Sanders objecting to some of the language that Todd McFarlane is using, uh, specifically things like Jesus or goddamn. I was like, who is Buddy Sanders? Buddy Sanders was a fanzine publisher in the 60s and 70s, published George R.R. R. Martin, amongst others. Wow. Went on to found uh, Lone Star Comics and is now he and his family run and operate mycomicshop.com. Wow. That's cool, and I bet you, you could get all kinds of Jesus shit through through that uh, <laughs> through that mechanism. I've ordered some comics that have bad language from that company. We had to censor some comics uh, <laughs> that you were showing off in, in episode seven. Everybody's wondering why why don't you let us see those comics? Yeah, it, it'll send your eyes. You can't see them. It's There's like no Cthulhu. context for it here, though. If you didn't have the internet, I think you'd just be like, I don't know who that is, a fan, I guess. Just, I think that's once again just Gary, Gary like throwing some venom at, at some other punks that he doesn't like. <laughs> That's pretty much it for me when it comes to the uh, McFarland interview. Yeah, the only thing I would add is, man, there's an audio file of this. We will have it in the notes. It's fun to listen to, to these guys. Yeah, it's great. I don't feel an affinity to either one of these sides. I think they both represent themselves well. You know, I went into this thinking that McFarland was going to be made to look the fool. Mm-hmm. And I don't think that happened. No. One of the things I think helps McFarland, WWE, I think, has this. When it first comes out, it appeals to kids, right, in the 80s? Yeah. And then in the 90s, the Attitude Era, it's like those kids who were loving WrestleMania three and Andre the Giant, now they're 18, 19, 20 years old, now they're loving Stone Cold and the Attitude. And in a way, McFarlane's popularity, I think, coincides with that. Because you had comics transition from being kids, aimed at kids, to then suddenly aimed at direct market. So you had like, oh, I grew up, you know, I started reading this stuff when I was eight, and now I'm 15, and I just graduate right along. It's like McFarlane's like pacing that generation. Yeah. Maybe the last generation of comic book you know, buyers and readers. Well said, man. You ever listen to the tube bar tapes, Jimmy? No, I haven't. The tube bar tapes are incredible. To paint a picture, first off, imagine doing something when you're a kid, like a teenager. You're making prank phone calls, and then your friends, you make tapes, you record it, and you play it at parties, and you make a, a damn tape for your homeboy. And you just forget about it for 15, maybe 20 years. And then the jerky boys come out and these guys are just watching TV and they're watching Kurt Loder on MTV News saying like, just like the famous Red Two Bar tapes, the jerky boys, blah, blah, blah. And these guys fall out of their seats because they have no idea how fucking popular their stupid teenage prank calls became. This is something that is so near and dear to my heart because I'm... Like, that hip-hop comic that I make, it's an investigation of word of mouth. You know, I'm making, I was making a comic about how a thing can spread virally without the internet. And hip-hop is like a big example, but I love all the little ones, man. Audio Verite, Shut Up Little Man, the Buddy Rich tapes where he's like, oh, you guys are playing clams for me. The, the, the Orson Welles shit the William Shatner I say sabotage <laughs> you remember you ever <laughs> yes. hear that one like all that shit I love it man because it's like those audio engineers like they had some power and they fucking kept those clips and and sat on them till the internet was invented so the Reds two bar tapes man this dude John Elmo and in in his homeboy would call this this bar up in New Jersey and it was called the tube bar because like maybe 12 guys could fit into it, man. And like your ass is touching the back wall when you're standing at the bar, peanuts all over the floor and shit like that. They never really explained how they discovered Red was the guy. But this is, um, even in the 70s, 
Believe it or not, women were not allowed in this bar. Oz, I guess, had to change after a while to like allow women into the bar, right? So like Red would be on the horn quite often with the wives of these guys, right? <laughs> so therein lies the fodder, man. And and as you guys can imagine, we are this is the other example of like something that Matt Groening and the Simpsons totally riffed on, man. They call Red up and he has this gravelly whiskey and cigarettes voice. He's probably 31. <laughs> they said that he looked, he does, they got a picture of him. That's because they eventually went to the bar to just see who the hell this guy is. He does not look like he sounds. <laughs> uh, the way they described him was kind of like a Larry Bud Melman, not like uh, this guy. And then even at this time, 1991, 1992, um, do you ever do you remember Film Threat magazine? Mm -hmm. uh, Chris Gore, Chris Gore, because these tapes had no copyright. Nobody knew who the owners were, um, so they were public domain. And Chris Gore shot like a thirty minute like film that they put out on VHS, uh, where that Lawrence Turney guy plays Red. You remember Lawrence yes, from from yeah. Reservoir Dogs? You know, it looks like Ben Grimm, the thing. So such such classics as uh, he has been there, yeah, bend over, <laughs> and then you hear like bend over. Bend over, and it gets far, man. And and you know he he, he gets the names wrong a lot. And, and then when it's gay subtext, it's the best, man. Like so, like uh, yeah, we're looking for Phil. Ah, uh, he doesn't work today. No, not the guy that works there. Phil Myers. Phil my ass. Phil my ass. <laughs> and, then, and then you'll hear a drunk. You'll hear a drunk every now and then. Uh, Phil my ass. It's like like trying to like <laughs> trying to signal boost the thing. Yeah, Phil my ass. <laughs> nah, not here. Is Mike there? Mike who? Hunt stinks. My cunt stinks! <laughs> My cunt stinks! Nah, not here. And then there will be the confrontational ones where, where, where they'll call up and a guy will be like, Yeah, I fucked your mother. <laughs> I, I, I dug up her skeleton and I, I fucked her. And then he's like, He has classic lines to them like, Oh, I'll fuck you up. And then, and then like, there's like the one that everybody remembers that's like, uh, that's like a, I'll, co I'll carve the ZZs in the cheeks of your life. He says, and then the other one that I like a lot that that uh, gets a quick pop is, uh, I know your mother. She sucked my prick many times. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm a big devotee of this. We're gonna we're gonna include uh, a clip to the half hour of the Reds two bar stuff. It's all it's all over the U all over the internet, man. It's all over YouTube and uh, in uh, issue number five of uh, Hip Hop Family Tree, man. I have a little strip that I made paying respect to uh to the the, the two bar callers man and, and uh the one guy's name is John Elmo but I decided to uh to, to draw a puppet because of like crank anchors you know like how they would have like the puppet call-in show and all this man yeah that's the other thing man like uh where he tells he tells the kid I'll cut your belly open and show you all the black stuff you got inside <laughs> it's good man that's fantastic! But wow. but you know this is a T-shirt drawn by uh, by Drew Friedman, and all of those guys like were you know in in eight ball comics there would be um, contests for prank phone calls and mm -hmm. and um, and I think ultimately Jim Blanchard who was who was in house you know to break cafe he won he won one of the um, the prank phone call contests. But it turns out, like, the the phone calls that he did with the guy that he did them with, they are like incredibly important they they went viral i forget what they were called perhaps i'll have a link below for that too i just have to confirm with them but i found like half hour produced videos of <laughs> wow. people interviewing and then of course <clears throat> like klaus and ivan brunetti were on the shut up little man mm -hmm. documentary we talked about the circulation numbers of love and rockets twenty four thousand at this point that is niche and the people who are into these kind of niche things, like Fantagraphics comics, like uh, Ed Wood movies, it's logical to like go to the place where you're finding like these super obscure audio verite clips of prank phone calls that you just hear about from word of mouth. You know, discover Gigi Allen. Like, like it's all a part of of a thing. You know, a trash pop culture. I think that pro wrestling fits into that into that microcosm man i think i think back in the day like hip-hop and rap music fit fit into that in a way man so i think comic books are there now they, they totally are you know, like, like i i buy more comics than i've ever bought but it's all just warehouse and boxes and wherever i'm visiting looking at whatever i can find and it 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 feels niche and you know the guys that are the people that are watching us listening to these shows i think they have that in common 
you know, uh, Michel Fife was, was in the chat room. And it's like, that's what we talk about. You know, what have you dug up? What have you found? Where, you know? That's totally it, man. Now, now like, we're focusing on this crazy era of the 1990s where where lawyers who never read a comic are, are listening to their financial advisor telling them to, like, buy comics and, and hoard comics and everything like that. And people who watch the live feed, someone asked in the comments, like, Ed, you never paid more than uh, nine bucks for a back issue. Well, how do you have all those boxes? Those 90s speculators became the 90s liquidators who made it possible for me to buy all their comics for a quarter apiece. I just bought 50 books for a dime apiece at a store in Florida, and it's all the 90s stuff. It's, it's Ultraverse and Im- early image books. This episode, we'll be getting into Evan Dorkin, Alan Moore, David Mazzucchelli, and Chris Claremont interviews. Four big interviews that have a lot of common ground. If the way this issue is curated... It's all of a, of a piece, and, and the interviews all kind of work together in several different ways, I would say. Basically, these interviews are with, including the McFarlane piece, we're talking to basically pretty successful people who can choose what they're going to be doing uh, from this point forward, basically. They've, they've had great success in, in, in comics up to this point. Yeah, and specifically... Uh talking mainstream they all have experience at marvel the crazy thing about checking out these these interviews is that uh is that i, I sort of know 50 percent of the interview subjects and and by no uh i mean that very loosely in as much as like i've spent at least a dozen hours with you know chris claremont and a uh, bunch of time with with evan at various shows so Reading these interviews, it's kind of the first time that I'm reading an interview, and I know the the true voice behind the uh, the interview, and it's very clear on the page. Like, I can concur. These are the guys. You know what I mean? Like, however they clean it up for transcription for us to read, they still keep the heart and soul of the the interview subjects. My history reading the comics journal, especially at this time, I didn't read it at all. But I have gone back and I've bought back issues of the Comics Journal. At one point, I had subscription to the Comics Journal, probably late 90s, early 2000s. So I have periods where I read it. I don't remember an issue that's as um, focused as this issue. Uh, you know, if it's perfectly looking at Wizard and looking at the comics scene and where things are in the early 90s, like this is the perfect issue for us and for viewers to sort of consider a different perspective but look at the same subject matter, same time period. And, you know, we criticize Wizard for having almost the same interview questions for each person. And in a lot of ways, we see that across these interviews uh, in this issue. And I don't think that's a bad thing. It's a nice cross-section of people at different points in their career. Evan Dorkin in the early stages. Chris Claremont kind of at the end of his big Marvel mainstream uh, time period. Alan Moore, you know, continues to be very active up to today. You know, that's just a guy bursting with creativity and, and... as successful as he is up to this point, which would have been post Watchmen, um, he continues to create work after this that, you know, could be anybody's best work of their career uh, on their own. So, a pretty good cross section, um, you know, Matt, and, and not to forget David Mazzucchelli in that, a guy who has done Daredevil: Born Again with Frank Miller, Batman Year One with Frank Miller at this point, maybe my choice for best superhero comic ever. Um, you know, so another guy who's very near the top of, of the uh, of his game in terms of the mainstream, but then goes on to create probably the work that he's more celebrated, or at least more recognized artistically for um, after this. One one of the the, the common theme themes amongst uh, most most of these interview subjects, and you just sort of hit the nail on the head by name checking some of the work that they did. These are perennial books. Watchmen is a perennial seller. Uh, Daredevil born. Born Again, perennial seller. Batman Year One, perennial seller, to the point that it's on, like, top 10 sales lists at the end of the year sometimes, you know, so it still sells. And if you have this, like, economic base underneath you, you can then go on and be the, whatever kind of, you could explore your whimsy to your heart's content. I always, because I, you know, I, hip-hop is in my blood, man. So I call it the uh, the Beastie Boys philosophy, man, where, you know, they make License to Ill, uh, which is an album that went diamond. That means 20 million copies of that sold. If you have something that's steadily selling, um, 
you can go off and just explore your creativity in any way that you want to. You will, by doing that, you're going to find out who your true fans are because the number is going to whittle down because, you know, if something sells 20 million, that has mass appeal. So you're covering a lot of ground and everybody's more nuanced if they're being truthful. You know, they're not trying to hoard themselves out to, to everybody. Um, so then your, your audience will whittle down. But if you have that economic base underneath you, you then can go on and make, in this case, whatever kinds of comics you fucking feel like making. Um, one of the things that I really should have mentioned uh, that was just kind of funny when we were talking McFarlane is that uh, there is we, have, we now have a kind of equilibrium, you know, these many years after the speculation market. Like we sort of, we know who we are as a comics industry in a lot of ways. And, and the people who are reading comics, like they are reading comics. Uh, there, there are the douchebags who, you know, CGC their stuff and try to, uh, you know, create some artificial value in, in their old comics that way. But McFarlane is kind of needling Gary Groth. Well, how much does that Love and the Rockets comic sell? And Gary gives numbers. He says 24,000. Spawn sells 23,000 now. So that's the true number. Like when you're not stealing money from kids and, 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 uh, you know, separating kids from their, from their, uh, piggy banks by giving them this, uh, this promise of uh, future, future investment potential, you sell, you sell 20,000. You could take that one step further and say, when you're not selling anything to kids, Right. Because, I mean, around this time, you see that shift away from targeting kids, you know, trying to get new readers. That's the other thing these guys have in common, at least three of the four, is that they're huge from the 80s. These are the big works that come out of the 80s. When you look back on the 80s, it is Dark Phoenix. You know, it is Watchmen. It is Batman Year One. And so it's interesting to see these guys weighing in on where are we now? You right. know, with, with Spider-Man selling three million copies and X-Men selling eight million you know, things are definitely in a transitional period here. And that is something that comes up in a lot of those wizard interviews is what's going on, what's the future, what's happening right now, is this sustainable, what are we doing with new readers? And so we get a chance to see these guys who were sort of on the top of the mountain in the eighties weigh in on those questions. It's it's fascinating to think about in retrospect because they they were outliers of a period and there have been several movements of outliers since then, but it, it all bego- begins pretty humbly. So like the next, the next to my taste, like the next movement of like creative outliers in comics would be the Dan Clowes and the Chris Wares and the Charles Burns who, and the Hernandez bros who were, were, were slogging away selling, you know, 24,000 copies of, uh, you know, one of the most popular, you know, independent comics of, of the day, Lo- Love and Rockets. Um, and they just kept, they just freaking kept at it. Un- and, along the way, educated the public about this other kind of comics that that were possible. And, you know, 20 years goes by and these guys are now sort of reaping the benefits and they have their perennial sellers and things. You know, Klaus Ghost World becomes a movie and he mentioned in an interview publicly that he's nearing a million copies of sales with that so you know if you have basically the lesson is you have one base book that you can rely on is bringing in extraneous income you then can go just explore your 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 whimsy to to your heart's content knowing that the bills will be paid as long as you know paper exists well that's a good i think that's a good foundation for this should we begin let's do it man Chris Claremont interview by Kim Thompson. We didn't talk about Kim Thompson enough uh, last last week, which is r- really stupid on, on my part, man. Co-founder of Fantagraphics. Uh, he was sort of brought in a little bit later. Like if Mike Catron was like the Pete Best of the uh, <laughs> of the, uh, the 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 founders here, because you know he he goes away um, in the earliest issue of the Comics Journal. There is an ad for a fanzine called something like. Wowie Kazawi, edited by Kim Thompson. So he's not a part of Fantagraphics at that initial right. stage, but he quickly buys in. And that tandem, it's like to me, tag team champions of comics, it's Kim Thompson and Gary Groth. They are, they are the, uh, 
the Midnight Express. They are the rocker, the, the Rock and Roll Express. They're the top dogs, man. It's not Lee and Kirby, uh, to my taste. They they could trade the belt back and forth every now and again, but for the types of comics and the types of stories I want to do, Kim Thompson and Gary Groth are my champions. Yeah, and it's so easy to take for granted. You know, Kim Thompson and Gary Groth were there whenever I start reading comics. Whenever I learn about them, they have this huge body of work under their belts. And they're almost an institution. You know, you just take them for granted the same way you take for granted Marvel or, or DC or something. Whenever Kim Thompson died, I remember just like reading, you know, various uh, remembrances that people were posting. And it really sort of shines a light on the impact he had on comics. Um, you know, a huge champion of translating European cartoonists. Uh, I think there was one year that four or five of the uh, nominated Eisner Awards for Best Translated Album were all him. Yeah, and the unfortunate thing when that happens, because that that is standard operating procedure with Fantagraphics. There are always several uh, different Fantagraphics books that are nominated for awards. So then um, they split the vote. And then some douchebag, uh, you yeah, know, right. some some Batman comic yes. uh, by you know Tom King uh, g gets to win the Eisner. Um, they also, I remember a standout. They posted a review of Ronan number one that he had written. You know, whenever Ronan was published, and it basically laid out Frank Miller's career. It's one of the most astounding pieces of criticism I've ever read because from one issue of Ronan, which was a big book for me, Ronan number one. You know, I got it at a flea market, became an instant Frank Miller fan. Kim Thompson was basically able to read that book, knowing the history of Frank Miller and Daredevil, and kind of predict where his career was going to go from there. And I can remember reading that review and just being like, this is unreal. Like, <laughs> how could you possibly get this from one issue? Um, so just, you know, it's it's easy to not think of the, the talent that these guys possess because they're behind the scenes. They're editors, they're publishers. You don't see, you don't see their hand as directly as you do an artist's line or something. But that vision is just rare. You know, I mean, the ability to assess talent that way, that quickly, um, it's astounding. And, yeah. and I always think, like, any time you get a little bit of this, comics are lucky for the time they had with Kim Thompson. I agree. I agree. And, you know, when I hooked up with Fantagraphics, it was, like, say, 20, 2012, and, and Kim was sick. Um, I only met him once at an SPX before Hip Hop Family Tree came out. And I got to... You know, talked to me. He was very nice and, and and super cordial and welcomed me into the fold. But I do have a story from about fifteen or so years, twenty years before that, that I had an interaction with him. And uh, this will have some meaning to you because you will know the exact con context of of the situation involved. Pittsburgh Comic Con hosted the Harvey Awards for a couple of years in the very late nineties and maybe the year two thousand. By virtue of that. By virtue of hosting these awards, some amazing people came to the Pittsburgh Comic Con that never otherwise would. That's when Frank Miller showed up a couple of times. Uh, that's when Fantagraphics had had booths there, and Kim was the guy helming the 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 ship. I knew Comics Journal before then, you know, as a young teenager, and I was reading it, and I, I remember specific uh, instances where they would kind of roast, say, Ed, Ed Brubaker's low life and just say that, uh, you know, it's it's like a Chester Brown wannabe comic. And, and, and Ed Brubaker, like, drew his response, like, the response that Fantagraphics gave his work. So I seen what Kim Thompson looked like in drawn form. And there have been other instances, man. Um, Pete Bagg has drawn Gary and Kim. Dan Klaus has draw, drawn Gary and Kim. So before you ever see a photograph of these guys, you know who, basically who these guys are look like, what these guys look like, and, 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 and which one's which, and who's who. So I avoided the Fantagraphics booth like the plague for most of the, the convention because I loved it so much, and because I knew the reputation from the journal and how these guys are, <laughs> were, were, were tough, and um, they had their opinions, and they didn't give a fuck what anybody else thought, and it just, you know, I was 13 maybe, it intimidated me. So then... Towards the end of the convention, Kim is kind of packing up, and it's early on a Sunday. Um, he's kind of packing up, but there's nobody around his booth. Little did I know that there was almost no people around that booth the entire weekend. And I go up to, to Kim Thompson, and I have, you know, mini a mini-comic and the original art for that stuff. 
in hopes of maybe getting acceptance into the fold and having my own eight ball like <laughs> anthology series. And I ask, you know, he's packing books at like, you know, 1 p.m. And I ask, uh, Mr. Thompson, can I show you, uh, can I show you my work, sir? And he just like looked back at me with like a red face and was so fucking angry looking. And he said, almost through his teeth, not right now, he said, <laughs> not right now. And I fucking walked the hell away. When you, you took me to my first SPX in 2003, 2004, and I was scared to death to even be around that dude. Like, like I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't walk like even close by the booth because I was terrified of the guy. That's amazing. <laughs> I thought you were going to say, you're no Adrian Tomini. <laughs> <laughs> no, he didn't, he didn't even want to look. The other piece of Kim Thompson history is Amazing Heroes for superhero fans. I don't know if he was editor-in-chief of that, if that was his like pet project, mainstream project, but that would be the place that I would see his name in the credits of uh, uh, more on the superhero side of the equation. Whenever I uh, break Gary's balls about publishing Critters, he he also puts the onus of that publication on oh, Tim no. Thompson too. <laughs> <laughs> you know the porno bible for the furry furry fandom. That's fantastic. <laughs> so the Chris Claremont interview: all they have to lose is a cog in a wheel. This is, uh, I guess, his first big interview after leaving X Men seventeen years. Far different interview than the one that we read uh, in Wizard Magazine number two when he was still basically on 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 the company teat <laughs> and was explaining about all of his ideas and where, where he expected the series to go, blah, blah, blah. And that interview had an epilogue stating that he was done. The dust has settled. He's been able to form his thoughts on the subject. And uh, we now have this... this uh, this interview that we can uh, absorb that begins with some pretty great uh, gossip, some company gossip that we haven't read about in, in Wizard Magazine yet. The very first line of the interview is not Kim Thompson. It's Chris Claremont starting with, I just heard the latest news. Shooter's gone from Valiant as of this morning. That's something we've been talking about in past episodes is that that shooter run at Valiant is very short. It, it lays the groundwork and that's it. And so it's kind of a... Uh, perfectly timed announcement to start an interview like this with the revelation of well Kim Thompson's response is I thought he had part ownership in the company I guess nothing is permanent <laughs> and that's how it was sold uh, like you know that we have this new this new company this new exciting company spearheaded by the guy who who made Marvel a healthy business in the 80s you know Jim Shooter but you know, from some of the other stuff we were unpacking in, like, the Wizard number 9, I believe, there were clearly these guys with the purse strings above uh, Shooter who had different ideas about the direction they were going to take the company, and they were not better for, uh, for you know, getting Shooter out of the pack. And then it, it will become a theme in our Wizard coverage. Like, every dozen issues or so, uh, he, Jim Shooter creates a new company and then sells it. It's like this weird, like, mergers, acquisitions kind of uh, 1980s, you know, greed and excess kind of shell game he was playing. Yeah, and so, you know, the, the very first thing they get into is his leaving the X-Men and the circumstances behind that, which is basically didn't get along with the editor is, is the way I would blow this down. Bob Harris was the group editor of X-Men. Um, he followed Ann Nascenti and Louise Simonson, who Chris Claremont had a very good relationship with, you know, and he talks about that in the interview, but apparently there was just ongoing disagreements between he and Bob Harris. They get into some of the specifics at, at, at some point, but Chris Claremont describes it as this is not a creative disagreement like you would see in the publishing world, where it would be a writer against an editor. This is an employee versus a supervisor, and that's the way it's treated in the corporate world, and that's the way he sort of is, this entire interview, the way he kind of views Marvel. This is a tough uh, interview for me to read as, as a guy kind of like who, who gets a look into that system, because when I do my Fantagraphic stuff, I could talk to Gary. Like I get to talk to the guys at the top and then we can affect change and we could, we can make adjustments and there, there are no meetings. There are no 
supervisors who are just, you know, employees of the company um, who you have to now, you have like barriers to get anything to, to, to happen. Slow moving barge, these, these corporate, uh, these cor- the corporate world of comics. Um, it's, it's not very attractive uh, to participate in. And the fact that like, like I'm going backwards where it's like doing the indie thing and then checking out the Marvel system I'm going to be very comfortable in the independent game after this, man, because I know, I know what, I know the virtues of what we have by being our own bosses and all that kind of thing. Yeah. I'm interested to get into some of that. Some of the topics that he brings up have to do with the way we exploit ourselves by participating in this system. And I do want to get into that. But the first thing that I would say before we get out of this initial exchange is he mentions Kim Thompson mentions. I remember Mark Evanier relating how Marvel was really utterly panicked when Kirby left, but then they realized it didn't change anything. That yeah, that was like the the watershed moment for for Marvel's corporate culture because because Ditko leaves, and they're and they're scared. Ramita gets on the on the book, and Spider Man starts to sell more. Right, and then they survive Kirby's departure, and it means nobody is anyone can be replaced. Right. If if Kirby becomes a cog, everybody's a cog. It's true. It's true. I I really like uh, the comparisons that Claremont makes with the the real publishing world and the corporate sort of world of of um, mainstream comics. Mm. He talks about the thing like Stephen King. If he leaves his publisher, the publisher doesn't get to do Misery too. Of course, yeah, he owns the thing, and and. The publisher isn't going to risk the creative guy having trouble with his editor. Like, like the editor will probably, if if it's a it's a best selling author, somebody who and Chris Claremont was a best selling author for Marvel Comics. Um, if, if that creative person has trouble with the editor, he could call up the publisher, and there will probably be a new editor. Um, you know, within within. A couple of days because they don't they simply don't want to lose the uh they simply don't want to lose their top talent to a rival publisher um but even more than that you know claremont is a dual citizen he his, his mother's british and his dad is is a uh, united states american so he knows how like copyright law works over in britain and in, in Claremont mentions, like, you know, the guy who writes James Bond novels now, who has written more than Ian Fleming has written, his name has to be put on on the cover, like, right next to uh, Ian Fleming. Like, whenever they put those books in in the library system or in the s- store shelves, like, you will not find Ian Fleming uh, James Bond books next to the guy who ended up writing those books, or V.C. Andrews, or any of these people, because... The situation in, in British copyright is, and it should be a no-brainer, but if you make the thing, you are the author. You know, you can't you can't hide behind James Patterson's name. Right. <laughs> but Claremont was there. He was an office boy in, in the late 60s and early 70s, so I, I'm not so sure that he got to see Steve Ditko leave, but he was there when Kirby, Kirby split. So he saw, you know, with his own, with his own eyes, the sort of... Uh, trepidation that everybody had and then the relief that they had when it was like oh just put busemo on ff this of course isn't in here but bob harris takes over as the marvel editor-in-chief and uh he's the editor-in-chief when marvel declares bankruptcy claremont has ideas for for what he wants to do and he he's such a just naturally smart guy but he also has a certain level of class where he can he can uh, dual out to like barbed comments, but he could also have plausible deniability in saying that they are not passive aggressive or anything like that. He he simply says, "Take a look at one of my latest X Men comics. Take a look at my last X Men comic and compare it with one when Anne and Louise were editor, and you'll see the difference of like my." ideas of where I want things to go and where Bob Harris wants things to go. And then somewhere in there, Chris kind of explains like how 
it's like Spider-Man is is a recipe and and everybody who's the cog in the wheel they're just like ingredients in that recipe and they'll just continuously change little bits of ingredients until they uh they have a winning formula yeah the theme that comes through all of these interviews is the effect marketing has on creative and how much that's kind of steering the creative and and that's a change that i don't know if they've always been moving in that direction you know the comics journal presents that as if it's a good thing for the corporation it makes it easier to sell it makes the talent more interchangeable uh, you know, less autonomy, less power on the part of the talent. Claremont, you know, agrees with that. Like he he mentions that too in this answer. And literally every one of these interviews, at one point, the participant brings up the marketing and the influence that has on creative. In this example, he talks about things like NFL Super Pro, which was a book Marvel was doing, the Clive Barker books, because these are just books that you put that name on it. You put that licensed known commodity in the title who cares what the book's about? It has NFL in the in the cover, you know, in the title. It has Clive Barker above the title. Um, it's where they were at this time, you know? And, it, and I don't know how much that relates to the image guys leaving or wanting to own their own stuff or whatever, but it does really feel like it's, it's almost calcifying at this point where, like, this is the formula from the corporate standpoint. You know, we put this brand on the cover, and that's what sells it, and who cares who's involved? The ingredients are interchangeable. Bring the next, uh, you know, baking soda, the <laughs> next uh, sugar, whatever. Um, but it's, re- you know, like he's giving concrete examples, and it's not hard to come up with. I'm sure he could name another dozen at this point. You know, he mentions the stuff like the Atlantis uprising or whatever that crossover was that ran through several issues at the time. The, w- the way things work in comics right now, like, uh, you know, to use pro wrestling speak, there's that term draw money. Like, you know, this draws money, that draws money. It means that, you know, you're going to you're gonna do well financially if you do this or that. And, and with, uh, in comics now, the way they draw money is to get, like, a big name on, on a project. You know, to get um, the guy who wrote uh, Rambo First Blood on a Captain America. And that's how they draw money. Um, you know, get Ta- Ta-Nehisi Coates on a Black Panther comic. And, uh, and it's going to draw money. Is it going to be good? Is it going to stand the test of time? Is it going to be a top 10 comic in, in, in the history of comics? Probably not. You know what I'm saying? But, uh, but the, here's the thing. With the employees of these big corporations, what they have in mind, and by employees, I mean like the, the people who get health insurance from the company, the employees, not us right. as independent contractors. Um, all the way up. They are just playing a short-term game. Like, every individual involved is playing a short-term game so that they look good for the, 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 the investors, you know, for the boardroom. So they are only going to continuously play these, these short-money hustles, you know, and they're going to have, uh, you know, stunt casting with talent. And, you know, this character is now, you know, a, a female Thor, um... All, all that stuff that people com- complain about, it gets ink in popular press in, and it sells books. And that's that's their function. That's what they do. Um, one of the things that I really like about uh, this interview is that the, the conversation will segue into independent publishing and, you know, by way of image and whatever. But Chris is like the first guy to say something that I think that you, me, and many of our brethren had to find out the hard way about the the indie world, which is if you're accepting money, because these publishers are putting money down to publish your book, um, it's not your money. So you are now complicit in the corporate culture of even an independent publisher, their brand identity, what their value sets are, and... Beyond that, if, you ha- if you're assigned an editor with your independent book, if that editor doesn't have major respect within the company, um, you might not get everything you, you need or, or want. Um, if they don't view your book in the top percentile, you, like your book can be orphaned, basically. I know a lot of people who had books orphaned where, yes, the publisher would put it out, but it was almost a version of like, the film option thing where they're going to, yeah, they're going to put your book out just so that somebody else can't, 
in a way. That's yeah. happened to a lot of people I know. And that is a possibility when you're when you're in the uh the independent market. And, and he explains that that's why the image guys are kind of doing their own thing using the distribution channels of Malibu, because they don't even want they don't even want, you know, Dave Campiti or somebody, you know, they don't want Mike Richardson to tell them the format, the release schedule, anything. They want full autonomy. Yeah, Chris Claremont really does get into some of the the background, the business side of some of this stuff, both publishing, traditional publishing, but also Marvel and DC and the way those are run at the time. Yeah, There's a book, if anybody's interested and wants to know more about this, called Comic Wars, How Two Tycoons Battled Over the Marvel Comics Empire and Both Lost. And it's about the 90s, specifically Ron Perlman, Toy Biz, like all the stuff that happened in the 90s, the bankruptcy, all of that is covered in that book. Uh, you know, so if you're interested in how what these guys are doing and why in terms of trying to get as much money out of this publisher as possible, um, that's the book to go to to get some answers because it is a crazy time. You know, Marvel goes bankrupt. People try to take over the company by buying up their stocks. Like it, it's interesting to see, you know, and Chris Claremont describes the beginning of that because that doesn't happen for a couple years after this interview. It talks about the history of Marvel and the way the publishers have always just been trying to get as much money out of the company as they can, going all the way back to Cadence. Um, you know, so it's definitely inside baseball. You know, you get a Chris Claremont interview, and like we said, very different than the one in Wizard where he's talking about plans for these characters. Now it is like the behind the scenes of like what's really happening. And, you know, one of the disagreements he had that, that led to leaving with the editor is he wanted to kill Professor X, which wasn't going to happen. Too valuable of a character to write off, uh, which is funny considering now every character gets killed and comes back and who cares? Right. Uh, you know, but this is one of those things where the corporate idea is that is a licensable property. You, you can't get rid of that. You can't change that. They cite Batman 50 years in Batman's the same as he was when he started and that is very much by design. You see you see evidence of it in Claremont's books that it was going to be this continuously evolving thing. Um, just in conversations with, with him that I had myself, you know, he, he said it and then you take a look at the books and it's, it's clear there on the page. But, you know, late 70s, like Wolverine was like the sexy character. Then the character for the early 80s to, in his lights was, you know, the Kitty Pride character. And then Rogue became important to to the series. And then when he was working with Jim Lee in the nineties, like he was positioning Gambit to be to be, you know, the character of of like that say five year span. And whenever he gives presentations and talks, there's there's hours and hours of uh, conversation with him at uh, at uh, conventions and Columbia University. He 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 um, gifted Columbia like all of his notes and archives. So there's like couple two-hour conversations there and he would speak about what he wanted to accomplish in like 100 issue arcs and, wow. and, and shit like that like so he was like very comfortable of like what you know where where he was what he wanted to do and and just like things like the new mutants the whole point for the new mutants for him was that uh you know the x-men would be they would age they would they would be gone and then like the new mutants would then become the x-men and then there would be new sets of new mutants and and that to his mind that is how these comics were going to go where it would be this like there would be like this like churn rate um but there would always be an x-men and there would always be a new mutants but uh you know the corporate people and this makes sense they're like no like we have wolverine water wings like <laughs> he can't go anywhere yeah, it's very true. You're describing that in 100-issue arcs. It reminds me of manga. You know, like he had this big, long vision, and he had the sales that you would think would allow him to realize that vision. And it was like, even with top sales, it, that's not enough. You still don't get that creative freedom. You know, in, 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 in wrestling, like whenever we listen to interviews, shoot interviews with popular guys, whenever they would go over to a WWF and, and under Vince McMahon's uh, wing... Um, very often they would have to quote unquote do jobs at the beginning to like prove to, to just like, it was a move. It was like to prove to Vince that they would, they would lay down and, and allow themselves to be beat. But it's also a move on Vinnie Mac's part where he's just like, I could crush you, you know, like I could bury you. And to some extent, you know, these top artists are, are leaving. 
if you if you sacrifice a Claremont, um, does that let everybody who works for you know that they are that that they should respect how good they got it, kind of thing? Probably. Um, you know, keeping on the wrestling topic, I just heard an interview with a with a wrestling veteran, and he was talking about how he thinks Vince McMahon intentionally won't build superstars anymore. Because guys, and he, he lists uh, John Cena, The Rock, and Stone Cold as being examples of these guys that were so big they could do whatever they wanted. And the example was they recently did a WWE event in Saudi Arabia after that reporter was killed in, in Turkey. And uh, John Cena refused to go. The guys on the roster, you know, most guys don't get that kind of power. But John Cena is above that. And so if you're the guy in charge of the company, you don't really want somebody in that position. And whether it's Chris Claremont, who's you know, beloved by X-Men fans or Todd McFarlane, you know, selling record Spider-Mans, they, you can't have guys who get to hold the the company hostage. Corporate comics are this way right now by, because of the image guys, like after the image guys do their thing and, and really make a name for themselves. I think that both companies really regret the fact that they ever allowed creatives to put their name in the credits pages of these comics. And, uh, you know, you and I, we, we talked with, we talked with some creative people who, who work for one of the big two as a writer. And she was, she didn't know if she was even allowed to talk to the artist of the book that she was working with. And, and the artist, um, because everything has to go through them. Now they can't stop you and me from going to like a comic convention and meeting Warren Ellis and then having uh, right. some chemistry. And then we go off and do our image comic. That's like a big fucking giant seller, but they would love for you to not ever build any rapport and build a team and then go off and do sex criminals or Southern bastards or saga or any of that kind of thing. Or to get together and decide your creative ideas you really want to do them, the writer and the artist. Now the editor has two people they have to deal with that are on the same page that are producing the book that the editor may not <laughs> want you to go in that direction or to do that that detail. So yeah. I, I, it's been this way forever. I mean, this is why you find other avenues to create your own work. It's why artists struggle against that corporate system. This section, participants in our own exploitation. Yeah, that was the toughest. <clears throat> this one was a little eye-opening. The quote that I pulled out of it is, we get used to exploiting the work of other people. I've done work. I've, I've gotten Marvel paychecks and DC paychecks. I'm, like I'm doing it right now. Reading this really did make me think about it, though, in a way that I had not thought about it before. Yeah, like, like uh, it's, it's something that was always on my mind. First off, I never thought I would even work for Marvel. Look, there, everybody I've liked has gone through this system virtually. It's it's hard for me to be too condemning of this. I am I participate in it myself, but I do think it's a conversation that almost is never had. And that's the part that I think is curious. Yeah. Is there a moral ethical thing choice that we're making whenever we decide to, you know, draw a cover for Spider-Man or something? The way I look at it at this point is um precedent has been set. We are whore. Like I am being a whore right now, but I'm doing mutually good business i know what i'm getting into because i've seen a history of how the creatives are treated at these places but i you know i'm able to play a long game now myself because you know my hip-hop shits sell just fine and there's a strategy to what i'm doing that isn't going to be obvious for a couple of years but i can make these big investments in time for the good of like my future um, so I, I won't get into it too much right now, but like you, you, it'll be clear what I'm doing and how Marvel and I are mutually benefiting from one another's, uh, what, what each entity brings to the table. I think there's two, two avenues there. One is protect yourself in a way I think previous generations maybe didn't have access to the information, maybe went in a little bit more naive than we all should be doing at this point. And there were only two options, basically, to like really That's do true. well for yourself. And and it's it's a commercial art system. Like Those exist in other industries, and you, know, you participate, people participate in those. Some of that is the deal with mass media. 
But the moral part is a different question. You know, it's not about coming out of it intact or not being taken advantage of. It's just a question of like, I, I you know, it is a it is a bad history that these companies have in regards to the way people are treated within the companies. And, and it is, it is strange, you know, I'm not pointing at Marvel and saying that's bad people, but it is a corporation and those policies are not, they're not, you know, people protective. They're not, and they never will be, you know, I mean, it's no different than if you work with Nike or, uh, you know, and I'm, I'm thinking of like an, an athlete, right. That's doing endorsement deals. That's the nature of these companies, and I don't know. I mean, is that something that, that we need to, to think about more whenever we're 20 and we're thinking of what we want to do in our lives? See, you, you sort of hit the nail on the head, and they talk about it in the interview where a lot of people will say stuff like, well, I'll work for these guys now, and then I'll worry about making money in the future. I'll worry about the financial part of my life You know, when I'm, when I'm 30. When we talk about the, the morality of it... Um, m- in a lot of ways, morality is for the privileged, and and you could make these tough decisions when you know that you're losing guaranteed money. Um, if you're in a privilege, if you have like a plan B or something like that, but like if you're if you're a kid, kind of getting started, or and you have this chance, and they're dangling all the like a little. It's not financial security, but the difference between corporate comics and independent comics is that independent stuff is based on sales and you are going to get at least this guaranteed page rate. Um, you know, it's, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's Mussolini's Italy, man. The buses run on time. <laughs> you, like that's how it is. Like, you know, I do the work, I, I turn in those pages and then, uh, you know, I get a check next Friday. Yeah. I don't want to give the impression either that I'm, that I'm saying one way or the other is right. No, I know. Yeah. It's, 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 it's just a conversation. conversation that I don't, I don't have, you know, like a lot of these topics we talk about with everybody at shows and, and you know, friends of ours and stuff. This is not one that, that I ever hear, you know, brought up. And I guess because it is too complicated, you know, how do you break that down? I mean, this can apply to every aspect of life. And then pretty soon you're getting nothing done and and, and any industry. Yeah. So, man, we got a little off track there, maybe. But it's interesting to see Chris Claremont bring that up. Frustration in the mainstream this is a talk about the relationships between creatives and, and the corporations they work for. There's some part in this in this piece where, where Chris is talking about how it's sort of cliche at this point now. We all we know this. The fact that if you're on a shitty book that's not selling well, that uh, you're basically left alone a little bit more. They're, they're going <laughs> to give you a little bit more latitude to, to move and, and, and do things. And Chris is like, yeah, you know what? If... If X Men was going to be a big hit, like Len Wein would never have left it. He would he would stay working on the thing, but they let me have my chance, and I turned that thing into into a big seller. And um, so it was hard to start taking these these this corporate insight after I built this ship, you know. And and McFarlane said that with his Spider Man thing, how his Spider Man book was the one the outlier that was selling, you know. Take take the print runs of the other Spider-Man titles, add them together, and they still don't hit McFarlane's numbers. Same thing with Frank Miller and Daredevil. So the creatives have value. They provide value, but it's not um, necessarily respected with more than what is definitely in the contract. Moving on to what he's doing now and what's coming up, we get into uh, this section. Basically, he talks about several projects that he has in the works. And this is kind of a, um, a sidebar mentioning them. And I'm, I'm going to run down this list. Uh, First Flight, Superman Special Edition, Alien Predator, Deadliest of the Species, Renegade, Huntsman, Farewell, Hide and Seek. I think there's six projects there, seven projects there. I believe around one of them actually happens the aliens predator deadliest of the species happens renegade happens because it's not called renegade uh but it's the first like two issues um of uh dark horse comics not to be confused with dark horse presents but it does not spin off into its own series no um oh yeah you're, you're right huntsman kind of happens in that that's a character that i guess he put together as a proposal for image it will eventually that character will guest star in a couple issues of Wildcats and Cyberforce. Yep. Um, but never, you know, gets its own title. Um, 
my my question out of all this is here's seven projects that I plan to do the super successful guy one and a half of them or so come to be I don't I don't know why that is exactly you know and and I don't know if you had any thoughts on that but but going through this and thinking about it to me it was like there are other advantages of working with a company like Marvel they facilitate a lot of the production the design the paying guys uh you know not on spec work, but paying them ahead of time. Um, it's very hard to go out and make your own project, build your own world. As a writer, and he gets into that in the interview, you know, the, the company is called Image. And even the title alone is an antagonistic because Image implies <laughs> a, a visual, an illustrator, has nothing to do with the writer. And Chris is, Chris mentions, listen, I'm a writer. Like, a, a an artist could could fake being a writer way easier than, because they're still using the written word, uh, way easier than a writer can fake being an artist. So that is also, you know, the value of like the mainstream system is like, you will be paired up with uh, a penciler. And even if that guy doesn't work out, there's a thousand kids on deviant art who, you know, Marvel will poach to like plug into that situation, man. So as a creative, as a writer, you know, and, and listen, man, guys like, you know, Peter David, you know, Mark Wade, like these guys, the, the, these guys with the job mentality, that's how they've existed for their entire career is like, they just, they just want to keep writing and they don't want to, uh, I guess like, you know, I guess they would have done it if they wanted to, but like, they don't worry about being paired up or building relationships with uh, pencilers and going off and doing their own thing. You know, that's that's extra work. And th frankly, that work requires, and I'm not saying this about those guys as being bad, but like that work requires a little charisma, like a little a little back and forth. Like you have to kind of be, become friends with, partners with a, with a person in order to uh, have a good creative relationship where you will not be getting paid on the work that you guys are doing for a year or more. Yeah, this is where I, I'm defending the uh, the Marvel machine, the DC <laughs> machine. You know, there are all these tasks that you do as an indie creator that you don't think about in terms of budget of time, um, stuff like that. And it's things that editors do. You know, they are a, a lot of editors. I think, especially today, they they keep schedules. That may be their number one job. And I wonder. You know, Chris says I've got to do an X. -Men. He's talking about he had been locked into this mindset of. I've got to do an X-Men this month, so I can't focus on, you know, whatever other project. So when the X-Men goes away, I wonder about, is he able to focus on that next project? You know, can he build a fake deadline and hold himself accountable? Um, you know, can he do managing, like, how do you get artists here? How do you get their schedule to open up? It's a lot of this extra stuff. And just, just the creative part of it's huge. Building a world, you know, like... He's coming from 17 years of a very developed world full of characters that can fulfill almost any need he can come up with. To go off and start with a blank piece of paper, man, that's, uh, that's, that's a big job. He calls, it, he calls it creative atrophy, and he says that he is not above that. Perhaps, like, he says himself that, that he may be victim of that himself by having this, like, it's a cush, cush position to, like, get that steady paycheck for, for 17 years, and now you have to go off and do your own thing. He calls it creative atrophy. And I think about the um, the guys who we grew up digging from, from the mainstream, um, you know, from the earlier days, you know, 70s, 80s, like 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 a Walt Simonson or or uh, or even a Frank Miller um, who envisioned this like wider, bigger world of what comics can be and everything. But they were so locked into the pulp uh, aspects of that monthly churn rate uh, for for Marvel Comics, that they their vocabulary is only so developed. You know what I mean? They inspired others to to uh, go on and build upon what they what they laid down. But because perhaps they were in that system too much and and for too long and were doing that sort of stuff, a little bit of an atrophy set in. And frankly, even like the criticisms that are levied at. Uh, at Will Eisner are kind of that way. Uh, I was going to uh, bring him up. Yeah, like where you know his 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 you could tell that he's really trying to to dance for for the bourgeois. Like certainly with a lot of what he says in interviews and stuff, but he just 
spent a lot of time making comics for little kids, and it kind of dulled his senses. They asked him about um, kind of the state of the art at this point, if if the quality has atrophied, and he doesn't he doesn't quite go to that extent. What I took away from his answer is there's so much out there now, you know. So has it gotten worse? Maybe, maybe not, but the talent has been stretched thinner and thinner. And, you know, they ask him kind of what he's reading or what's impressive to him. And he names a couple of the usual suspects that you would think of. Love and Rockets is everybody's go-to answer for what's a good comic. But he also says that he just doesn't have time to read this stuff. You know, uh, you're either looking or you're making. I hung out with him uh, last year and, and he said he hasn't read a comic in 20 years. Talks a little bit about audience for mainstream comics. And one thing I I took away from that part is women are the biggest group of book buyers. And at this time, they're just not, there's almost no comics that are geared toward, aimed at, marketed towards this biggest group of book buyers. Yeah, 50% of the planet and the biggest demographic for people who buy books. But let's not make books for them. Let's Let's continue to make these sorts of things. But it kind of, you know, Chris... The thing about Gary, Gary and Kim, they are really pushing for the wider landscape of, of comics to, to invade bookstores and, and the mainstream. They're, and it's true. Like, if you sit somebody down and you have a friend, you can give them a comic that you just know that they will love and they will read it and they will love it. Um, they just have to have access. Um, but Chris mentions, listen, go, go into the fucking bookstore and you're going to see your, like, Tom Clancy bullshit. And you're going to see your VC Andrews bullshit. And you're going to see, um, y- you know, your Sue Graft. Like, like the, the, the big selling stuff, even in prose, is, is, is pulp of a fashion. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's a candy bowl. It's, it's candy. That's basically all I have from this interview. You know, I think this is a guy who probably is a comics writer peaked on X-Men. And... Maybe he doesn't realize it in terms of this interview, but I think looking back at his career, that's his legacy as X-Men. And he hasn't, you know, he hasn't read a comic in 20 years. He he doesn't have to. Like, that's the other thing that we're going to see here is like, Chris Claremont, he, somewhere in here, he, he mentions that, uh, you know, I spend all this time like working on comics. The last thing I want to do is like take a look at a comic. And that is something that McFarlane would say in many of his interviews uh, across many magazines, he didn't say it in this Gary interview, but I think there's a future um, McFarlane interview where, where he says stuff like that. So these guys aren't, it's they're even if they're successful, they're still like, you know, ham and eggers, like still just doing a job. And when the job is done, then they go like live their life. Like Chris Clemon is living in New York city. He's going to theater. He's, there's a lot of distractions that you could fill your life with that that isn't comics. And, uh, you know, so he's chosen to live his life, man. Those royalties are still coming in. The bills are still getting paid. All right. Alan Moore is our next interview subject. But before we get to that, um, this is an ad from John and Quarterly. And I thought we'd take a minute and look at the books that they're advertising, give us a time stamp of when this is set and what books were being published. So, Yummy Fur number 29 by Chester Brown, Dirty Plot number 5 by Julie Doucette, and The Playboy, a collection of Chester Brown's, one of his stories that was serialized in Yummy Fur. So, these are the issues of Yummy Fur and Dirty Plot. Chester Brown's one of the first cartoonists... uh, You know, I mentioned somebody who changed my idea of, like, how you make comics and what the values are of the decisions you're making. And this book specifically is part two of a story called Fuck when it was serialized. This story was collected um, later as uh, I Never Liked You. And I Never Liked You, the collection, is the book that I always talk about whenever I talk about a book that really changed my idea of comics. And so this whole story is set in like middle school age and it follows Chester Brown in an autobiography of, you know, discovering girls, dealing with family problems, being an obsessive drawer, a bit of an outcast at school. The layout just 
I never saw anything like this. You know, like that doesn't look like a six panel grid. Very strange. Um, and a protagonist that I could identify with. You know, if you go from Wolverine to a, 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 kid, a kid in middle school, it was like, yeah, this makes sense to me. So Yummy Fur is one of my favorite comics of all time as a series. Several graphic novels are serialized in this book. Ed the Happy Clown. Um, the Playboy, which is also advertised, which is it details Chester Brown's encounter with Playboy magazine pornography, again, happening in middle school and his becoming aware of girls and the effect that has. I'm not sure if this issue has it or not, but um, one of the, the famous bits about this story... It's the weird way he jerks off. <laughs> no, I was I was thinking of um, Hugh Hefner weighing in on this on this comic. Oh, really? I didn't know anything about that. Yeah, he he was. Uh, I'll find the quote to put into the episode. But Hugh Hefner talks about you know he viewed Playboy as a positive thing in terms of sexual revolution and awareness, and yet Chester Brown is kind of damaged by it. Uh, you know, within this story, so. Anyway, so this is where this is at. The one thing I would say about Yummy Fur of this era is he serialized some of the Gospels from the New Testament, and they have never been collected. So if you want to track those down, you kind of have to find some of these old issues of Yummy Fur and then uh, Underwater, his follow-up series. He was important to me uh, as well for independent comics and, and what is an independent comic and, and different ways of thinking about the kind of comics that you could make. But I wouldn't have read or discovered those comics if it wasn't for like the first time well the second time that i hung out with you actually um you know we initially hung out that the the first time it was just like introductions and shit and you discovered that i didn't for whatever reason i think it was really hard to to find the the uh the, these canadian comics you know what i'm saying like the yummy furs that were around in like you know the early two thousands still man they still had the 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 price tags from speculator nineteen nineties all over them and I just could not pay money uh, you know I was a broke ass kid so I just couldn't get these comics period and the second time we hung out man you dropped all of your uh, Chester Brown books on me and uh, blew my mind letter from Eric Haven who at the time was doing Angry Man. So cartoonist that's still active and one of my favorites today. That's it's always old, fun seeing like the letters pages and who's writing to whom. It's an old trick, man. Uh, like, uh, you know, get 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 your friends to write write some letters in. Uh, there would be letter uh, letters from like Kurt Busiek on Love and Rockets. Like th those are the more fun ones to me because it's like, like Eric is in our world. You know what I'm saying? Like we're all, we're all of a piece. But when you get um, Kurt Busiek... That's true. Writing to a love and rockets like that's now we're talking. This is um dirty plot number five. I always think it should be Julie Doucet. It, but it, I, let's I hear people Doucet. say Doucet. Really? Yeah, people that I think know at least more Fuck, than me. So man. I don't know how to pronounce her name. It may be Doucet. Ap apologies if we're saying it incorrectly. Yes, for sure. I'm sure she's watching. So just send us the. <laughs> but by by way of uh, Palmer's picks, I did uh, discover uh, dirty plot and. When she's being uh, interviewed in there, we discovered that the title, Dirty Plot, it means pussy. Yes. Yeah, she... Um, so both Chester Brown and Julie Doucet started out as mini-comics artists, which I would find interesting. So the early issues of their comics would, would actually reprint some of those mini-comic excerpts and reformat them to fit regular comic books. I just loved her art. She was somebody I found when I started reading alternative comics... And I actually did, um, I used to draw like pinups in different artist styles. So I have a pinup uh, that I did in her style from my early days. Uh, same with Rob Liefeld. So maybe I'll, I'll show both of those uh, right now. Um, fun letters page, correspondence. Everybody in the small press, it seemed like, knew each other because it was a very small group. And they would write each other. They would highlight each other's work. So that gives you kind of a snapshot of where what this time period is. I threw in an eight ball issue too. This was published in mid 92, same time period that we're talking about. Um, it's interesting. It's noteworthy to me because several people cite eight ball. And at the time, the only collection I think that was out was like Lout Rampage, you know? So this is before a lot of the stuff that we think of Dan Klaus, like ghost world. This is before ghost world. This is years before the ghost world even begins. I said it before in wizard episodes, you will, when cartoonists and even the mainstream, you know, jobbers of the day um, would talk about what, what kind of comics are you reading? Hate 
comes up by Pete Bag. Mm-hmm. Eight Ball comes up by by Dan Klaus. Uh, they they all seem to uh, dig it, except uh, Don Simpson. He didn't. <laughs> he, he thought that uh, that uh, Klaus needed a little little work on his anatomy. So anyway. Again, mid mid ninety two. That's uh, where the alternative comics of the time period are at. And now, mainstream comics have at best tenuous virtues. The Alan Moore interview, and this interview is conducted by Gary Groff, uh, guy who conducted the Todd McFarlane interview earlier this issue. Alan Moore, for anybody unfamiliar with him at this point, he has done Watchmen, which is you know, kind of a high mark of comics at this time. Swamp Thing, which I think directly led into things like DC's Vertigo line, you know, a more mature take on horror comics, a more sophisticated uh, style of comics than you would find in most of Marvel DC output at the time. Um, The Batman one-shot The Killing Joke with Brian Boland. He's in the middle of From Hell, which is the Jack the Ripper story that he does with Eddie Campbell. Big numbers, a couple of issues of that have come out. Um, I don't know if it's canceled at this point, but only two issues of that were published. So whether it's officially over or not, that's where he's at with that. So very ambitious, creative writer at this point. And at this stage, you 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 named that early bibliography that has continued to provide that income that makes it possible for him to do big numbers him to do you know serialize from hell over the course of 16 years receiving zero dollars for all of that labor until the book is done you know a 16 year investment where you're just feeding a machine you know you're just creating this thing and it's going to pay off 20 years down the line yeah and one other piece to note here is at this point he's retreated from marvel and dc work and i think that pretty much holds true um you know, he was doing the ABC line at Wildstorm when Wildstorm was sold to DC Comics. Uh, he continued to produce work for a little while on those comics. A very short while. But he never, you know, like, he's basically done with Marvel and DC at this point in his career. And once again, you could have that privilege when you are still getting paid. You're still getting a DC check, man. You just don't have to do new work. My very first note on this interview, Gary Groth asks him if uh, if mainstream comics have any virtues. And his answer, it's so eloquent. Like, he's such a writer. Even, uh, you know, people speak differently than they write. You know, you could be a great writer but stutter around. He seems to be great at both. And it comes across, you know, he kind of talks about a lot of good cartoonists come out of that system as an educational system is, is one of the virtues he cites. But then he goes on to uh, contradict that a little bit with the idea that Dan Klaus and the Hernandez brothers who have produced work far better than anything in mainstream comics without that apprenticeship. He's, 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 and he does call it an apprenticeship. When you work for Marvel DC, it's an apprenticeship. Uh, he, he goes back on that a little bit uh, over here somewhere because he does say that, well, you know, the Hernandez bros, Klaus, they do borrow from the mainstream comics, even though they're mainstream comics of yore. They they owe something to say the the, the 1950s DC comics, and then that's when Gary Groth, uh, uh, his rebuttal is that okay, so I guess that means that Art Spiegelman owes something to the Holocaust, <laughs> and then Alan Moore's reply: Go ahead. I wouldn't compare mainstream comics to the Holocaust. <laughs> That's before uh, Godwin's Law was uh, was uh, in- invented. Yeah, so it, it, it's pretty interesting seeing him go through, you know, this first column and a half is basically him working through whether there's any virtues to mainstream comics. <laughs> and at the end he says, you know, if I did have the power, if, if I had the power of God to just remove any life forms or organisms from the face of the earth that I didn't consider to be productive, mainstream comics would have to watch themselves. So he kind of goes through... <laughs> You know, considering this this question uh, very thoroughly and, and ultimately isn't too happy with what he sees in the end. And he does see it because he'll go to the comic mm-hmm. shop to buy the new issue of Love and Rockets and he'll go to the comic shop to buy the new issue of 8-Ball. But he says that the sheer, 
the sheer, like the, like the Geiger counter would pin on red because of the radiation that comes off of those X books and the other mainstream comics that just sears his eyeballs. He doesn't even want to look at that garbage. I always like seeing what what's going on uh, politically, you know. <laughs> And uh, there, there is a note here, uh, you know, he could turn to the mainstream comics and Groth ads right after the Bush administration. Um, you know, this is the first Bush administration, so... And we saw that Dan Quayle is a supervillain in uh, Wildcats number one. Yeah, I, I, it's, it's a constant reminder. I, I don't know what the last, you know, when we had political peace. Um, they move on to, uh, you know, if there's anybody else, Gary Groth kind of praises him and says... I'm hard pressed to name anyone in your league in terms of what you've done after mainstream comics. And Alan Moore cites Neil Gaiman as a as a young creator with promise. Keep keep an eye on this Neil Gaiman character. And and you think about the Gary Groth did the Todd McFarlane interview. We'll say that at this point Todd and Alan Moore are in the same position. Like we'll say it took more a couple of years to to hit that position. We'll say both of those guys are at the top of their game. So McFarlane is still he sh- he's churning out product it, if it's not uh comics it would have been cookies or toys or whatever like mcfarland's making money and alan moore has now achieved a position where he can um indulge in the art of comics and trying to make like the most sort of artful u- use of comics that 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 he can imagine and, and that's what he's going to put his focus on so of course this is a part of groth's you know, agenda with where he would want comics to go. Like we always have that, uh, that uh, little thought exercise of like, you know, are you doing what you would be doing if you hit the lottery and, uh, more hit the lottery. And, and this is what he wants to do. Yeah. He also cites Frank Miller. Um, and I think Miller's a good comparison to what you're saying about Todd McFarlane because he says that, uh, this is Alan Moore, not not Gary Groth. I know I sometimes feel a little disappointed by the class of 85 or 86. So, you know, Frank Miller was kind of at the apex of his mainstream influence at that time period, too. And he says, you know, both Dave Gibbons uh, has a very deep love of mainstream comics. Frank Miller, great love for adventure comics. So, you know, Alan Moore, I th- I don't know what you would cite his love there. You know, League of Ex- Extraordinary Gentlemen suggests a love of Victorian era pulp. He seems to be progressing, right? Which I think is what Gary Groth has in mind for sort of the evolution of comics and creators as well. But it, it isn't for everybody. You know, if Frank Miller loves adventure comics, go make good adventure comics. But it's not where Alan Moore's interests lie. He pulls out um, one of the examples he gives about mainstream comics and quality of mainstream comics where they're at. Um, He cites this Mr. Miracle special. Looks like they had a lot of fun doing it. Um, Pretty good, you know, Jack Kirby pastiche. Of course, I think it's probably like Mark Avanier Mm -hmm. who who is, you know, all over Kirby's nutsack. Yeah, and Steve Rude highly influenced by Kirby. This story in particular is inked by Mike Royer, a frequent Kirby collaborator. So certainly they're playing up the Kirby uh, homage. This is a really nice looking comic. And I think that's kind of Alan Moore's use of this as an example. You know, you can look at some of these books that you might consider a little more toxic in the mainstream, the X books that are giving off radiation and blurring your vision They don't all have to be that way. This would be an alternative to that that still is a mainstream comic, but something that's a little bit more fun. So he seems to be uh, very generous towards his assessment of the mainstream at this point. Even though he can't quite defend it, (laughs) the best he can offer is something that's that's fun and not as cynical. Um, He he seems to be a, a lot more charitable towards that than maybe you would find him today. I I would say even because like he just it's comics it, this kind of thing is so nothing to him that it's he wouldn't even waste the energy you know I, I think he would still basically say the same sort of thing with the exception of being able to pull out a steve rude uh hey maybe he would pull my comic out <laughs> <laughs> you know he 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 views this through his experience right doing monthly books like swamp thing and i think that he gives a lot of the the people who are working in that system the benefit of the doubt by 
citing his own experience. So, you know, he says he remembers working in mainstream comics and trying hard every month along with Steve Bissett and John Toddlebin and, and the other people he worked with to just try to produce something that he found entertaining and interesting. Maybe the, re the, the reader response to the comics in terms of what's interesting and entertaining is going to vary quite a bit, but it seems like he's very generous in, like, offering that, you know, maybe the system isn't inherently impossible to create good work yeah i mean he he is a guy who who uh seems to think that you know the mar the market will everything will shake out by way of the market the people who vote with their dollar bills he does seem much more invested in in comics than somebody like chris claremont it's a very different perspective than than what we saw in the chris claremont interview i think of course, in 1992, the the big story of the day is Image Comics, and Gary sort of has trepidation about these quote-unquote in indie publishers coming onto the scene, but just trying to replicate a Marvel, DC, you know, superhero kind of vibration, and that's like another example of Moore just saying that, yeah, it's, perhaps it's just the market dictating, you know, what, what people want, um... He says, personally, I like the idea of 15% market share being taken away from, from Marvel Comics. But this is still so early in like the independent comics movement, if you want to call it that. Uh, the independent comics part of the comics universe is that Gary makes a suggestion that... Okay, so maybe Marvel could still live if 15% market share goes away from them. But what about Fantagraphics? So it, it was so early that it was still a point in time that one could maybe imagine that if there's a finite amount of readers, um, that they will go here or there when time has shown that the person who's going to be reading Youngblood will probably never fuck with a Fantagraphics comic. You know, like, like by and large, you and I would be different. In, the, in that case, you know what I'm saying, man? But uh, the people who read my X-Men comic will not be reading my hip-hop comic, uh, with the exception of, like, a small percentage. Yeah, Kim Thompson mentioned something like that to Chris Claremont, that this is an inelastic uh, economy, comics. So, you know, so much of that criticism, I think, is aimed at the direct market in that we talk about percentages shifting around, but if you think of comic shops as the ones paying for these books, buying the books, yeah, that money, th that pool of money doesn't get bigger. So if Image Comics attracts X amount of percentage, you know, X amount of those dollars, they're coming from somewhere. And some may come from Marvel, but it, you know, some may come from the independent stuff. Mm -hmm. So no, it's true. And, and you know, G Gary, Gary says what he says about those independent publishers, you know, becoming Erzatz, Marvel DC, and, and Alan Moore is like, well, Gary, you know, I have to congratulate you and Kim for publishing pornography uh, to keep yourselves afloat rather, rather than uh, superhero comics. And that was something that they were always very clear about. Like, at some point, uh, they were, Fantagraphics was going to have to make some sort of adjustment, yeah. uh, you know, the, the, the interesting independent stuff that they were putting out was not paying the bills, was not keeping the lights on, so they had a choice. They could have went down that superhero route, or they could have done their Arrows line of comics, which they did go on to do, and apparently was a big seller. Now, keep in mind, this is from a day when when uh, when when VCRs still uh, weren't that much of a thing, so like, so like, not everybody could just, you know, pop in a VHS tape to, to jerk off to... Um, I guess this stuff sold. Yeah, and this is his examples of what's backing up all the independents, right? Pornography for Fanagraphics, Turtles for Tundra, licensed movie properties for Dark Horse. 20th Century Fox, to be specific. And Moore does suggest that it is the... For independent comics, it is comparatively early in in, in its, its lifespan. Um, but he considers the work that Fanagraphics is doing... And he and he makes he makes no apologies for like he has no problem that Ninja Turtles money is funding the Tundra stuff. He has no problem that pornography is funding the Fantagraphics lot because this money it's all an investment 
into the future of comics. And, you know, here we are. We live in a, a world where there there is a much wider landscape of material that, that is out there than there was in these days of 1992. And it's not going to uh, change. The danger of this, though, this idea of, like, the Tundra money... Fund, I mean, being funded with Ninja Turtles or the, uh, more specifically, the pornography that funds comics like Hate and Eight Ball, the danger would be um, is if the pornography becomes such a popular hit that the publishers lose focus of their mission and quit publishing Hate and Eight Ball using those funds to churn out just yet another you know, piece of dreck. Anton Drek, to be specific. <laughs> yeah. Fortunately, uh, Gary Gross says that's not going to happen. <laughs> and it doesn't. They get into some of the stuff like MTV, um, what an average comic is these days from a Marvel or DC. The early days of quick cutting. They're describing <laughs> just, you know, quick cutting, colors, people screaming at you, and it's like, yes, this is the 1990s. Remember the Sega? Sega! <laughs> yes, and Alan Moore uh, actually makes a, a, a comparison between ads and comics and describes both as heading into psychedelic wasteland. That's kind of interesting to me, you know, because I think it's true. Gibberish and incoherence, I think from 92 to now, we have seen more and more of that. Quicker cuts, more incoherence, you know, just image, image, image. Um, so he's already recognizing that in 92, uh, seeing it in comics but seeing it in wider pop culture as well any idea of where does that go you know like what's the end result of that it takes time and wisdom to to uh to be able to to see things that way like like a 20 year old person like wouldn't be able to 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 make those connections you haven't seen enough cultural movements and just as like a you know 36 year old man at this point like it's kind of fascinating just like watching how our culture has been developing over my lifetime because there are peaks and valleys and there are changes that massive changes that have come in, in my lifetime. And it's, it's fascinating to watch how, how these changes kind of affect the wider culture. Um, it's not going to stop. So it's like, you can't be too cynical or else you'll get ulcers in your tummy or something. One thing that's new for me is I've gotten older, say in the last six or seven years, I've noticed how different my perspective is on the world. And some of it is that you're seeing the cycles, right? As you age, you get to see, you know, the perspective of like, wow, this is different than 20 or 30 years ago. But then also patterns develop. And then you realize like, oh, like, you know, the young 20 somethings at SPX who are like talking shit on like the old guard. When we were 20 somethings at SPX, they were talking shit on the old guard. Yeah, like, like it's it's the same thing. The only problem is not even problem, but like I do feel bad that you know guys like say Jaime, who've always been like these forerunners of independent comics, are like, okay, so this is the year where you know you throw the old guys out, baby, with the bathwater. Like, okay, so we're assholes and pieces of shit again. Like you know, and, and, and if we talk to him. He would be, probably have like a timestamp, like yeah, every like eight years this has to happen. Well, I wonder how it affects the creative. You know, like now that I read these interviews, I think like, how old is Alan Moore when he's at this point? You know, like whenever he's shifting from a mainstream style of of content to something that's more personal or whatever, are these reflective of you know a person maturing, a person sort of their perspective changing as they age into different demographics and things like that? It's something I never considered, you know, when I was reading this stuff the first time through. But now as I get older, I think about that all the time, just in terms of what I'm making, what I'm interested in, how do you express that, what else is expressing that. And uh, I, I wonder about that in, in these interviews, you know, as you talk to these guys who are at more mature stages of their output, you know, as their career as an artist. Evan Dorkin sure changes compared to the That's guy. That's going to be a fun this. one, man. He, <laughs> you know, like he's very young in this interview. They, they talk a little bit about the writers and that so many artists are switching over and writing their own material. And uh, Alan Moore doesn't seem to think this is too big of a deal uh, because he says anybody could 
probably write a Marvel book a- anybody, or a DC yeah, book. Anybody, he's like, we're back to sort of where comics were. Like, you read a 70s Marvel book and they're pieces of shit. Like, <laughs> yeah. the, 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 the problem that, like, many people have with those old comics is really the onus is on the writer more often than not in that old system. But what was that old system? You have a, a you give an artist a couple of sentences and then he goes off and he's like doing this like jazz improvisation of like what a story is. And then the writer has to stitch in captions and dialogue and try to make something of this it's a pretty weird way to generate story. And that's what they had sort of to work inside of back in those days. So of course there are going to be these incongruent messes that don't don't make very much sense. And and then the writer, because he's really barely writing the thing, has to like overwrite the words because, you know, the whole plot was done by the artist. It was a weird thing. So he's just saying that it's almost back to where comics were. You know, they were we 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 had our we had our moment when I was doing Swamp Thing and you know now Neil Gaiman is doing amazing things with uh, Sandman, but by and large, like, yeah, anybody could write any of these comics. Yeah, the scary part in, in all of this takeaway is where this goes. You know, and it's from the very beginning of this issue in Gary Groth's editorial. That's kind of the biggest risk. You know, you're seeing more incoherence. Stories aren't ending. They just stop. Uh, there's no satisfaction. There's yeah. no structure. What does that look like in, you know, the future? Like, how do you continue to evolve? And one of the examples that he cites is Destroy, the Scott McCloud book, as being kind of like the apex of that direction. You know, like what could be more, how much further could you take this notion? So Destroy is the loudest comic book in the universe. <laughs> you know, this is just... What's the date on that? 1986. Uh, wow, I didn't realize he, that was 86. He foresaw it, man. Once again, 86, dude. Yeah, and you know... It, to him, this is it, right? It's just a nonstop fight, a city leveling fight, and that's the entire story, the entire issue. So, like, where does Image go from here? You know, it's I didn't realize this predated Image by so far, because it does feel like it would be the perfect like first Image issue. Um, but that's that's a lot of what this speculates about. You know, Alan Moore mentions Utopia which is something that Gary Groth and Todd McFarlane talk about, and we're moving in the opposite direction. That would be the theme I would take away from the assessment of the mainstream and where it's at. When, when, you, have, when you have an Alan Moore, when you have a Mazzie Kelly, when you have an Evan Dorkin, I get the impression from each of these individuals that they're really trying to make awesome comics. Like, they, they want to make the best comics that they possibly can and who wouldn't want to be rewarded for for that um but then we still exist in this world but certainly to a very heightened degree at this point in time we're living in a world where a frankly unreadable comic is the most popular comics out there and it has to be baffling and and uh you you would have to maintain uh, just a good kind of psychic equilibrium to not let that make you fester. You know what I mean? Because a lot of people did, and they're still, you know, cynical to this day about, like, even when we started the podcast and they said, uh, it, like, we mentioned Image and we mentioned Wizard, and people just, uh, they get a bad taste in their mouth from, from this stuff. Alan Moore mentions a Japanese comic called Rape Man. At this rate, in two years' time, the biggest superhero is going to be someone like Japan's Rape Man. Someone who rapes his victims, and then maybe he eats them. I and seem to miss that. I thought that was possibly a parody. I was kind of confused, like, what exactly is this? So I looked it up, and it is a... I think there are nine volumes of it. It's a manga, and it's kind of like a, a black comedy superhero parody type book. I mention it only because, like, it's insanely bizarre, Mm-hmm. You know, um, yeesh. <laughs> That's a real comic. Now, I, Japan is a big market. And when whenever that Casey Anthony girl got off her, her trial, there were all these articles about, like, famous mm-hmm. criminals who, who got off, you know, get, when they were caught red-handed, essentially. And there was this um, this Japanese guy who was a foreign exchange student. He was like in France, and he he 
he killed a girl and he, and he did eat her, um, but not all of her, and left like the leavings on the side of the road. Got caught immediately, and the French the French are badass. They're they're like we don't want to spend any of our tax money on this punk ass man. Get him the fuck out of our country right now. Uh, because he was just a foreign exchange student. So they sent him back to Japan. And it was that cliche of like some paperwork error that made him, the, some technicality made him get away free, free, clear sailing. The reason I bring it up is because he is now like, you know, salt Peter, whatever the fuck, they chemically castrated kind of guy. And he he draws like manga, like he draws like these manga of like his his fantasies and shit, and it's all this, like, cannibalist, like, bad, terrible shit against girls and stuff, and it's published, you know what I'm saying? Like, it's out there. Yeah, that's kind of what what I thought this might be. Oh, you know what? Maybe it is. No, it, it isn't. Oh, cause, because, yeah, like, this guy's stuff, this, this uh, right. psycho guy, it's not, it's not good. It's not, like, good-looking shit. Um, Moore talks about Valentino and says, uh, you know, he hasn't read any of his comics for a while, but he remembers... This is about image and potential of image. Remembers Jim Valentino with affection. He did Normal Man, and he did some great stuff in dope comics. Um, Gary Groth says, did you see his Guardians of the Galaxy? I'll have to send you some copies for a reassessment. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, it, 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 and, it, and it is, uh, whenever, whenever Alan Moore begins working for Image later, it is Valentino who brings him in. Or at least Valentino on the documentaries takes the credit for it. The, 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 last, the last bit, really, is um, that Groth is, is talking about Image Comics fair, fairly often, but, see, this is like a younger Alan Moore, because nowadays, Alan Moore has this like phrase that I've heard him say a lot of times where he's talking shit on... Well, the, the movies that were made about his work and all that, and he famously does not watch any of those movies. So these interviewers will try to, like, they think they think they got him. I got you. Well, how can you assess something if you've not watched it? And he says nowadays, I've heard him say it like three times, I prefer, I prefer to operate from a position of ignorance, he says. <laughs> but back here in, these, in this interview, like, he says that, uh, well, he's uncomfortable saying... Uh, anything about Image Comics because he frankly has never seen any of the stuff that they put out. And at this time, there were three issues of comics: Young Blood One, Spawn One, and I believe Savage Dragon Number One. Uh, yeah, Savage Dragon Number One. So the interview ends here, and Gary Groth says, "Listen, I'll, I'll send you a care package." Gary sends him the Spawn Number. I mean, the Image Number Ones that were out at the time, and then. Alan Moore wrote this amazing, uh, this amazing little manifesto about uh, about how he sees Image Comics fitting into the the world of comics. Uh, Jim, if you feel good, man, like I would love to hear you read this. Having read a brief sampling of the Image line, I must say first off that I don't find them to be any worse or more upsetting than the standard mainstream superhero book. That said, I do detect a difference, a progression, if you will, from all the mainstream books of several years ago, which I am more familiar with. To make a chemical analogy, a classic superhero book like Plastic Man or Captain Marvel might be viewed as something like the coca leaf. Not terribly exciting as drugs go, and yet intense, intensely stimulating and above all harmless thanks to certain alkalis that balance out the drug's more negative effects. In comic terms... These alkalis are plot, imagination, character, and things like that. Refine the coca leaf, remove those alkalis, and you will have cocaine. The rush is stronger, but it's harsher too and does more damage. This would be in comic terms, the superhero books proliferating in the 70s and 80s, geared to constant breathless action with the storyline now merely something that's designed to get you from one fight scene to the next, a wild amphetamine toboggan ride. <laughs> Refine cocaine, and you are left with crack. I stress that this is not a social metaphor, but merely chemical. I wouldn't for a moment think to even half suggest that modern comic books might be comparable in their adverse effects to class 1 drugs. I only seek to call attention to a process of refinement that has been, perhaps inevitable, all along. The audience, no doubt, will make up its mind and will just say no 
or yes to drugs as it see fit. That guy could turn a phrase, huh? You know, cut to me 25 years later digging through the uh, quarter boxes. And like some... a crack fiend. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I can't change Marvel. Who could? Evan Dorkin talks about dividing his time between mainstream Marvel and his pet projects. So at this point, uh, Evan Dorkin is writing and drawing Bill and Ted's excellent comic book for Marvel Comics. He's done several issues of Pirate Corps. I don't know if he's finished drawing Predator Big Game for Dark Horse Comics. So he's kind of, uh, I don't know, a few years into his career. 27-year-old Evan Dorkin. Young whippersnapper. Look at that kid. <laughs> Clearly a ska guy because of his two-tone shirt. You know, this is kind of the uh, the early interview of Evan Dorkin. Gives some background on where he's coming from. Um, has background working at Jim Henley's Universe comic book shop. Went to NYU for a film degree. And we've known him for decades, and uh, and that's never come up in conversation. <laughs> but, Jim, to be conversational, because I don't want to be... Evan's our homeboy, and I don't want to be too clinical about about this whole piece, man. When did you first meet him? I met him at the first comic book show I ever exhibited at. And man, was I an asshole. To him, or as, to a, as a Just person? as a person, to him, everything. I dressed in a bright yellow jumpsuit, looked like a giant banana. Let me ask you, how many shows did you bring that garb out? A couple. Because, because <laughs> Too many. I, because I, before we even knew each other, I have a VHS tape when I went to Pittsburgh Comic Con, and I'm, the camera's moving, and my camera landed on you and Jason Lex with your fucking yellow outfits. I do call you guys bananas and pajamas motherfuckers, <laughs> but the rest of the stuff I would say would get me kicked out of comics. Well, hey, mission accomplished. Your, your <laughs> video camera stopped on us, so it's a lot better than the comics we were making at the time. So I went up and introduced myself to him at the end of that show, at the end of the day, and you've done enough shows to know at the end of the day, after the doors have closed, you want to get the hell out of there. Right, I see. And that's me standing between him and the exit, between him and dinner. Um, and he was totally cool, and, and that's kind of, that's where I first met him. He wrote the intro to Street Angel Collection. I don't know, you know, how much we how much we we've seen each other ever since it shows and, and, and sometimes whenever I have a real question about something I'm doing, I've reached out to him for advice. Um, you know, I have a very high opinion of him as a person and as a cartoonist. Same. Uh at probably at the same convention, Pittsburgh Comic Con, though years earlier, uh probably when I was like twelve or so, um I was the common wisdom for people breaking into comics is you take your portfolio and you get uh, your work assessed by prof professionals and you know hope to find an editor who, who digs your stuff. So that's what I was doing. And I just went to everybody. Like I had no, um, I, uh, no discerning uh, eye for, or, or, or strategy for who I was trying to get my portfolio assessed by. And, and he was one of the guys I went up to. I knew his work for sure. I was a big love, uh, milk and cheese mark. But from those comics, like I had a certain opinion of him that made me th think that he would be, once again, another like scary guy who would call me a jerk off and an asshole and get the fuck away from me and all that kind of thing. Showed him my stuff and he's like, yeah, this is cool. This is pretty good, man. But what I suggest you do is go off and make a comic. Like, don't, don't be a pencil. Like, don't just show penciling sh samples. Like, make a comic. You, you know, you still live at your mom's house. You have nothing but time. Um, there's no excuse. And that's literally what I did after I had that conversation with him. That's such a great uh, piece of advice. Like, you learn so much making that, that first mini comic. Actually making the comic is the, the greatest instruction. Good on him. One of the things that I could say about Evan Dorkin, too. Verbose, motherfucker. And so, like, yeah, <laughs> Frank Young will ask a five-word question, and then you'll get a page and a half <laughs> of uh, Evan Dorkin cutting promos. And that is, that, is, that is pretty accurate. Whenever we would go to shows and hang out with Evan, like, I, you know, he's, he's got years on me, man. Like, at this point, he's 27, and I'm 10. Um, but he, at, at certain times, he would be happy to speak all night. Like, like I would always <laughs> be the guy who has to, like, go to bed. It's like, it's five in the morning, man. And it's all wisdom. It's all jewels. But, 
you know, I, I share hotel room with you, Jim, and you're an early rising motherfucker, man. I got to get at least some sleep. <laughs> <laughs> he uh, he shares our uh, interest in wrestling. He doesn't. He cuts promos. This is all promo cutting, man. Like, he was saying shit like, yeah, a lot of the people in comics, like, they, you know, they turn their nose up at my Bill and Ted comics, and they're like, oh, yeah, that fucking Dorkin, he's going to be doing Wayne's World comics next. <laughs> And I quote... I'm flip through these while you, you keep going. Yeah, and I quote, Evan Dorkin says, It's bad enough I have to draw this fucking Alex Winter guy, but there's no way I'm going to draw that Dana Carvey cocksucker in his wig. <laughs> <laughs> one of the... Uh, you know, one this of the... ad, ubiquitous. <laughs> this is like the most... That is the most used ad in comics. <laughs> He's a big influence would be Mad Magazine and Will Elder, especially... So a lot of his comics are just full of, de- you know, detail, background jokes. If you're if you're an elder fan, you would call that chicken fat. Yes. Um, he talks about having Marie Severin inks some of these comics, not this issue, but some of the Bill and Ted comics. And he's also a big comics fan, so you know Marie Severin, a lot of history there. Very cool. Uh, at one point, he would always drop his stuff off. He said at the Marvel offices, and uh, complaining about the Marvel paper stock. And John Romita calls him up, you know, art director at Marvel at the time. So it's it's very much like this fanboy moment, um, <laughs> you know, interacting with these people and getting, going into the Marvel offices and stuff. He also, uh, you know, at this stage, he talks about doing the Predator book, doing a book like Bill and Ted's, and how it's almost like that book makes money, and then I can do my indie book that's a loss leader. It reminded me of uh, filmmakers will often talk about, you do one for the studio, one for yourself. I don't think that works anymore. Uh, just changing industry. Yeah. But it reminded me of that, you know, that mentality. If comics is a long tail business, the, the image guys are, are getting most of the rewards. Um, and they're even positioning themselves. You know, Liefeld is doing the, the Levi's commercial. These guys are on TV. It's CNN, all this, man. But, but Evan knows it's a bubble, knows that it, it, it won't last. And he, he, he goes to, to his girlfriend and points to the television because he's sick of hearing about the popularity of comics and the popularity of these image guys. And he grabs his girlfriend and he points to the television and Married with Children is on TV. And he says, you see that little kid on that show, that little boy, that little insignificant douchebag? He's more famous and has more money than all of those guys. <laughs> <laughs> talking about Bud Bundy, of course. And then at my first uh, San Diego Comic Con, I was on a panel with uh, with the the, the, the top shelf guys. Uh, you know, James Kachalka like had a uh, another like you know some some animated you know nonsense out there. And one of the voice actors was David Faustino. So like I, I, I had to, I had to pull that that line just just because you know Bud Bundy is doing uh, voice acting for you know these comic book dudes. Man, another one of his credits at this time is he's in Deadline magazine. He milk says, and cheese. He says Gary would hate Deadline. Deadline's one of my favorites, so it's awesome to know. You know, like early in his career, I, I I have the timelines always wrong in my head of when things happen, and so I assume this was you know post a couple of Eisner awards and and stuff. Uh, so I was surprised to see this is very early in in his career. He's working for Deadline, which you know we've talked about in past videos. But it's Jamie Hewlett, Shaky Kane, Philip Bond, like a, a lot of really great cartoonists. Yeah. And, uh, you know, Jaime Hernandez does work uh, in these. Glenn Dillon, who's responsible for a lot of the most memorable design elements of the new Star Wars uh, trilogy, or I guess films, because they'll be turning those out at a rapid clip. So you can see some of that like chicken fat approach that we mentioned in regards to like Will Elder as an influence, you know, like he is just loading up his comics. And and he's never stopped doing that with his own work. Like take a look at the Eltingville comics and just seeing these milk and cheese comics. Great lettering, like everything is a, just all in. At a bigger size than than the actual, uh, you know, American printed comics. Like I really like them on that big slick paper. Yeah. So very cool stuff there. He refers to, uh, in, in terms of cutting promos on comics, he calls that image style and, and contemporary comics pinup comics. Which, again, you know, you can kind of see the alternative of that in his approach, where you're getting just loaded down with a million stories and jokes and, and text and image. You know, it's loaded with content compared to these pinup comics. 
I, you know, what what is the date on on these babies, man? You know, nine, 94, like these these milk and cheese comics, um they I didn't divorce them from the image comics in the way that they affected me. You know what I'm saying, man? Just like because it's all mania. It's all mania of some stripe, man. There's the energy between these creators gets split in different directions at, at, at a certain point, but there there are a lot of similarities that that I kind of absorbed at the time. <laughs> so uh, one thing he mentions is that he reads the letters. Again, something Todd McFarlane does. You know, like this is something I don't know that, that we all do enough of now. But I think this stems from some of his letter reading was this idea of like, you know, people would send in drawings, kids would send in drawings. And so this is uh, a really great page to me where he's doing like the kid art comic version. Um, and I just think it's beautiful. Again, demonstrating kind of his ability as a cartoonist to incorporate these different styles within storytelling. Well, I mean, he betches like, yeah, I drew that with my left hand. Very effective. Totally. Looks great. I think it's noteworthy, though, the idea of reading your your letter, you know, reading these kids writing in letters, because you don't hear it mentioned often. So you hear Evan Dorkin mention it, and you see Todd McFarlane mention it. Yeah, for sure. You know, like, uh, and then you see Marvel eliminate letters pages altogether, <laughs> you know, a decade later. Yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, the uh, you had to the letter write like the letters would just be they would they would be more valuable because now you're you're writing something down you're considering something you have to put a stamp on a thing you have to send it out so that's kind of been replaced by the dashed off email or the anonymous fucking youtube comment and uh, it becomes white noise and it's like yeah if you, if you send something of value it absolutely gets considered when it comes across my radar but if you're just you know playing go gossip queen or chatty patty or or just being uh, vaguely insulting for no reason. It's just white noise. Nothing to me. He compares comic book stores to porno stores as being both just male fantasies. You know, basically how uh, alienating these, these stores are to women. Again, something... You know, you're seeing this stuff cross over from person to person. Chris Claremont mentions, why aren't we targeting this giant group of book buyers... And then, you know, a guy who works in the comic book stores makes the same observation. And the male fantasy part, I think, is really accurate. Because we've heard people disparage comic book shops. And this is 1992, by the way. This is not to say comic book shops of today, because I think shops have evolved quite a bit. Yeah, we're talking to subterranean joints, man, where you could buy, like, anarchist cookbooks. And uh, yeah, uh, Neil, Gaiman, uh, Neil Gaiman said something funny in, in a... Uh, in a speech at the Library of Congress, I think, man, or it was like an interview, when uh, when he was working on Sandman, uh, he would get these like shop owners who smelled funny, had had unwashed shirts with stains on them, who were like picking at their skin, coming up to him at, at shows and saying like, "I really have to thank you. You got women into our shop." And he's just <laughs> like, "Oh yeah." Wow. <laughs> you know, cutting promos, he, he disparages both Raw and Spider-Man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just the, pre the pretense of, uh, of, of Raw and stuff like that. But, you know, he, he, also, he also cuts promos kind of on the, the laissez-faire comics reader who doesn't divorce, who, who doesn't associate the guy who draws daredevil born again with the guy who draws rubber blanket like how there's no like the people who come up like kyle baker at this point you know they were all part of instant piano he, kyle baker uh um evan dorkin and what was the other guy's name mark badger yes yeah so kyle baker at this point he quits doing shows for a while because he has you know cowboy wally show and why i hit, hate saturn like that's what that's what he's putting his energy on and the only shit that people come up to him and say are like, so are you going to do the shadow again? <laughs> and I actually, uh, like, you know, I receive that, like, all the time. Like, when's Hip Hop Family Tree Volume 5 going to come out? Are you going to do Fantastic Four Grand Design? Like, this kind of thing. It's a beautiful thing. Because the alternative is, who the fuck are you? Or something right, like yeah, that. Right, yeah, exactly. But uh, I could see how, like, to a certain person, it could, it could like, wear thin. 
Yeah, especially if you're doing something that's self-published or something that's outside of the mainstream and you're struggling to sell it anyway, and then all you hear about is the uh, the corporate character that, that you're not on right now that, you know, would be an easy paycheck. Uh, I can see that being frustrating. He cites Popeye reprints as the best superhero stuff he's ever read. And he talks about, you know, the way these comics exist is like alternative media. And how do you sell that stuff? We, and one of the things he he suggests is... You know, it's going to get to the point where Julie Desay, she's just going to finish her next 10-page comic and fax it out to her subscribers. It's the internet model. Right. You know, like, it's a pretty accurate prediction in a lot of ways of the way... Of uh, Patreons and yeah, bullshit and, like and the that. way fans relate to their artists today. I do want to go back just a touch. Wait, wait, no, no, no. The, I mean, just to what you just said about how he relates it to, like, these, like, very, like, sort of niche... Comics is, like, these, like, niche things and the people who who look for, like obscure punk bands like read comics so it makes sense that like love and rockets and all and it's sort of what we were talking about with those two bar tapes from last week where it's this like niche culture that breeds people who keep wanting to look for weirdo mm -hmm. obscure you know winnebago man videotapes and he cites the usual suspects he says the hernandez brothers draw better than any of these capital A artists in galleries, they write better than most people in books. Dan Klaus is funnier than anyone on television. You know, so... And he still says that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I don't disagree with any of that stuff. Um, but, it, you know, showing, like, the early issue of 8-Ball or whatever, where they're at at this point, it's just to kind of reinforce, like, these, these guys, they were recognized by kind of the people who loved comics. You know, even early on, before they kind of made their hits. I mean, I guess Love and Rockets is the Hernandez brothers from the get-go. But um, it's still, you know, they found their audiences pretty quickly, the, these very talented alternative cartoonists. Well, they found their audiences for sure. Um, quickly, that's... Let's ask them, because I'm sure it felt like a million years to, to you know, have your book put right next to, like, ElfQuest or... or um, the porno section when your thing might show a hint of a nipple once because a person's taking a shower with no lurid value beyond trying to get clean. He does say that, uh, yeah, I just want to say because of the, the, uh, the wrestling reference. Well, first off, he says, whenever I go to Marvel comics to drop off my art, like nobody's looking like when, whenever you have to like sign in, he's like, I, I put my name down as like Mil Mascaris. Like it doesn't matter. <laughs> then the other good wrestling reference is that, uh, he just hates the pretense of like rock stars and popular music like Bono and Sting. And he says that I have more respect for the wrestler Sting than the <laughs> musician Sting. <laughs> Yeah. He went on to do pretty well as a cartoonist. I would say so. I think he has six Eisner's lot, the current count. Yeah, but I don't he, know how you judge a good cartoon. You know, I, I realize that's kind of not the best judge, but yeah. I'm saying, like, he's he's become one of those recognized guys that people would point out as being, this is a good cartoonist, this is a good comic book. Always evolving, you know? Like, it, it went from, uh, you know, the, the early stuff, Eternity. Oh, you know, the other... Uh, Fun thing that he was talking about early on when he was talking about Pirate Corps is that, oh yeah, you know, it was for Eternity Comics, one of Scott Rosenberg's fucking, uh, uh, he calls it like Men in Black operations, like his his shell games, mm -hmm. you know, his, his, his scams and conspiracies. And so, so it's like, we're getting a big education on, on this, uh, on, on these old, uh, black and white publishers, man. But he did. He did, uh, you know, he did the, the milk and cheese stuff. And then he did his own kind of, like, humor anthology called Dork. Uh, that was pretty great. And right now he's working on, like, the new, the new hits are, like, his Beast of Burden comics. Yeah, and if you look at the Eisners that he's won, it's for, like, everything. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's for short stories. It's it's uh, writer, artist, you know, cartoonist. I, I don't know what these categories <laughs> all mean. Um, you know, single issue. So it's a very well-rounded cartoonist. And, and his body of work substantiates that. Comics Journal, 152, Part 2, Part 3. <laughs> <laughs> One last note on the Evan Dorkin interview. This is a book that he did in 1993 called Fight Man. And I, I mention it now because it's kind of a response to Image Comics in a lot of ways. You know, it's it's that type of over-the-top character it's a one-shot it's super dense so 
it is basically a graphic novel in one issue. Um, since we've been talking so much about Image Comics, I feel like this is, you know, if you're interested in this type of thing, this is almost like the Evan Dorkin interpretation of the values of Image Comics. And at times, I feel like there's almost a Todd McFarlane-esque uh, style to some of these character designs. Um, so that one's pretty good. And then, like, the other one that we've mentioned before is Doom Force. Not connected to Evan Dorkin in any way, but another one of, like, mm, contemporary take on the style of Image Comics. Pin-up comics, if you will. David Mazzucchelli interview. Comics used to be about telling stories. So David Mazzucchelli uh, built a name for himself on Daredevil, teamed up with Frank Miller for the Born Again storyline in Daredevil, and then did Batman Year One, um, also with Frank Miller. He then, then leaves mainstream comics to, uh, I don't know, further develop as an artist and self-publishes Rubber Blanket, three issues of which would ultimately be published at the time of this interview. Issue two is just about to come out. Yeah, so they start out, um, was Daredevil your first project in mainstream comics? It was his first uh, like monthly assignment, not his first work. Um, I believe this is his first comic, Masters of Kung Fu, number 121. Is he inked by Vinnie Coletta in that baby? He is. And it's uh, it's funny because like I was looking through this, you know, prep for this interview, and it's like, man, it's too good for this to be somebody's first work. You you know, I I would bet you that this had to be drawn insanely fast, probably too, because I think Gene Day died right before. Like I think this young kid got on this project because I think the previous is issue, Gene Day had his heart attack and was no longer with us, so. They had to fill that slot really fast. You can see some of, you know, what would be his skills from the outside. Oh, I, I was pointing something that's, that would not be skills, but... Oh, okay. <laughs> no, 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 no. Just like, uh, you know, he had to dash this baby out real quick. Well, I was going to say, you know, the figure work. I always think of him as being a really good figure artist, and there's lots of these, like, long shots of figures. Um, you know, full... Probably more full figures than you're going to see, like... In a way, this is all the same distance shot for all of these. So it is obviously a, a young artist's work, but uh, pretty strong from the get-go. Working in these mainstream comics, he said that that was like the advantage of those kinds of comics because he really does like to draw the, the, the human figure. Um, so it was just an exercise in, in playing around with that a lot because he had to kind of make... Uh, he's, he's basically... He's a, he's a pacifist. You know, he, like, he says that he's basically anti-violent he doesn't think that uh, people should take the law into their own hands so we were talking earlier about the about the um the moral obligations that people have for like the previous creators like a jack kirby but maz takes it even further and he's thinking like maybe i just don't want to perpetuate just like violence to children that's a really good point i often criticize things like um star wars and infinity and What's the Avengers? I don't Infinity know. War. Uh, yeah, yeah, Infinity. The, you know these these things that are definitely aimed at kids, but are also like huge giant body counts, and I, I can see that. That's an interesting uh, point of view for somebody that's drawing vigilante comics and fight scenes and all of that stuff that are aimed for kids, but feature a lot of violence. One of the things that that I like a whole lot is pretty early on when he describes his his job as artist for Marvel DC. Part of that job description by his lights is going into the Marvel offices and taking a look at the color guides and making adjustments to them before they go off to press. He says that that's vitally important to his storytelling approach. Uh, that is what it means to be an artist in that game. And listen, man, who is the last colorist you work with, man? Because last time I checked, it's all you doing the color on your comics, Jimmy, and same deal here. <laughs> the last colorist I worked with was Laura Allred. Yeah? What was that? Mar oh, that Marvel it, shit? It was years ago. It was a I zombie fill-in issue, but uh, I was kind of excited because I do like her coloring. Um, he, To your point, one of the quotes I pulled is, I learned early on that the look of a book is determined by the last person who gets his hands on it. So <laughs> that's him going to the Marvel office to make sure he's the last guy, and then going to do his own work in Rubber Blanket where he's the guy doing everything, even interacting with the printer. 
How he it? describes um, Daredevil as his undergrad, and Batman Year One as his grad work, basically preparing him for what he's going to do with his life, which is rubber blanket. Piggybacking off of what Alan Moore said about the mainstream stuff being uh, being his apprenticeship train and. Earlier than that, McFarland saying, yeah, use Marvel DC as a training ground. The but, farm system. Yeah, but if you stay there, you're a jobber. Yeah, that's exactly what I thought of uh, whenever I read that. So he had big success working with Frank Miller, and, you know, these these books are perennially successful, man. Year One and uh, Daredevil Born Again. So he was able to take time away from comics, and, and he could just... He could just pick his own spots and do what he wants to do. So what did he do after uh, doing some of this big work? He went to school, took a lithography class to try to see how these lines react when printed. And he brought a lot of that energy to, to Rubber Blanket. Like, if you were to bust out that second volume and show those, those two color pages, I don't know that you arrive at that place um, without paying attention to how print reacts to the paper and which which inks to put down first, yada yada. Um, like this looks like the work of a printmaker. Yeah, for sure. And he's interested and influenced by Raw, which was also sort of printmakers, you know, bringing S that idea to comics S production. Yeah, and Spiegelman has like a, a famous saying that uh, you know a, a comic is not done until it's printed and and. Part of what he means by that is that uh, you have to see how your work looks in print rather than it having um, gravitas by being on the shelf. It's like, no, this is, this is a medium for distributing ideas, and once it's in print, then that is what it is. The original art is like sawdust, in a matter of speaking. Yeah, I've heard a lot of artists talk about comic book art that way. You know, it's production art. Yeah. It, it doesn't matter what the original looks like. It matters how it reproduces. And certainly now, like, uh, many, many artists at this point have, for, they have foregone having that object for creating the work digitally and not having to clean up uh, nibs and all, all of that sort of thing, man. And he did submit work to Raw Magazine. They just didn't have a place for him at that moment. And then you see Raw Magazine, and then you see Rubber Blanket, and how they're basically the same f format in a lot of ways. So it was good to see, uh, see in print here. He said that he was able to get an issue of Rubber Blanket into Tower Records. And in, in, in last episode, we were talking about how Squeak the Mouse showed up in Tower Records. So pretty hearty comic book section in, in that old store. He, uh, you know, continuing the trend of creator ownership, creators, artists versus corporations. He talks about editorial changes that were put on Daredevil, uh, especially the Born Again stuff, where there were faces that Jim Shooter required him to change, and he made some of those changes. And when he didn't, the bullpen made some of those changes. So it's, it's wild for me to think of that, because in my mind, that's a very well-done comic. So the idea that, like, He's having this synergistic relationship with Frank Miller and creating work that's pushing his own style further and further, and yet it's editors that are going, no, change that part. That thing that you're trying out here, we're not going to do that. Because there aren't, there aren't really stakes. You know, if you go back to the issues before Frank Miller shows up, he can do whatever he wants, but then Frank Miller's there, now it's a high profile, now you have the editor-in-chief weighing in on how you're drawing a face in this panel or that panel. It's a strange industry. <laughs> he says that the ind comics is an industry. It breeds this churn rate. Like you have to, you have to keep pumping out these pages, and the speed of like mainstream comics is something that's like a big detractor for for him. And you know now he he doesn't look the gift horse in the mouth. He, he has the time to put into the pages that that he wants. So he will. Um, he will let the work kind of flow on its own rather than being bound by a schedule. Batman Year One, you know, you mentioned coloring earlier, is colored by Richmond Lewis, who uh, is a painter, you know, so has a good color sense. And um, this is, this is uh, what we're showing off is from the, the absolute uh, Batman Year One that to me, in terms of what the mainstream has put out, this is the best 
package from Marvel or DC that money can buy. Um, yeah, this is a really interesting comic for me for a couple of reasons. One, the coloring... You know, when I say Batman Year One is the best superhero comic I can think of, a lot of it is because of the coloring. Mm -hmm. And it's colored with the traditional palette. The, the, the four-color palette that is based on 25% variations of the CMY. So this Absolute Edition, they reprint from the scan copies of the original comics. So you're seeing like the original coloring here. On really good paper uh, that, that is conducive to this aesthetic, kind of a newsprinty uh, sort of sort of paper. But yeah, Richmond Lewis just using the standard color. You know, she provided guides to be separated, you know, by... <laughs> this kind of stuff where it's just one color for a background, I think it's so strong. You know, bright yellow... Amazing. There's one with Catwoman that I probably won't be able to find uh, jumping out of a window with just magenta in the background. Yep. It's a really interesting use of color and one that went on to, I think, influence the current generation of colorists from guys like Rico Renzi um, to uh, Brian Stelfreeze, I think, is probably influenced by this stuff. Another color, another cartoonist whose color work I really like. So whenever it was collected into a trade paperback... This this would be a good splash page to show off compared to... Uh, so it's like the last page of, say, chapter 3. Whenever this book was collected in trade paperback, Richmond Lewis then went in and recolored it because they were able to reproduce, I guess, better color. Be better production you values. Know. This is the blue line process where she was able to to just paint what she whatever she wanted to paint, and then the black line would have been an acetate overlay over top of the artboard that she was painting and then they would they would shoot this as a as a piece rather than the four color process. Have you read anywhere about this decision making? I'd be curious about that cuz to me this is I interpret this as recognizing the difference in formats. This is a comic book. This is a a book that's going on the shelf that's going to appeal to a different audience that's going to be reprinted for the Hollywood version. Yeah, it's a different piece, though. You know, it's something that's meant to be more permanent. And I wonder, like, if Mazzucchelli had any input into this, if this was an editor that figured this out or thought of this. By his earlier quote, man, try to try to get your hands on it at the very last minute. And, man, if you're a tandem with the colorist, then you can make an unbeatable project. Interesting even to see how the line work reproduced. You know, like, these lines are so much heavier on the ink gain in the newsprint <laughs> than they would be on the very nice pristine paper uh, coated stock probably where it's not going to bleed at all so pretty interesting um the only other thing to call attention to and, and why i love this edition so much is seeing his layouts are just astounding um and the complete frank miller script is nothing to sneeze at as well <laughs> yeah for sure but it's 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 cool to me to just see how he was working at this level and you know, earlier we we showed we showed uh, some of our juvenilia here and there. Uh, so in this in this uh, volume, we get to see some Dave Maz early Batman comics. And this was like a submission when he was trying to get work before he started. Man, so yeah, Batman running through the veins. <laughs> yeah, he did a really cool uh, strip in one of the Batman Year One collections where it was like you know the twentieth year in a anniversary edition or something and he does like a kind of a quickie strip in the back of his take on that yeah um, yeah it's, it's in here too okay yeah that's a good addition now that now that he's um endeavoring in this in a self-publishing effort he's now allowing himself to to go to more comic conventions that's something i was thinking about personally where it's like okay so i'm doing this x-men thing and it's a more high profile thing now when you get invited to these shows they might only invite guests, say, every five years. So would you use that opportunity like for an X-Men thing that you don't even own? Or would you like sort of put that off until you have your own work out there so that you could bang, bang the drum for that? You know, that put those thoughts into my mind. Yeah, that is a note I made. This is doing rubber blanket himself makes him start thinking about the marketing. So I said every one of these interviews talks about marketing in one way or another. A lot of them are about how marketing affects the content.
But in this case, it's more about how, you know, you're self-publishing, you're the artist, but now you're also selling that work. You know, you're kind of the agent for it, the publicist for it. Um, you know, and so that was something that was new for uh, David Mazzucchelli whenever he starts, like, taking more and more control of his art. Part of that control involves how do you sell this. Something that a lot of cartoonists didn't talk about very much when I was coming up. And maybe they weren't involved with it very much either, you know, but as you move into self-publishing and, and now with social media, it is something we're all much more responsible for now. Yeah, I mean, we have a lot more control than than the cartoonists of yore had in terms of uh, put, putting our work out there. And trying to get it sold in music stores, in bookstores, in whatever outlet you think fits. So, relatively short interview. David Mazzucchelli... Uh, I think hugely influential because he was looking at a lot more than comics and he was thinking outside of comics, even though he had a foot in the mainstream. And I think that's his legacy probably at this point. I always loved these sections in wrestling magazines too, where you could take a look at like what appeared in the earlier issues of pro wrestling illustrated or something like, and even on the comic journal, it's like, yeah, I would want to read that Frank Frank Miller interview. Yeah. I would want to read this man. You know, Matt Groening talking to Life and Hell for 50 pages. I've tracked down several of these based, you know, like the Charles Burns interview, Dan Clow's interviews. Um, yeah, there's a lot of those. One of the, I believe one of the Hernandez brother interviews was done by Neil Gaiman, but I don't know which issue. Does that ring a bell? It doesn't ring a bell, man. But Maybe I, I'm wrong on that. <laughs> <laughs> Justin Green sketchbook. So Justin Green, underground artist, credited... Binky Brown meets the Holy Virgin Mary is probably credited as one of those early autobio under- early efforts in autobiography, but you know precedes precedes uh, Harvey P. Carr's work and and influences Robert Crumb to kind of go down that that road a little bit more well uh, with with uh, his own work. You know, deals with a lot of uh, a lot of uh, his own personal demons, obsessive compulsive. Disorder, but not like the hipster. Uh, I have my OCD is acting up today. Like it's like for real, legit, uh, crippling obsessive compulsive disorder. Uh, grew up Catholic, so all of the guilt that comes with the fact that you know not only does uh, this guy in the sky um, see what you're doing, but he also knows your thoughts. Yeah. <laughs> And, you know, there's, like, this amazing stri- strip in here where he's going to, like, Sunday school or something, and just a, a little piece of the nun's hair comes out of her habit, and to him, it's so naughty that he just starts thinking about hairy pussy. <laughs> you know, it's like, just seeing the nun's hair, like, a piece of her hair starts to make him think, like, well, where else is she hairy? And, like, <laughs> like you know, all that Catholic shit, man. Yeah, I don't think people realize the effect religion can have on a on a kid who's very thoughtful, very conscientious, like very literal. Right. <laughs> These things can have an impact. I first discovered uh Justin Green's work um just to just to kind of tie this episode this part 2 with part 1. We were talking earlier um in part 1 of this issue about the Les Daniels Marvel book that sort of encompassed the the every year of the company's culture up to 1991. And I guess this is probably Les Daniels' first foray into writing about comics, you know, uh, comics by Les Daniels, graphics by Mad Peck Studios. I saw Comic Book Confidential on a Friday, and on Saturday I went to the Homestead Library and I pulled this fucking book off the rack and just read it and reread it. Basically, Never returned it. <laughs> well, the, you know, I went back there looking for the one that uh, you could just go yeah. through. Um, I went back to the library, like looking for that exact copy because it has like scar tissue that was like the result of me because my uh, my eraser kind of melted onto the cover somehow. Like it had a chemical reaction with the the with the. With the... Think about the quality of reprints we now have. And what you had, you know, whenever a book like this was was published, where you would never find an old, you know, first appearance of Superman or something. Like, we were so uh, limited in, I, in what we had to look at. I ate all this stuff up, man. And, and Les Daniels gives a good cross-section for the history of comics. Goes from, you know, the, the early days, 
dumb animals, which includes fucking, guy, uh, you know, Carl Barks and, and, and shit, shit like that, man. EC, then EC goes into, um, the, 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 the later, uh, Harvey Kurtzman works for, you know, Humbug, Mad Magazine Trump, there. um, and, and Help Magazine, and then this is, uh, the, the Comics Code Authority, so if you're ever curious about, like, what your comic needed to have in order to get that little stamp on the cover, like, they break it down here, um, you know, this, this is, like, the Humbug stuff, mm -hmm. And uh, this would be the Warren books. This is a Wally Wood piece for, for Warren. Good color section with uh, two face strikes again, Dick Sprang. Uh, but there's also underground comics. And, and this is where I discovered uh, Justin Green's work. Um, Tijuana Bibles is like the early forerunner of the underground comic. Captain High, considered one of the first uh, underground car characters. Robert Crumb, of course, early Crumb strips, Spain Rodriguez, but this piece uh, by Justin Green, this piece by, these pieces by Justin Green blew my mind. Like, I had no idea what sex was uh, exactly until it was described to me in this, uh, in this little dialogue bubble right there, man, and it, it sort of grossed me out, but also blew my mind, made me excited to, to grow up. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but anyhow, this is where I first discovered his work, works of Jay Lynch and people like that. And, and these issues of uh, Comics Journal, like, they, they would sort of close off on a high note with these, with these sketchbooks, man. And Justin Greed would go on to, to do strips in Raw Magazine, um, became a sign painter. Yeah, so one of the uh, Justin Green comic collections that I've tracked down not too long ago is uh, his sign game. And what these are, are strips that he would do for a sign painting trade journal. And so each one would just appear, you know, like in this monthly magazine, and they would cover basically what your experience was as a sign painter. So it would be like collecting on uh, overdue invoices, trying to drum up new business, um, you know, where you might be able to reach out with your skills if, if your business is slow, you know, selling, selling, uh, sign painting services to different people. So pretty interesting to see a good cartoonist, but working in this kind of a outlet. Yeah. Super niche, like very esoteric in terms of, uh, your standard comic book, uh, material. Could we say, Jim, that this may be like one of the first artist editions? Do you know the date on? I wonder if it really is. Like, it might be the first artist edition. This is right? the first one I ever saw before uh, before any of the IDW stuff. So this is McSweeney's 2009. That's way before. What was the first IDW one? Wally Wood. Dave Stevens, Rocketeer. But that was right around. I think Wally Wood was probably the next one. Yeah. What I like about this as, as an artist edition is the, the what we know about Justin Green and his um, obsessive tendencies. Like, like we get to see it on display, warts and all, like all of the whiteout, all of the uh, toil that went into making all of these pages. Look at the pen, like the, the drawing. Man, that's incredible. Mixed media uses Zipatone. Stippling. It's all here. I wonder if this came out of the McSweeney's Chris Ware edited book. Because it's such an... You know, the, the artist edition is such an unusual format. I, I, I mean... Like... I, I didn't research the, the, the history of artist editions. Yeah, you're... <laughs> there it is, man. <laughs> Um, I didn't research the, the history of artist editions, but by my lights, Art Spiegelman, Art Spiegelman is the proponent for this thing. Art Spiegelman got hold of the artwork to make this thing possible. So I think Art Spiegelman created the artist edition. I think this is the first one, and I think it's because of Spiegelman. Because Justin did not, like, Justin, you're not going to see this guy at a comic book convention. He's like, he keeps to himself. 
he's he's not he's not about that shit, you know? And it's almost like the the other underground cartoonists like take care of him in a lot of ways, make sure he doesn't get jacked. And Spiegelman really gives a fuck about him, really cares for the dude. And I think Spiegelman presented this because Spiegelman writes the the intro to the last gasp version of Binky Brown. I love this kind of stuff. Yeah. This is what we pull out of that Evan Dork and Bill and Ted, you know, the, the kid art, the art on on Because it's hard to do. Stuff. You have to like reverse and it's all it's like uh riding a bike over like it's hard to reverse engineer your built in way of drawing. Yeah, super awesome. And these are still I think you can still get hold of these for a, a reasonable price if you're I, like I think you could, I think you could get Binky Brown for cover price by way of Last Gasp if you just go on their website or or, or something like that. Like I got this thing for you know, maybe even less than cover price, but yeah. they're out there. Um, Ron Ron Turner very graciously keeps it in print, uh, so it's out there and it and it should be it should be on anybody's shelves who really gives a fuck about comics and not just like you know who would win in a fight between Galactus and Thanos or some fucking nonsense like that. All right. You won't find these gems at Diamond. So, Steve Geppi, president of Diamond Comics Distributors, has said comics are just another form of art and literature. <laughs> you wouldn't know it, though. If you tried to order any of the books by the world-class cartoonists listed above from Diamond, not a single book by any of the cartoonists listed above are available through Diamond's much ballyhooed star system. Gippy, <laughs> very different than the uh, advanced comics and previews ads in Wizard. <laughs> Gippy in in the eighties, like he would he would position himself as like a kind of a morality police of sorts in a lot of ways, man. Like the the issue of Miracle Man that just simply depicted childbirth. He he was like. I will not have this kind of trash. Like, I will not have this pornography in, 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 you know, I will not distribute this kind of pornography, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, yo, dude, it's a ch it's childbirth, man. Like, we just, you, you distribute three Punisher comics a month, man. Dude's getting their heads blown off. And, you know, it's a very natural thing. And then, of course, he had to relinquish because he is a capitalist, man. So it's like, oh, and he, and he even made a statement like, well, if, you know, if the people... My job is to bring people what they want. So if they want filth, I will distribute filth. That kind of shit. <laughs> um, it's fun to see what, again, the time period. What's in print? This is where I saw, you know, Lout Rampage is the only Dan Klaus book at this stage. I think we're, we're nine volumes of collected Love and Rockets into that run. Um, seven of the Complete Crumb volumes have come out up to this point. And the Prince Valiant started early with Fantagraphics, probably before they started publishing their own comics, because they would do stuff like uh, Seeger's Popeye, and I guess Prince Valiant as well. I really wanted those when I was a kid, man. They were just like so big, so expensive, but now they have they did even better versions of yes. them lately, and I have them all. The Prince Valiants were the things I would find at the library when I looked for comics. You know, that was some of the few comics that were on the shelves when I was a kid that you might find. That and Garfield. <laughs> um, next issue, tribute to Harvey Kurtzman. Sadly, we are going to return to Wizard. <laughs> it is funny how, you know, when I edited the last... I edited part one of this myself. And when we're here recording and... We're having conversations like I have some idea of like where I want to go. You have some ideas about where you want to go. And you said several things that that made me really think. But like in order for me to answer you in that moment, I would have had to have just like thought about it for a second and consider the question or consider the statement that you laid out. But when you talk about sort of this comics journal issue, like sort of being heartbreaking because of its in a lot of ways, it's the death of the culture of young kids reading comics or whatever like I, I really took that to heart too man and it's like but hey, here's the thing we were also even though we were young we were still complicit in killing comics you know we have to like take the basically the people who are absolved from that are the fantagraphics people you know what i'm saying like from this era because everybody else is 
Willen and Dylan, these speculative, speculative comics, like at this point in time, one of the um, tenets of Fanagraphics like mandate was like, was like, th- our comics will remain in print. Like if if eight ball one sells out, like we'll just print more. And you know how who knows how many copies of Eleven Rockets came out. I started getting Eleven Rocket comics almost when the series went away, but I bought every issue for cover price or or less some in some cases. You know what I mean? So they made sure to be good on the word in, in that way and. Yeah, it it is going to be. The, I think the tone is going to change at least a little <laughs> bit. I don't think we're going to have a cynical approach, but we're at least going to. Um, what we said in in part one about the adults who were slapping us in the head, telling us to read good comics, just going through all of this, um, it it does give me that different perspective for our wizard episodes going forward. Yeah, I mean, I I quit reading Wizard at some point, you know, before you so my attitude does change, you know, it's, it's in, I go from being very excited about image at the start to pretty quickly outgrowing it. Um, and that, that'll be coming up in the next year. Probably. This is the, the beauty of the beauty of you and I having a separation in age by about five, six years is really great for this period we're discussing because that five years is more meaningful when it's a 15 year old and a 10 year old. And I was trying to think of like, okay, so like, where would like the the dividing line be in in where you were and where I was and shit like that? And I was just watching that CNN series, the '90s. So I'm not saying you specifically, but the kids your age and the kids your age at that time, you would have been fine like watching that um, my so called life on MTV with like Claire Danes and like kids my age were like, "Where's Beavis and Butthead?" Like. Where's the speed racer? Fuck this soap opera bullshit. But like the kids your age were like eating up my so-called life and all that yeah. shit. Yeah, my, my, uh, one of my friends, that's her favorite show. And my age. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Like I think 100% of the, because like even the girls were like, can't you just put like an REM music video on here or something? Like can't you put that uh, Nirvana video back? Like I don't care about this crybaby shit. I was impressed by this tour. It's like 38 stops in three months. It's pretty heavy duty. I don't know if any, you know, like now people do a book tour and it's like six stops. <laughs> this is like full tour schedule, man. Get those guys a bus. <laughs> it's pretty ambitious. Predecessor to the hate ball tour that will probably yes. come right after. Pretty cool, though. <clears throat> I love that we close out this episode with Ralphie Roach. <laughs> This ad would be on these fucking magazines a lot, man. This guy paid a lot of money in ad ad space. I buy a lot of comics from this era. I can't remember f- coming across this one. So now it's on my list. <laughs> I'm definitely familiar with the ad, but I've never seen the comic myself. So, very fun to go through a comics journal. I guess next week we will be looking at Wizard 13. Wizard Magazine number 13 with a Nelson cover, Ghost Rider. Ghost Rider making a second cover appearance. Um, starting year two of Wizard Magazine. Yep, I think it might even be like June, July, which means Eddie P. turns 10 years old uh, when that issue comes out. You can follow me at Jim Rug Art. I'm at Ed Piscor, basically. All of the links will be in the description below, including the social media channels for Cartoonist Kayfabe. Be sure and subscribe if you haven't already. Tell your friends, share it on your Twitter, on your Facebook, all that good shit. And uh, thanks for watching.